Good morning, Tina. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you again for joining us for day two. Um, extension and communication is today. Just a couple of uh, quick reminders. If you haven't been with us before, please use the Q&A box for any questions that you have. We have people that are um, monitoring that so that at the end of each of the presentations, we can go back and look uh, and have questions answered for you. The chat box is really for you to be able to communicate between yourselves, but we are checking the Q&A box for any questions for our presenters. Uh, this is being recorded and it will be posted um, for you to be able to go back to. Um, it will take us a, um, a few days to be able to do that, uh, but we will notify you once that is done. And we are looking forward to, again, some great information being shared with us. Um, yesterday for the research, it was a very fact-filled um, day of information and everyone did a, a really nice job. And my expectation is that we will again be blown away by our presenters, uh, starting with the extension group and learning more about what they have been seeing and how they are helping others uh, so that we can share that information as well. So, Tina, thank you very much for facilitating, and I'll let you have it. All right, everybody. I'm Tina McIntyre. I work with the uh, Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, and I will be um, the lead for this portion of the SLF program. And as Dane already mentioned, please put your questions in the Q&A section. And uh, this morning, we're starting our program off with Heather Leach. Um, she is an extension associate with Penn State University and has written many, many publications with SL about SLF. If you search Heather Leach PSU, you can find her latest articles, uh, which are, num are numerous. Uh, today, Heather will be talking about some of her work in grapes and other specialty talks. Please take it away, Heather. All right, thank you, Tina. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right, great. Um, so good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining on the second day. Um, as Dana said yesterday, it was definitely very, uh, very research heavy. Um, and I don't know, I'll, I'll still be talking a lot about research this morning, um, but certainly a little bit more in the context of how it's assisting um, grape growers and some of the other crops that have been affected by spotted lanternfly. Um, and so talking a little bit more about management tactics and, and what we've learned with that so far. Um, so to start right off the bat, I usually like to admit that, you know, my talk is mostly gonna focus on uh, feeding damage from lanternfly and where we've seen feeding damage from lanternfly across these various crops. But there's also this acknowledgement that it's not just about feeding damage, there's also you know, nuisance issues, so the honeydew, the sooty mold, and the bugs themselves, and then compliance with quarantine for businesses, uh, in particular uh, nursery, ornamental nursery businesses. So I'm just going to be talking about feeding damage from lanternfly, but the talk uh, following mine by Brian Walsh will hit on some of those other concerns that we've seen, both the nuisance issues and um, quarantine compliance and what that means for some of those businesses. Um, and so with feeding damage, um, again, my focus has really been in this kind of agricultural sector and trying to understand which crops are most at risk and where do we really need to focus our research efforts and in particular applied research efforts. Um, so one of those basic things that we started doing was trying to understand what crops are, are most at risk. Um, and so we've tested crops both for survivorship and plant damage. And so that includes pretty comprehensive analysis of grapes, but then also um, some of those other uh, crops listed there. And then survivorship, um, some other crops that we might not necessarily grow in Pennsylvania or grow very much of, um, or, or ones that we're just trying to get a, a read on basically. So I'm gonna first walk you through some of the data that we've learned from survivorship on some of the tested crops. And unsurprisingly, it's pretty high. I'm not gonna, uh, uh, worry too much about the, the experimental details here. If you're interested in, in talking to me about it, I'd be happy to. Um, but basically what we did is use both four thin stars and adult spotted lanternfly and have them feed on different crops and then compare their survivorship every two days with tree of heaven. Um, and what we know is that survivorship on these other hop, uh, crops, excuse me, so like fig, avocado, and hardy kiwi is all very high. So uh, for reference, tree of heaven survival was 99%. Um, and then fig, avocado, hardy kiwis, all above 90%. 
Um, and so we also, again, looked at some of those other crops to actually assess uh, damage, potential damage. Um, and so we did this on a couple of different scales. So I'll, I'll again, I'm going to kind of glean over the details a little bit. Um, but basically what we were doing with peach is trying to understand if we might see an increase in fruit abortion if we force feeding. So all the trials I'm going to talk about are force feeding trials. Um, where we looked at uh, an early June exposed 50 uh, fourth in star spotted lanternfly to peach shoots um, and then left some um, peach shoots peach shoots that were unexposed on the same tree um, and looked at again that fruit abortion rate along with growth and, and the size uh, and, and sugar content of the fruit. Um, and what we saw here is that we did see um, more fruit abortion when lanternfly were fed on those shoots versus when they were not. However, you'll note my sample size is very low, so I'll, I'll caution you throughout this that this is very preliminary uh, data, just trying to give us an assessment of what might be happening here. Um, we did see slightly smaller fruit, but again, very low sample size, nothing that's um, uh, statistically uh, robust enough to even kind of pursue that. Um, but I think that this is something we want to look at a little bit further. Now, with tree fruit in particular, we haven't really seen uh, significant populations of spotted lanternfly in tree fruit. Um, there is are some exceptions, but generally speaking, um, infestation in tree fruit doesn't last longer for a week, and, and oftentimes it's even less than that if they show up at all. Um, the other thing that I'm not talking about here is whether or not um, young trees might be fed on more and might influence the establishment of some of these uh, uh, tree crops and, and fruit perennial fruit crops. So I think there's there's certainly more to be done here, but we are seeing some indication of potential um, effect of lanternfly feeding. Um, we also looked at uh, lanternfly exposure to raspberries and understanding how that might just affect growth. These were all young raspberries, so uh, all we did is look at cane growth after days of exposure, um, about a little over a month of exposure to lanternfly um, or no lanternfly. And there again, we saw um, a, a weak relationship, but there did seem to be some sort of reduction in growth when lanternfly are exposed. We weren't able to look at fruit production, so this is something that we'll continue to look at. Um, in terms of field populations of lanternfly on brambles, we have not seen that. We've only seen, um, or I've personally only seen uh, nymphs and adults feeding on uh, Himalayan blackberry, so wild, uh, wild crops. We also looked at hemp, and so this uh, project was done by Lauren Briggs, and so what we did here is a uh, basically uh, increasing the number of lanternfly that are exposed to these potted hemp trials. Overall, the survival on hemp when we force fed them again um, was really low, so less than 30% survival on hemp production. She also went out to hemp fields in um, Landisville, Pennsylvania to see if there's any you know, field populations of lanternfly uh, on the hemp. Um, and so here's some, some evidence of lanternfly feeding on hemp fields, but generally speaking, it's very low. So um, across 19 plants, she only got, the highest she got was 10, and that just happened once in early October. So generally speaking, hemp, we haven't seen strong evidence that there's gonna be much of an impact there. Uh, we also looked at cucumber. Now here we get um, a fair number of reports of cucumber being attacked by home gardeners from, from lanternfly. Um, and so what we did is the same sort of situation where we had 0, 25, 50, or 100 lanternfly feeding um, on the plant and then looked at the yield that was produced um, once we put those bags over the, the cages. Um, and so here we see a a fairly strong relationship, again, even though it's a low sample size, a fairly strong relationship um, where you see a decreasing trend in cucumber yields. Um, and so I think that this is something that definitely needs to be looked at further because, again, we see both field reports of lanternfly feeding um, on cucumber and uh, field reports of damage, and then also, of course, this uh, experimental damage. We've looked at hops as well, um, and so here we, we did the same sort of thing where we had um, gradually increasing levels of lanternfly feeding on those hop plants. Um, and so what we found is a weak decreasing trend in yield. I'm not convinced there's anything really significant. I think this is just noise here. Um, hops are, are pretty vigorous, and so maybe we need to increase our levels. We did have about 200 feeding per plant. Um, but we'll continue to look at that. Um, now, the concern with hops hasn't so much been uh, yield. It's more so been the effects of honeydew on hops and whether or not that might affect the drying period. Um, and so we did also submit our hops in for a quality analysis um, to understand how it might affect um, basic hop quality parameters. 
We didn't see any effect in any of those parameters, um, including both uh, uh, dry weight alpha and beta levels and cohumulone, which is kind of giving you your um, hop flavor, if you will. Um, and so here, again, we did have good survivorship on hops and it's been a crop of concern, but right now I think we're not um, ready to say it's, it's gonna um, destroy the hop industry. So sort of my, my summary of this uh, work um, is we've, you know, we've looked at some of these different hosts. Um, we're able to assess whether or not we have field reports of populations uh, or damage. And the only one I would really say here uh, is cucumber where we have seen backyard growers, but not commercial growers. So we do intend this coming season to start scouting commercial cucumber fields uh, to try to understand the pressure there. Um, and then whether or not they survive, maybe more than 60%, this is something arbitrary that I put on, but there are some that you can kind of kick out from, um, from those assessments. Um, whether or not we've documented damage in those controlled experiments, and then of course, giving us this kind of anticipated risk. Um, and so of these, I would say that um, cucumber, hops, kiwi, and raspberry are all kind of in this either medium high or medium low risk, and hemp and peach might be at that low risk. Now, again, my, my big disclaimer here is take all of this with a grain of salt. Um, so this is very preliminary work and it's where we're uh, planning um, more trials for 2021. Um, and so we're, we're not really measuring all of the important plant health metrics. And there's a lot of complications going on here as, you'll, as I'll talk about with grape. Um, and so just keep up to date. And I know that there's some more people um, who, are, who are going to get into this work. So I hope we'll kind of bolster the information we have on these other crops. And I will say, if you're interested in looking at any of that data or reporting on it, um, if you go to our website, it's an article that's available um, under agriculture and industry professionals. Um, so you can find that there and um, check that out. Um, and then, of course, uh, <laughs> I did this presentation, finished it up kind of late last night. So <laughs> there might be some interesting things in here. But, um, but of course, the, you know, the part that I'm not talking about here is uh, vineyards and, and what we've been seeing with vineyards. And that's uh, been so far the most significant agricultural commodity that's been impacted by a lanternfly. And, and a lot of um, my own work has focused in that. Um, and so again, we, we continue to see these really high populations um, of lanternflies. So we see the eggs hatching out on the posts. Uh, we see nymphs feeding on the grape shoots. Um, and then here's a video of early instars feeding on um, a young grape shoot. So you can kind of, if, if you're unfamiliar with watching lanternfly, get a sense of how they move. Um, and then we get the adults that start to come in. Um, at first, they show up in, in low numbers in the vineyards, and then um, before you know it, they're, they're exceedingly high. Um, and so they're feeding really all throughout the, these grapevines on the trunks, on the shoots, on the cordons. Um, and we just see just really explosive numbers that continue to come in. And then in the end of the season, they start to, of course, lay their egg masses, um, which we see those in a variety of places. So uh, on the metal T-posts, um, certainly underneath the cordon, um, and we start to see these, these nice big clusters of them. Um, and I'll, I'll note, just this is kind of a, a hopefully quick aside, that um, Lauren Briggs, a technician that worked for uh, Michaela Centenari at Penn State and myself, um, we were starting to notice that, you know, there are these, these strange groups of lanternfly um, that seem to all want to lay eggs next to each other. Um, and you end up with um, pretty, in my opinion, pretty gross um, posts and vines just absolutely slathered um, with these egg masses. So um, she decided to kind of um, take on an independent project and, and look at this trend. Um, and so one of the things we looked at is trying to understand if females are attracted to egg masses. So are they more likely to lay an egg mass next to an existing egg mass? So we have two years of data on this. And, and um, basically what we did is put out these kind of uh, wood posts throughout different vineyards. Uh, and on those wood posts were either grape bark that was blank or grape bark that contained an egg mass. Um, and we rotated that um, throughout for the, for the up and down position and just looked at where lanternfly were going to lay eggs um, when they were close to that. And what we found is that um, as you move away from that egg mass, um, you, you continue to see that same effect um, all the way from five to 15 centimeters away from that pre-existing egg mass where lanternfly females are preferring to lay eggs near an existing egg mass. So there does seem to be something attractive that's, that's telling them maybe that this is a good place to lay an egg mass. Um, and that's when we tend to see that clumping effect. 
Um, she also collected a lot of data, um, just observational data to try to understand where lanternfly is in the vineyard. So she looked at um, just over 3000 egg masses throughout several different vineyards, uh, mostly in Berks County, Pennsylvania. Um, and just to quickly summarize what she found, um, it's not particularly surprising with what we've seen here, um, but she found that more egg masses are found on more horizontal surfaces. So more are found on the 60 to 90 degrees in terms of being parallel with the ground. Um, most eggs are found low, so below the fruiting wire or at the fruiting wire, which is about 30 inches. And then when we look at the substrates that they're using, um, the interesting thing here is the majority of them are not laid on the grape itself, but laid on, say, the, the metal posts or the wood posts. The other thing that's interesting is that we did start to see um, a, a preference over non-galvanized metal compared to galvanized metal. So there's long been this kind of um, uh, standing, standing anecdote that um, lanternfly really like to lay eggs on rusty metal. I don't know that they necessarily prefer it, but it does seem to be a, a good host for them. And then all cardinal directions were represented throughout the vineyards. So we didn't see any strong influence there. Um, so when we're talking about egg masses, really the best way that you can keep the egg masses out of your vineyard is to manage the adults, um, which maybe sounds easy, but the adults can be pretty challenging to manage. And this isn't the best video, but as you'll kind of look in the sky, hopefully you can see um, all of those dots are all lanternfly flying um, into the vineyard, out of the vineyard, throughout the vineyard. Um, so we tend to get these flight activity periods, which makes lanternfly really difficult to manage. Um, and you also tend to see lanternfly uh, on anything. It's not just talking about the grapevines, it's on wood pallets, it's on um, Lauren, um, who, was, who was working in the vineyard that day. Um, and it's also not just a problem for, again, the three invasion concept. There's also uh, wineries and the outdoor tasting areas in particular that are having a hard time with this. So you can see this building is absolutely covered. I don't have a great image of a video of what this looks like in an outdoor tasting area, but we have had um, wineries report negative reviews and customer complaints. Um, and that can really influence their business when you start to get those negative Google or Yelp reviews. Um, so there's there's definitely been an irritation and a frustration on that side of things that I'm, I'm not too, gonna spend too much time talking about. Um, so when we talk about what lanternfly feeding um, actually looks like, that's when it gets um, a little bit tricky. So when we're trying to warn other growers in other states or people who don't yet have lanternfly, um, it's not super obvious, right? So for those of you who might not be familiar with this damage, this is of course Japanese beetle. Um, and so this is uh, you know, easy to scout for. Even if you don't see the insect itself, you can see that damage and we know right away it's Japanese beetle. Um, and part of this is because lanternfly is a piercing, sucking insect, um, and it, it, you know, can kind of leave no trace. Um, now, this isn't the case with all piercing, sucking insects. So, um, again, if you're if somewhat familiar with the grape industry um, and, and their sensitivity to leafhopper damage, um, this past year we had a, a sort of a leafhopper outbreak and you start to see that curling. Um, and, of course, those are a piercing, sucking insect, but there are some kind of uh, salivary interactions going on there with the grape and the insect um, that makes them really sensitive to that. With lanternfly, we don't see that. They can really kind of move onto a grapevine and if no one sees them, they're a little bit undiscovered. So really the best options that we have um, in terms of uh, signs of lanternfly feeding damage in a vineyard um, are honeydew. And so we start to see leaves uh, getting uh, wet and sticky from that honeydew accumulation. We do see honeydew accumulation on the fruit as well. Um, so some growers are starting to think that maybe this contributes to more rot, more fruit flies. Certainly we are seeing more uh, honey, uh, honeybees and wasps entering the vineyard and, and yellow jackets actually coming into the vineyard earlier than most growers say they typically do, um, which might open up that fruit and cause some sour rot issues. Uh, so not that honeydew has not uh, been an influence, but it's certainly not, I don't think, the top priority for growers at this point. Um, but anyway, so this is a sign of, of lanternfly feeding damage as well as a sign of other insects feeding as well. Um, but you start to see those sticky leaves and then of course you get that growth of the sooty mold after that. Um, I'll also note that sooty mold hasn't been much of an issue on the fruit or the canopy. Um, generally speaking, it's the inside of the canopy and growers don't really want those leaves anyway for some disease and um, sunlight penetration. Um, but they, they do report black trunks. And again, this isn't the best image, but um, 
if you go out to a lot of the vineyards right now in southeastern Pennsylvania, even though nothing's growing, you know that uh, you can pick your problem areas of where the vineyard was with a uh, lanternfly just because of the black trunks. Um, and so that's staying year after year and it tends to get worse and worse each year. And so some growers feel pretty uncomfortable with that because they think it might be uh, creating ex excess moisture on their trunks. Um, but again, that is certainly a sign of, of lanternfly feeding damage. Um, and then we have leaf redness as well. Now this one, we're still trying to understand a little bit more. So if you take this with a grain of salt here, but on our red cultivars, we are seeing um, an increased incidence of red variety or um, red expression on the leaves. Um, and this can be seen spatially. So where we have more lanternfly feeding damage in this uh, kind of bottom right corner, we see more red vines. And then as we move further out, we kind of lose that effect. Uh, and there was less lanternfly feeding in that area. Um, so we do see this, you know, significant positive correlation, statistically significant um, with lanternfly abund abundance and leaf redness across red varieties. Um, and we're also starting to see some really early indications that leaf redness could also be linked to reduced bud cold hardiness. And so, again, probably hand in can hand, in hand probably some multicollinearity there, but, um, but it could be that, you know, this is uh, reducing uh, winter survival, basically. Um, and the thought here, uh, again, it hasn't really been uh, understood yet, um, but the thought here is that this is potentially because of reduced translocation. Um, and so Michaela Chinchinari's PhD student, Drew Harner, took some photos of the phloem layer of grapevines. Um, and basically, if you, if you go a little bit closer, you start to see these uh, marks uh, throughout the phloem layer. And this is most severe where lanternfly has been feeding. Um, we have yet to officially attribute this damage to lanternfly, but it looks fairly um, probable. Uh, so it could be that you're restricting that, um, that uh, photosynthate uh, movement throughout the vine and then basically trapping sugars up into your upper canopy and causing that redness to occur. Um, there's also sort of a question mark with whether or not we're seeing actual oozing from feeding injury. Um, so you see some of these canes uh, trunks and uh, more trunks start to ooze from that feeding, potential feeding injury. So again, this is something that we haven't really been able to um, officially establish. If this is the case and they're, they're actually wounding the plant that significantly, I think that would definitely be a concern for uh, disease management and trunk diseases for sure. So what does lanternfly feeding damage look like? There's no obvious signs of that feeding damage in vineyards. So in terms of trying to prepare uh, growers um, in your state, um, there are some indirect signs you can, you can look at, but really they're easy to scout for. And that's really where we, we spend most of our time um, as growers and, and consultants in Pennsylvania is just walking the vineyard and trying to understand what's out there. Um, so this is what we've done, what I've done for the past three years is just go out and count bugs um, quite often and try to understand um, what activity is occurring there. Um, and so we did um, a trial where we scouted in the morning, afternoon, and evening, looking at behaviors, looking at flight activity, uh, and of course, just the number of lanternfly per vine. Um, and going back to that video I showed earlier, when we're in this kind of uh, flight activity period of September, that's when we tend to see a really big influx into the vineyard. Um, and in some cases at the edge of your vineyard, you might see as many as three times more lanternfly in just a matter of hours. And so you can kind of get this continuous pressure in October, that flight uh, activity really starts to calm down. And so you don't see that, that increase throughout the day. Uh, the other interesting thing that we found with that is that they're not feeding all the time. Um, and so the majority of them are actually feeding in the afternoon and evening, but in the morning, they're just kind of hanging out um, and uh, 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 sitting tight basically. And we don't really know why that is. It could be temperature related or, or potentially related to something that the vine is doing. Um, but anyway, so with all the scouting, we've started to come up with the, basically the, the phenology and that risk assessment of when lanternfly needs to be um, managed and when it's the biggest problem in a vineyard. So here you're looking at the average number of lanternfly per vine uh, across the season um, from the past three years. And this is data from eight vineyards, uh, most of them all in Berks County. Um, and so what we know here is that lanternfly is most problematic in the September to October period. We do see nymphs in the vineyard. Typically, they're not very abundant. Um, so it sort of depends on how many egg masses you might have had, of course. Um, and it also sort of depends on, you know, how quick you are to act on other pests like Japanese beetle or grapeberry moth. 
um, which would knock down those lantern flies as well. So really the problem period is, is this uh, adult phase. Um, and the biggest problem that I see right now in the grape industry is that we don't currently have an action threshold. And so we don't know when the appropriate time is to spray. Um, Anecdotally, there was there was some information from Korea where they said, you know, if your if your vines are at around five to ten lanternfly um, throughout the vineyard on average, then that's when you should take a uh, take action and, and basically spray. Um, with that, we haven't really seen. Um, you know, I'm, I'm nervous to use a number like that, basically, just because we have so many different variables going on, so many different varieties in vine age. So I've really stopped kind of citing that because I think um, it's not necessarily the most reliable threshold that we've got. Um, so uh, we can also break up the phenology by life stage and also look at where they are on the plant. Um, so I, you'll see basically the same graph here. So the average number of lantern fly per vine broken up by instars. And then you can see where they're feeding on the vine. So first instars, second instars, and third instars are feeding all predominantly on the shoots. And then as you move to fourth instars, you do start to see that movement towards woodier tissue. And then adults, of course, feeding still predominantly on the shoots until about harvest time. And that's when that phloem really starts to shift and they start to move down towards the trunk. Um, we also know that the majority of the population in the vineyards is female, not male. Um, so when you think about um, mating activities, they've probably already mated. This is something that hopefully Julie um, will continue to work on and confirm for us, but they've probably already mated by the time they make it to the vineyard and are mostly just bulking up feeding and uh, trying to lay their eggs. Um, and a big interest with, with growers has been what are our annual trends? Are we, are we seeing any um, explanation that the core population might be collapsing? Um, and so again, average number of lanternfly per vine for the adult season. Um, and then you're looking at the different vineyards that I've been uh, monitoring for the past couple of years. Um, and so what you can see from this is there's some vineyards that tend to have um, one really bad year. So um, uh, B, D, and E are good examples of this, where 2018 was their worst year, um, but then they see declining populations after that. But then there's also vineyards like A, F, G, and H, where you see either continuous pressure or increasing pressure. Um, and when you look at this spatially um, across that infestation zone and, and try to see if there's maybe some core moving out, um, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and so when we're trying to guess at future trends, of course, I think Initially, some people were thinking the worst is behind us and you'll have one really bad year in vineyards and then it will kind of calm down. Um, or maybe you'll just have these continuous outbreaks. And unfortunately, I think we're still in this phase of it being unpredictable. And we're not really sure, um, you know, we, we can't call it. I can't necessarily say what vineyard's gonna have really bad infestation this year or might get a little bit of a break. Um, so unfortunately, even with this regular monitoring work, I think we're still in this phase of being unpredictable. Um, so the other thing that we've learned from scouting in these vineyards is that the distribution is not equal, the spatial distribution is not equal in the vineyard. Um, so here you're looking at the proportion of lanternfly as you move into the interior of the vineyard. Um, and there's a, there's a nice decline there. And what we're finding is that about uh, over half of the population of lanternfly is observed within the first 50 feet of the vineyard edge. Um, we've also started to do some spatial heat mapping um, using um, uh, Krieging and uh, look at where those populations might be across different vineyards. And so blue areas indicate low populations of lanternfly and red areas indicate high. And so across these vineyards, um, predominantly with adults, but also with egg masses, we see that this, the spatial distribution is almost always biased towards that edge. Um, and so one of the things we were trying to look at is trying to understand, is this just an edge effect? Is it just because they're moving in from the landscape and that's where they get to first, or is there something maybe more at play? Um, so we did this with some mark recapture work. Um, and what we found is that, that lanternfly have FOMO, they have fear of missing out. Um, and so what we're finding is that uh, the proportion of lanternfly recaptured is much higher when the average density on that vine is also high. So basically lanternfly are more likely to move if they're not close to their friends and they're not seeing a lot of their friends and they're more likely to stay if they're already surrounded by lots of lanternfly. So I think there is something more at play than there just being an edge effect and there could actually be this attraction to other lanternfly. 
Um, I also wanted to put a really uh, quick, somewhat unrelated plug in, um, and that um, my technician from last year did a, a project on whether or not fluorescent marking is influencing lanternfly mobility, and so she'll be presenting that in a poster at Eastern Branch ESA. Um, and it has some really interesting nuggets of information um, apart from just fluorescent marking. So for instance, um, the average flight distance um, when they la launch uh, naturally from a pole um, being very different from uh, for females compared to males. So um, if you're attending Eastern Branch ESA, certainly check that out. Um, but getting back on track and trying to look at that impact of lanternfly feeding on grapevines, um, this is something that is ongoing and this is where we probably have the most clarity and yet it still continues to be very confusing for us. Um, so this project is, is led by Michaela Centenari, but also involves many other folks at Penn State, including her PhD student, Drew. Um, and so basically um, through all of these very complicated and um, hands-on and time-consuming experiments where we're caging lanternfly, uh, we're caging grapevines and, and introducing lanternfly, looking at sap flow, um, looking at trunk diameter, photosynthetic rates, lots of different rates. I'm simplifying it into one slide and that as you increase lanternfly, um, you're reducing your photosynthesis and sap flow in the grapevines. You're reducing your sugar content of the fruit, so those bricks values. Um, the cold hardiness of the buds is also being reduced, and then that is uh, related to yield in the following year. Um, so we're seeing this in our controlled experiments, but I'll also note that through the scouting data, we've also seen the same pattern um, with just uncontrolled experiments, but looking at the average number of lanternfly we observed on those vines, and then how many clusters per shoot they produce the following year. And so yield reduction is correlated um, with lanternfly density. So the more lanternfly you have, the fewer clusters per shoot you're likely to have the following year. Um, so to me, the fact that we're getting um, this, this significant relationship out of um, field data, which can be so messy, is, is pretty striking. So overall, we're finding that lanternflies are reducing photosynth photosynthesis, sap flow, and winter hardiness. But um, severity is going to be dependent, of course, on how many bugs you have. But also really importantly, the baseline health of the vine, the variety, the age, and the winter conditions. Um, so part of this, the reason I say this is because I caution against saying um, lanternfly alone kills vines. Lanternfly, we're learning more and more, is stressing these plants out. And grapevines um, in general are, are sort of babies, particularly depending on what variety you have. Um, and so it really just depends on a lot of different factors. So I think when we when we talk to growers and, and talk to the media about what lanternfly is actually doing um, to plants in general, but also to vineyards, um, and I'll show some examples of that uh, in my next presentation about um, myths, but uh, it, it can be very loud and it can be very showy sometimes, but it's not necessarily going to kill your vine outright if you're taking care of your vines and if you're if you're managing them and keeping them healthy. Um, overall, we have some survey data in terms of what the impact to lanternfly, uh, to vineyards, excuse me, has been so far. Um, and what we know is that about 80% of growers in the old quarantine zone, um, so the 14 counties in, in southeastern Pennsylvania, um, were managing lanternfly, and about 30% of those growers were reporting damage. And they were saying their damage was coming by way of either yield losses or vine death. Um, we also collected some spray records uh, early on, um, so old spray records, new spray records, and compared uh, how many insecticides these growers were putting on. Um, and we do know that in those two year, in that two year period, it increased by 10. Um, and of course, cost per acre went up as well. Um, my, my guess is if you go back to look at some of these same growers, and I have the spray records, I just haven't had time to do this, um, is that we're probably going to reduce that a little bit, even though lanternfly pressure hasn't necessarily changed that much. But I think it's a little bit of, of that getting used to lanternfly and not necessarily spraying as much. Still spraying more, certainly, but not as much. Um, the other data I want to mention um, is, uh, again, I, this, this data has really shifted the way I talk about lanternfly to grape growers um, in terms of uh, what they see as the impact or the potential impact to the future of their farm. So 57% of growers say that lanternfly is changing their outlook on the future of their farm when they're thinking about maybe handing it down to their kids, replanting or expanding. And 62% of growers say that lanternfly contributes either moderately or highly to their stress level. Um, so I, I think these are, are uh, not really surprising numbers, but also numbers that we need to be aware of when we talk about what the threat is to the industry and what tools we have to, to manage it. 
Um, and then the last thing I'll note is that um, this, this information, especially in economic impact, is out of date and not very thorough. Um, so we're currently working on a survey right now to get a better measure of what the economic impact has been. Um, so hopefully we'll have some, some new numbers to show you maybe next year. Um, so all of this getting in, we know that there's an impact from lanternfly, we know that there's this, this yield reduction um, and, and all sorts of other associated impacts. So of course then becomes how do we manage this? And so that'll be the rest of my focus here. Um, now, hopefully this doesn't make you too dizzy, um, but this is what a, a vineyard looks like after the grower has sprayed for lanternfly. And you can see there's, there's some wing vibration there. So these are very fresh kills of lanternfly, um, still have those uh, splayed wings. And so what we know about spotted lanternfly is it's pretty easy to kill with insecticides, particularly the insecticides that growers are using in the grape industry, um, a lot of broad spectrum um, products. The problem is, is that when lanternfly comes into the vineyard, it's close to harvest. Um, and so that means that you have to spray uh, short pre-harvest interval compounds. And of course, those are not going to have um, any residual activity. And that means you have to do those repeated applications. And the other problem comes in with a lot of these growers don't have time to do repeated applications because they're trying to get the fruit off. Um, so this is really this kind of dance, this two month dance in the vineyard that becomes really stressful and, and problematic for these growers. Um, so a lot of our focus has shifted towards understanding what insecticides have better residual activity that we can really um, you know, help uh, or focus um, those products on. And then of course, after that will become what is the best insecticide program um, to use for lanternfly. So we haven't quite gotten there, um, but we have done a lot of testing of these different um, insecticide compounds. Um, so again, in this particular trial, I'm gonna talk about, we used um, products that we thought might last long. And so we were trying to look at that residual efficacy um, and giving lanternfly 24 hours to die. And so uh, this is what we come up with basically. And so this is busy, so I apologize for that. Um, but basically this is the, the average percent adjusted mortality using Abbott's correction. Um, and then the days after treatment go from one all the way to 26 days after. So looking at residual activity all the way up to 26 days for all of these compounds. And we have it grouped into pyrethroids, our neonicotinoids, a diamide, and then a carbamate. Um, so right off the bat, I'm just gonna say that, that Altacor, um, a diamide did not work well. Well, um, I still think diamides should be looked at further um, just because I don't think 24 hours is, is long enough to give them time to die, but, but we'll see there. Um, and then seven, so that's a really common one used for homeowners as well. Um, that one we did not see really any residual activity with. So at this point, really suggesting it only as a uh, knockdown spray. So if we break that out and just to look at the neonics really quickly, um, we tested both venom and scorpion. So for those of you who are familiar with ins these insecticide products, those are both dinotefuran. Um, but we were getting reports that venom was better from by growers, that venom was better than scorpion. Um, it was slightly better. I don't have the statistical values on here. It was slightly better, but not that much. In general, these neonics are providing about three to five days of residual activity, and that's about it. Um, and then we also looked at pyrethroids. Um, so we looked at bathroid, which is beta cyflutherin. So you'll see that one um, fairly commonly used in um, also some of these other control programs, as well as bifenture, which is bifenthrin, again, starting to be commonly used in some of the control programs. So here we looked at a full rate and a half rate, and then we used Danatol, which is fenpropathrin. Um, so bathroid, what we found here is that the residual is really similar to bifenture, which bifenture was kind of the staple um, that was being used in the grape industry for long residual, but bifenture has a 30-day PHI and bathroid has a three-day PHI. So it's a huge difference for growers, and I, and I suspect that we're probably going to see a shift towards using um, bathroid or beta um, uh, for some of these operations in the future. We also found that the full rate wasn't actually that different from the half rate in terms of efficacy and longevity. Um, so the half rate did, did start to drop off a little bit faster. Um, but generally speaking, I'm, I'm not necessarily suggesting half rates at this point, but I do think we need to do um, a lot of rate work um, moving forward to understand if we need to be applying um, all, of, all of the rates out there. And again, I think this is particularly uh, important when we're thinking about not necessarily vineyards, but also the control programs along rail lines. 
Uh, and then Danitol absolutely kicked butt throughout this trial. Um, the only reason it's it's below 100 is just because of the adjusted percent mortality in the control. Um, so it, it went up until about uh, 21 to 26 days with, with really excellent uh, residual activity. Um, and then the other thing I want to mention here is that I'm talking about a lot of broad spectrum insecticides, particularly pyrethroids, which I think many of you know are going to um, potentially flare secondary pests. Um, now we have seen an increased uh, incidence of mealybug and leafhopper. I cannot officially attribute that to lanternfly spraying, but it's certainly possible. Um, so this is something that we also want to keep on, on growers' radar as well. Um, the second insecticide trial we looked at was trying to look at where we were putting the insecticide. And so here we were looking um, for border spray applications um, where we tried a every row sprayer. It was actually an over the row sprayer and then a cannon style sprayer that was actually donated um, to us uh, from BDI machinery to look at this uh, particular uh, um, project. Um, and so again, going back to why we were looking at border sprays, it's because the majority of the population is at the edge. Um, and so uh, you can see that that application going on now. And so what we found is that border sprays were just as effective um, as every row sprays. Um, so they reduced um, by 85% and also the every row uh, spray reduced by 85%. Um, but the important thing here is we're reducing our spray time and depending on how large your plot is, you're also reducing the amount of insecticide being put out. Um, so I do think that this is um, a really promising method for growers that have access to this sort of equipment. Um, so that's, that's the one caveat here um, is that this is specialized equipment and not every grower is going to have access to that. And then this, of course, was the intake after we finished spraying that particular day. Uh, we also looked at exclusion netting, um, and so these were mostly small trials. Uh, this coming year, we have plans to look at um, putting it over a larger area and looking at the economic analysis of that. Um, but this is netting we used from, from drape net, um, and what we found is that it was super effective, almost 100% reduction in lanternfly on the vines. We didn't see a difference in disease, so that was good, though we did see slightly reduced sugar content. Um, probably just because we're reducing that sunlight penetration. Um, my, my feeling generally about this is that while it's it's promising that, that exclusion netting works, I think this is probably something for backyard growers or smaller growers, um, but certainly can be um, touted as something that works. And of course it's non-chemical. Um, and then we also looked at using um, sort of physical exclusion in a different way uh, by using a barrier wall. Um, and so sort of a flight intercept wall where we know that lanternfly are often coming in from the surrounding landscape. So if you look at this image, you can see these uh, black walnut um, kind of uh, lining the vineyard behind the cornfield. Um, and we'd often see, you know, lanternfly coming in um, and hitting the vineyard edge. Um, so we, we built this wall um, and, and basically treated half of it with insecticide treated netting and the other half with untreated netting. And we're basically trying to trap them at this wall and prevent them from moving further into the vineyard. Um, and uh, I, the, the kind of the concept here is that if we're having this wall rather than just one pole that they're interacting with is that even those kind of late season lanternfly that are moving in from the cornfield not flying as high are still going to walk up that tall object as they do that very fairly predictable movement um, and either be trapped by our traps at the top of the wall or um, exposed to that insecticide treated netting. Um, and so again, here's this picture of that wall. And what we know is that the netting um, alone that was insecticide treated killed uh, about 15,000 lanternfly in the two months that it was up. So that's, that's good, it's definitely working. Um, and some of you might have questions about the insecticide treated netting. I'm, I'm happy to answer those. Um, but I, I also, Brian Walsh will be talking a little bit about um, his experience with the insecticide treated netting as well. Um, the, the other bottom line, the thing that we're really interested in is what's happening to the population on the vines. We can kill as many as we want, but what's actually happening to the vines? Um, and so this is the average number of lanternfly per vine with no net. So the gray has, has no net protection. Um, then pink is treated netting, and then the blue is untreated netting. And this is as you're moving away from the vineyard, away from that wall. Um, and so what we see immediately is that the treated netting um, worked the best, and it's reducing lanternfly um, by 79% in those first two rows. Now, those first two rows are representing about 73% of the population. So again, thinking about that, that edge effect. 
um, as you move away from that vineyard wall, you start to see that 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 treatment effect dissolves and we start to get really similar numbers of, of lanternfly as you go throughout. Um, but again, you're still treating about 79% of the 73%. So hopefully that makes sense to you. Oops. Um, but basically, I, I, um, I, I don't think that this is something that we're ready to deliver to growers. I think that um, you know, building a wall is not something that's not necessarily practical to them, but the fact that this actually kind of even remotely worked is giving us a good indication of where to move from here and make it a little bit more grower realistic and cost effective. Um, and then I'm also going to talk about using Tree of Heaven as a trap. Um, so this is something we are interested in is basically uh, having a food truck for spotted lanternfly. And that's those are Julie's words, um, where she really likes to think about, you know, again, the, the seasonality chart that she showed yesterday in terms of what they want and bringing them everything they want, but then poisoning it. Um, and so what we did is basically um, take vines either without Tree of Heaven, um, vines with Tree of Heaven that had not been treated and then treated Tree of Heaven, so poisonous uh, Tree of Heaven, and just look at populations um, on the trees, but then also, of course, on the vines. And so what we found is that our untreated Tree of Heaven increased lanternfly levels on the vine by 78%. So adding that tree of heaven is really drawing them into those vines um, with about 11,000 um, lanternfly observed feeding on the, the tree of heaven. When we treated the tree of heaven, we actually still increased the number of lanternfly on the vines by about 13%. Um, so there's, there's maybe some interesting things to think about there in terms of visual cues or, or preference. Um, so unfortunately, we did not reduce the numbers on the vines by treating those, and we killed 25,000 lanternfly, um, and that was about over a five-week period. So definitely killing lots of bugs, but still failing to reduce those population levels. So, you know, we, we would like to do a little bit more with this, I think, especially looking at where Tree of Heaven is placed um, near the vineyard. Um, but oftentimes I get this question from growers or, or from people trying to prepare growers is should vineyard owners remove Tree of Heaven on their property? And my answer is eh, um, maybe, maybe not. Um, in truth, we don't know what's best, right? We, we haven't studied that. We haven't been able to look at that. Um, but the problem lies in the fact that grapes are just so darn attractive to lanternfly um, that they, they will come no matter what, right? Um, and so tree of heaven removal can be costly. Um, so I've seen some grape growers um, put in, you know, several thousand dollars to remove tree of heaven in their woodlot adjacent, uh, their vineyard, and they saw absolutely no effect. Um, so I, I would not overwhelmingly influence growers to do this necessarily in their vineyard unless they have, you know, adequate funds or, or they understand kind of what those, that it might not work, I guess is what I'm getting at here. Um, and again, related to uh, Tree of Heaven and trying to understand what's in the woodlot, we're also starting to look at landscape movement and, and trying to understand um, basically the retention of lanternfly in these different habitat types and where risk might be highest adjacent to a vineyard. Um, so again, using mark recapture um, and looking at um, using marker capture, putting them in different environments, and then waiting to see how long it takes for them to come out of that area and into the vineyard. Um, so this is super preliminary work, but basically we looked at corn, um, forest environment, and then kind of this, this suburbia where you've got lots of maple trees, lots of houses, um, and understanding, you know, again, where is that retention highest? Um, and so really unsurprisingly, your retention is going to be higher where you have a host. Um, so forest was lowest and neighborhood was also quite low in terms of the percent recapture of, of our population that we put out there. Corn, they did not stay in, unsurprising. It's not really a host for them. Um, and they moved out of the vineyard fairly quick or into the vineyard fairly quickly after they were released in corn. So my conclusion here might, might strike you as a little bit odd then in this case. Um, but we've had a lot of growers come to us and say, we have a cornfield or a soybean field right next to our vineyard and they are coming out of it like crazy. Like they're just flying out, there's millions in there. Um, and I've actually seen this happen where you, it's, it's almost like a wave where they come out of the corn and into the vineyard. Um, and so I think, again, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of work that needs to be done here, but I think maybe you can um, start to think about lanternfly being present kind of equally throughout that landscape. And if they're in that corn, they're not likely to stay. And so maybe being adjacent to a row crop could pose increased risk during that time. Still very, a lot more to think about there, but um, um, certainly interesting.
Um, and then also a plug for our fact sheets. Um, uh, the updated version of the fact sheet is still um, being finalized with our communications group, um, but that should be up soon. And that includes, of course, insecticide recommendations. Um, so we have our different compounds uh, in the pink here, and then uh, lots of important information, but of course, longevity of the product and efficacy rating. So that will all be updated um, for recommendations for growers. Um, so the, the last thing I, I really want to talk about is, is usually what I try to tell growers in terms of what do you expect if you don't yet have lantern fly and what do you do? So what should you expect? Um, one is not to run around in circles and panic. So I think um, even if lantern fly has been detected in your county or in your area, it doesn't mean that you're all of a sudden going to see an infestation. So typically the first one to two to maybe three years after detecting your first lantern fly in the vineyard are still quiet. So just because you're finding maybe one in the vineyard doesn't mean again population explosion. Um, and then Secondly, that your first bad year, the one that's really going to be, you know, problematic is probably going to occur later in the season. Um, so those adults usually will come maybe in October rather than September. Um, and so the nice thing there is that you can probably be, probably be through with most of your harvest before those lanternfly really start to invade. Um, and then, of course, the last thing um, that I, I try to remind growers of is the fact that lanternfly is present throughout the landscape. They're not just in your vineyard. So I've, I've seen a lot of growers um, spend a lot of time um, to kill everything they've got in their vineyard, scrape all of the egg masses that they've got laid, and they think that they might be okay for next year. And very much different story, right? Um, and so I think it's important to think about not just what's in your vineyard, but also what's surrounding it. And then what should you do if you don't have lanternfly? Um, of course, make sure that your employees and, and the vineyard crew is aware of lanternfly, knows, how to, knows what to look for. Um, scout for tree of heaven and probably some of those other um, key uh, tree hosts, um, particularly black walnut and maples. Um, and then monitor those trees and your vineyard, vineyard edges for uh, lanternfly, particularly in the late season when you're just more likely to see them in your vineyard. Um, and then if you think you find spotted lanternfly, kill it, take a picture, and then of course report it. So all, all of that important stuff. Um, and then going back to, I mean, I guess I can, I can jump to my summary here. So this, this comment of lanternfly being detected in your county doesn't mean you're all of a sudden going to have this, this uh, huge invasion, right? Um, so I, I've been getting a lot of questions lately from people who are trying to monitor and, and focus in areas where lanternfly has been the most significant impact, right? So a lot of states are looking at setting up monitoring programs in vineyards or around vineyards, uh, which, which I think is fine. That's great. But I think that there's two kind of important factors that, that usually have me talking folks out of that. And one um, is that grape growers are super aware of this pest and they're very terrified for it to come, right? And so I think part of that means that you know, you already have a trained population. And so maybe your resources would be better spent elsewhere. And then the other part of that is, again, typically you're not going to see lanternfly in a vineyard when lanternfly first becomes detected in that area. So I think I, Doug Pfeiffer talked about this yesterday, where they just are starting to see one lanternfly at the, at the wood edge, right, in one vineyard um, in Virginia. So I think that this might not be the best place to focus your energy in terms of early monitoring. And then for growers to make sure that they're using those insecticides uh, cautiously so that they're not overspraying before lanternfly becomes problematic. And then of course, um, keeping vines healthy, which is hard in itself, um, but that might be kind of your best bet and best defense against lanternfly. Um, so with that, lots of folks that worked on this project, um, including our technicians, uh, Julie, Michaela, Brian, um, and, and many others. And then, of course, we have really excellent grower collaborators um, and companies that have worked with us to donate products to allow us to do research on their vineyard. So all this research is, is coming to you um, really from, from the field and from these growers. So that's very appreciated. Um, so I think I might have uh, some time for questions. Thank you so much, Heather. That was absolutely wonderful. The comments coming in are how great it was and people are getting a lot out of your talk, but you did generate a lot of questions as you always do. So uh, let's jump right into them. Uh, do you think they are sitting in the morning and waiting for a faster flow to begin when the change in temperature changes the pressure, kind of like how sap in the maple flows in the winter? Yeah, I think that's an interesting question, right? I mean, I, I don't know the answer. Um, it could just be temperature related, right? So lanternfly are just kind of waiting for themselves to warm up. 
given that lanternfly are actually warmer, you know, they produce that thermal heat signature, they're actually warmer than their surrounding environment, maybe it has more to do with the plant. So I think that's a super interesting research topic, but I have no idea. <laughs> okay, what variety of hops would, were used in your study? Those were cascades. Cascades, okay. What, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I guess Nancy's jumping in there and answering some. So there, um, what, uh, what can growers uh, do to remove the egg masses from the posts? Is it worth the time? You sort of answered that a little bit, but um, if a grower did want to remove them, uh, what would be your suggestion? Yeah, so I mean, I think um, th there are some vineyards in particular, the ones again that have the non-galvanized posts that we see just for whatever reason, lanternfly really like to lay within that. Um, and there's there's one vineyard in particular um, where the vineyard owner's wife, her favorite thing to do in the winter is take her propane torch and go out and just light them up, right? Not on the <laughs> vines, but, but on those metal posts. And so um, she actually, she ran, ran out of propane on the last few rows and I was there in the spring when they hatched and you could see nymphs all over the vines where she hadn't done that and um, not on the vines that that she had you know gone through with that torch so I think it really depends you have to know um, where they're laying eggs and, and what sort of proportion you have on your vine versus maybe your metal posts um, so in some cases it, it might be worth it and they can use you know maybe propane torches otherwise it's scraping um, now you can use lores band so Greg Kravchuk has done some some work um, again of course on ovicides I would recommend Lord's Band before I recommended oils, um, but generally speaking, my recommendation is just wait until they hatch. They're, they're way easier to kill um, when they're nymphs um, compared to having to worry about coverage and, and using something that might be phytotoxic um, before bud breaks. So generally speaking, I, I say not to use uh, anything for the egg masses. Okay. Um... Did you mean to say the eggs were found more on vertical surfaces? No, more on horizontal surfaces, actually, unless they have um, some sort of covering or protection. So those T-posts are a good example where they kind of curve in. Um, and if it's just a post alone um, without that curve, then they're much less likely to lay on that. Does that make sense? What factors led you to sel uh, the selection of crops used in the first study? Is there anything about hemp, kiwi, et cetera, that leads one to suspect they would be targeted by SLF? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And um, to be completely honest, it's somewhat <coughs> random. I mean, um, kiwi is certainly a crop of concern, and we've been contacted quite a bit by folks from New Zealand asking us um, to provide data there. Um, but there's also hardy kiwi that's grown in um, Pennsylvania or kiwi berries. Um, so there's been some growers that contacted me. So I think it's more so who's, who's reached out. Um, and uh, John Ross, who, who is focused at Penn State Berks, um, is always propagating strange plants and happens to have avocado that, that I'm able to use for those kinds of experiments. Um, so this, this coming year, we have some funding from uh, CDFA to actually continue this work and we focused a little bit more on um, certain varieties by actually being able to order them rather than uh, propagate them ourselves. Have you, Heather, looked at non-target mortality is there an insecticide that is best to use that re reduces non-target mortality? As soon as you start to use softer insecticides, you're gonna to start to lose your efficacy and start to lose your residual activity. So we have looked at things like Movento or, or Spiro Tetramat um, in hopes that maybe they're gonna kill your mealybug outbreak and lanternfly. Unfortunately, that didn't work well. Um, we've also looked at doing systemic drenches for grape vines to, instead of doing this foliar broadcast, to put them in the vines. And so just the things that are feeding on that vine would, would then die. Um, this is something, again, we really hope to pursue in, in this coming season. But unfortunately, we did two different applications of, of these systemic insecticides. And I think our rates are just too low in the vineyard world. Now, a drench in the ornamental world works very well. Um, so I think we have to play with the rates there. Okay. Have you tried having uh, treated trap grapes closer to the edge of the vineyard? And you sort of answered that in your talk when you were just spraying the edge, but 
Yeah, so we, we did, I didn't show data for this, but we also um, had two vineyards where I put a uh, treated tree of heaven just at the wood edge to see if we could just keep them, you know, before they get into the vineyard, they're maybe going to land there first. It killed lots of bugs, but it didn't do anything to uh, what was on the vine. So I think if, if we just have to make something really attractive, something that beats great pines, and I think we've really struggled to do that so far. Have you tried it with, um, have you tried Diutefron or some other uh, neonic in grapes on the edges? Yes. Um, so we, uh, I worked with a vineyard that bought uh, a A1 mist sprayer, which is actually now being used by, by PDA and USDA folks to spray rail lines. Um, so this grower was the one, I think, to first find this sprayer. Um, and we did a big trial with Bovaria. So we tried to mirror what was happening at Blue Marsh um, and do three applications of uh, Bovaria bothniana to see if we could reduce that population in the woodlot before they get into the vineyard. Um, it didn't work well. And so then we followed up with um, uh, bifenthrin and that knocked down the populations for some time, um, but then they came back up. So it really wasn't until Brian and I went out there um, and treated uh, some of the trees systemically with Dinotefuria and the Tree of Heaven um, that we really started to see a reduction. But that's something that has low replication at this point that needs to be looked at further. Cool. Um, do you plan to uh, look at effects of SLF feeding on apples at their veggie crops? And I do think you alluded to that, but. Uh... Yeah, so we have, um, again, the funding from CDFA and then also um, a, a grant proposal in um, with Tracy Lesky's group to, to look more at um, some of the tree fruit and perennial crops as well as veggies. So stay tuned, I guess. Cool. All right. Well, that's all the time we have. Um, Heather, really appreciate you sharing all your information and your knowledge with us. We did not get to all the questions um, in the question area, the question, the Q and A area. So, Heather, if you want to spend, a, if you have a few minutes to spend, uh, you might be able to respond to so, some of those. I know Nancy's been um, trying to tackle them too. So, our next speaker um, is Brian Walsh. He is also from Penn State University. He works with ornamentals as an extension educator. Brian is located in Berks County, PA, which is the heart of the SLF population. And I look forward to hearing about his experience with ornamentals in high SLF populations. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yep. All right. Your slides um, free. Yep. Yeah. So, I have a half an hour to get through ornamentals and landscapes update, and um, it's a it's not going to happen. I can tell you that. So we're gonna we're gonna go through this as a crash course. A lot of what I do builds on a lot of what Heather does, and um, to a certain extent, a lot of those things are going to hold true. But there's some big variations that I want to cover. And so when we talk about you know ornamentals and ornamentals being defined as any trees that are um, in a landscape that are there just to look at, right? They're not a crop production. They're not, not there to make money with. And so, you know, that's, that's the, the where, where is it? Where are those ornamentals? The when, that's the timing of this insect. And then the why is, is gonna be coming up at the end. The why is, you know, should we treat, why? And so just as a quick um, idea here that I want you to think about for what do ornamentals and landscapes are? When we talk about spotted lanternflies in the environment, right? We can we can break it down into different areas, and they're all concerns. The natural forests, those those unmanaged native naturalized flora, right? They're out there. There are people that are looking at that, and largely, you know, what's coming back is that spotted lanternfly doesn't really do that well out in a contiguous forest. Uh, it's not it's not become uh, prevalent in high numbers. And that's there's still more research going on, but but far and away we see the agricultural crop landscapes, right? Like Heather was just talking about those highly managed and monocultured areas, and then we have the the concept of the natural areas and the unmanaged right aways, and those are the train tracks, those are the highway corridors, those are those are those unmanaged areas. They they tend to be just full of unmanaged invasive species that that spotted lanternfly really enjoys, and and really thrives in. And then we have the suburban landscapes and that's that inner tie between the managed urban landscapes and the unmanaged quote natural areas, right? And then we get down to urban landscapes. 
and and I my definition of this is very different than what you would see in a um, a landscaping class. I'm not talking about urban as in city. I'm talking about urban as in highly managed and manicured landscapes where the lawn is mowed. There's nothing left um, to fill in on its own. You're talking about housing developments, athletic complexes, the urban parks, and so that suburban landscape area is really the intertie between uh, the natural areas, the, the agricultural areas, and those urban landscapes. And with spotted lanternfly, it's becoming more and more apparent that that is a critical junction and how we're going to handle it. So this is an image of uh, uh, Topton Lutheran Home, Topton PA, and this is, this is a great example of, you can see, you can see that contiguous forest. You can see the croplands. You can see that urban landscape where everything is very well managed. And then you can see these unmanaged fence rows. And these, these red maples here are, have been used since 2018 uh, for research with spotted lanternfly insecticide work. And so in 2018, Charlie Mason and some others did some work there trying different insecticides and they had huge population numbers. And in 2019, they returned and there was nothing really there. And so it was let go. The population wasn't there, collapsed, it moved on, whatnot. And I went back in the spring of 2020 and lo and behold, it was just loaded with new egg masses. And I think what happened was that in that late influx of adults came in after the researchers went back to look for population that wasn't there. They came in, there was no treatments on those trees and they laid a lot of eggs. And so I went back there in 2020 and started doing some um, pesticide work and efficacy work on those trees. And so monitoring that from um, June 13th through uh, the end of the season in November, no, November 7th as the last uh, count weekly, uh, close to weekly, uh, you can see that the populations there, they started up pretty high, right? Early June, you see we're up we're counting 1,500 uh, nymphs on those 50 trees combined. And then it just kind of goes away. By, by July, we couldn't find any. And then there's just a slight uptick, slight uptick in, in uh, late August. And that's when the adults are starting to show up. And it's just kind of there and steady. And then all of a sudden, we have that late season explosion right at the end of September. And if you were watching yesterday, um, uh, what, what Julie showed, what Miriam Cooper Band showed, that end of September right there, that's when the egg laying phase starts. And it's pretty, it's pretty interesting to me that that massive arrival comes in right at egg laying. And so what, I'm, what this refers to is eight by eight. And this is how I, when I measure trees, when I look up into trees, I can, I can measure eight foot up. I can see eight foot up very clearly. Uh, and I can also mark egg masses at eight foot with a lumber crayon. Above that, we just call it the above because to try and see those first in stars, to try and see those egg masses way above there. Uh, Ho Ping showed that, Joe Keller showed that yesterday in the monitoring, it's difficult to see up into those trees. And so we can, we can actually rely on that eight by eight. And that's why I use that number. And so in those first, first or third in stars, it's no different than in the agricultural world. They're, they're feeding on that tender tissue. They're feeding on what is soft tissue that they can get their proboscis into. And in the landscape world, the answer is yes. They will feed on just about anything. If they don't like it, they move on. If they like it, they'll stick around for a little while. Often though, not more than just a couple of days. And that's a big break from what Heather was showing with the grapes. It, they will not stick around that long um, in any one plant, any one planting, any one type of um, environment, they just keep moving along and they move with a lot of frequency. Kelly Hoover's work showed that last year. And, and when you see that, this was our first visit out there. This is the back of my truck, the top of my truck. These were nymphs just climbing up on my truck. And to go back to where that was in location on this property, this is a service access road that we park on. I purposely didn't park under the truck be, uh, or under the trees because of um, don't want to collect nymphs, but here 50, 60 feet from the trees, that's still what the truck looked like. And it's just nymphs walking through that environment, through that landscape. Here we have our crop land. Some of this was corn, some of it was uh, alfalfa this year, some of it was soybeans. And so they just move through that environment. And 
here we have that fence row with the mixed uh, species. There's grapevine, there's a lot of black walnut, and then we have mature black walnut trees up on this edge. Well, we looked around when we couldn't find them in, in those 50 trees, those 50 maples there, we walked the property. This is a quarter mile out. I could not find any serious numbers of lanternflies to justify where they all went off these, these maples. And that doesn't mean that I could see to the top of the maple trees. Clearly these are 75, 80 feet tall. Uh, clearly I can't see to the top of that. Even with um, binoculars, you're not gonna see second end star nymphs, right? So they're out there. We know they disappeared. We know they disappeared off that property, but then we also know that they came back. And so a big question is timing. If we're gonna go out and treat, what are you, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna try and treat all those first in stars that aren't really doing that much damage, moving through you know, flowering plants? Do you wanna spray on flowering plants? And, and the answer to that is no, we don't wanna kill pollinators. And so you have to be very careful with your applications. And this goes in contradiction to what Dean Roush was talking about yesterday with using the long-term neonics early on. It's almost the opposite in the landscape world because they're not gonna be there long enough. We're not broadcast spraying that entire property. We're not gonna go through with air blast sprayers and spray neonics to try and kill that whole population. And so it's, this is where that, that wear really makes a difference. In this situation, if you're going to spray, go with your short-term vigils, right? Try not to do any more damage than, than you have to with the uh, non-targets. But then when we look at this long-term here coming back, the long-term neonics, they fit better in the landscape and the ornamentals world at this point. The problem is they take time to get up into the tree to be translocated. And so trying to know ahead of time to treat with donateferon in this period not knowing if the population is going to return, it can be it can be tricky. And so, you know, within that season, what we really saw come back, I can see eight by eight, I can see it in above that eight by eight in my counts, I can see adults, they stand out pretty well. So we did too many counts per tree. And on those 50, 50 trees, when you look at this timeline here, how many came back, right? We saw that jump in two weeks from 509 across 50 trees to 16,400 adults, right? And this was a pesticide trial site. I know from, from my pesticide work, we killed about 9,400 adults in that same time period, right? So you take that up, it's about 25,800 arrived in that two week period. Is it worth treating at that point? Well, the question is, what are you treating for? Are you trying to kill eggs or, or prevent egg laying? Are you trying to save your tree, which is a common question. I want to save my tree. How do I save my tree? And the answer to that is we don't think they're really doing a tremendous amount of damage in the short term to those trees. And so is it necessary to kill those trees um, or to uh, treat those trees? Sort of. Um, not really, but kind of. Um, you... It depends on what you have beneath the tree. Is the sooty mold growth going to be damaging to your deck, to your car, to your house? You know, what's there? You have to look at the where in order to, to, to answer the why. And we know that these populations are fluctuating greatly within the season. Um, that egg deposition here is in the eight by eight. We see October 3rd, very, very few, right? Then we have this big burst, second week in October, and then it dropped a little bit, and then it goes up a little bit, and that's that's a week by week. But when we take that cumulatively, you can see that those numbers in in the green, um, excuse me, in in the blue, you can see that steady climb in the eight by eight. And we do try and count, you know, above eight by eight what we can see from the ground, and you can see it it grows up, it goes up. But part of the problem with that, and this is again, back to what Hoping and Joe Keller were talking about, in my data on this particular tree, you can see above eight by eight on this week, sampling week 18, I counted 16. The following week, I counted 11. Now it's improbable that those eggs disappear. The difference is they went from that brighter color, fresh laid, they faded back to that darker color and I can't see them from the ground anymore. And so this is where it's very difficult to judge the populations and what's up there uh, based on what you can see from the ground up in the tree. 
And it's not a reliable way to do things and not a reliable way to judge a population in an area. Uh, interestingly enough though, later in, in the spring after hatch, sometimes those eggs are much easier to see after they've faded back and opened up. Um, but in that eight by eight, as I said, I use lumber crayons to mark and a different color each week for when those egg masses appear. And as Heather was talking about, you see that concentration of eggs. Well, blue is one week, red's another week, purple's another week, pink's another week. They kept coming in and they kept going to that same area. And they kept going in and laying those eggs in that same area. And uh, it's, it's very, very common to find them smack together. And this actually happens way up in the tree too, where most of the branches will be empty and then you'll find one branch that is just absolutely slathered. For whatever reason that they join together and think it's a good place to lay, I don't know. I'm hoping Heather comes up with a good answer for that one. Um, and yesterday, I just want to add in, yesterday there was talk about the oversides. These numbers are here uh, because this is part of the oversight trial that we're currently doing there in Topton. And um, oversides uh, with oils, you can use oils in the landscape readily. They're labeled for it. It's not uncommon. We, we use them for scale insects, things like that. They're smaller. Uh, the problem is they do have a whole host of requirements in how you use them. The rate uh, the timing of the application, most oils go on in the spring when the eggs are starting to more actively respire. Um, there is concern about the, uh, the covering, protecting them from the oil, that they don't, get, they don't truly get smothered with, within there. And um, coverage, it's easy enough to spray eggs that are low down, but knowing that two thirds of those eggs are way up in the tree, if you're there with an air blast or a, a, a hand cannon sprayer, and you're spraying up into those trees, what are the odds that you're gonna get the coverage rate that you need to smother those eggs? Well, we don't know. And that's actually what we're gonna start working on this spring as well. Um, but the, the, the cautions that I have with spraying oils as an oversight for the landscape world, there's some problems. If you start spraying on evergreens in the fall, you're gonna discolor next year's growth. If you are going at a high rate where it starts becoming uh, phytotoxic, you can knock all the blooms off. And if it's a flowering tree, um, I don't mean physically knock them off. I mean, chemically kill the blooms that they drop off the tree prior to flowering. Well, what's the point of having a flowering tree if it's got no flowers on? And for the, the landscape industry, um, it's a concern for the nursery growers. It's a, it's a very large concern too. You, don't, you have to be careful with this and it's not, the same when you're doing it in the ornamental landscape world as if you were doing it out along the right of way where you know it doesn't really matter so much if there's some phytotoxicity as long as you're not killing uh, all the vegetation. So that that when and why um, and where are very, very important questions to answer before you start using oversides. Uh, Heather mentioned Lorsban, Corpyrophos. It is not approved for use in residential areas. It is a political hot button in that um, it was going to be banned during the Obama administration, uh, during the Trump administration. It was uh, it was revived through the EPA and overturned on that ban. And uh, uh, during the new Biden administration, it has already been listed in the first 10 days as targeted for retirement. So it is available for growers, but there is a lot of um, concerns and issues with using it. And so, when we look at that population across the seasons, um, fluctuates a lot. But between season to season to season, as Heather was saying, uh, you know, is it going to be cyclical? Is it going to go up and then crash? We're not sure, but we're starting to get better information. And this is a telephone pole off of my road um, where we could see this is actually an apple orchard adjacent to it with all dwarf apple trees. And that pole is the dominant feature. And as we've seen over and over again, lanternflies like to climb poles. This is the same picture, just zooming in. And this is what we saw picking apples. And uh, knowing that they like to climb poles like that, we installed a, a, a um, bunch of poles in a production nursery in Berks County in 2019. We got started a little bit late, but you can see where the, the blue uh, images are. We put four poles in this area. These are all hoop houses. You can see they're, they're along a, a naturalized tree line here that has walnut and a little bit of the lanthus, not much, and all kinds of other um, 
oriental bittersweet and things like that. We put four poles up across the top in areas where they're more in the open. And then we also treated five maples with uh, dinotefuron systemically. And so the, um, the results there for what we did, uh, we, we got some poles, we hired a company to come in, CM High, they did a great job. The, the poles were leftover hot poles from um, the uh, Rock Ledge Experimental Station. Um, put these poles in, put some ropes on them, and we hung Delta Methrin impregnated netting around them on hoops, raised them up on the ropes, and there they were. And the lantern flies came in, they climbed, and they launched off the tops and left. And we were finding them dead out in the, um, in the nursery, but difficult to quantify when they died you know, uh, several minutes after taking off. So went back and asked myself, what would Wiley Coyote do? Because Saturday morning cartoons teach us, you know, if nothing else, don't stop until, you know, don't give up until you've tried everything up, including rocket powered roller skates. So we used some big tomato cages and wires and hog rings, and we closed that top in a little bit so they could go up inside it and fall out the bottom after they die, but they couldn't as easily launch off. And lo and behold, we got dead on the tarp. And you can see the Delta Methrin kills them. Um, they got displayed wings and um, they drop pretty quick. And so in those, those pole traps, we conducted that in 2019 and then we continued it again in 2020. And you can see in 2019, the, the dotted line, this is where we got started late. We had to make those modifications and it took some time, but we also took all those and sexed them out and all the dead ones on the ground. And you can see we have, you can see we have the males get there first and then the females come in a little bit later. And that line of, of crossing that 50-50 point, where did that happen? Right towards the end of September. And you look at the solid line where this happened, same spot. So we see that very different in the landscape um, compared to what Heather was showing in the grapes where the females are dominant the whole time. We don't see that in the greater landscape. And where because we were, had the poles in, we were able to get started earlier this year, we started right in adult emergence. And you can see that that ratio of male female is almost dead even right up until the end of August. And this is when they first get their wings and they're starting to make those short flitting flights around. They're checking it out. Hey, I got wings, I can fly. Look at me, hey, check out that pole, oh, I'm dead. And we, it kind of looks here like we just knocked out the local population essentially. But then we started to see those dispersal periods, right? And in this in uh, 2020 it extended for quite some time. We went right out through um, towards the end of October that the females were still coming in where they had largely dropped off in 2019. So there's, there's variations between the seasons and timing, but also just in sheer numbers. You look at the numbers killed in 2019 off those, those eight poles, we killed over 12,000. The population in 2020 was under 8,000. And that's a significant difference. It's down 30% down there. What does it mean? We don't know, but we're gonna go back and try again in 2021 and see what those populations do. What I think is neat about using the poles is that they are not, um, they are not attractive as a host. And so it's not a host plant, Atlantis grape, maple that's bringing them in. They just happen to be in the way and, and the lantern flies are attracted to them. So that gives us a kind of, a, a, better feel of what's just passing through the area, not necessarily by the crop uh, or the host. And so when we talk about predicting host preference in the landscape and going back to that urban landscape concept, it's very different. It's very different than in the wild, what, what everybody's working with that you saw yesterday, where they're trying to use everything there. Uh, we, this is a Collegeville uh, shopping center where we went in and you can see we broke down the parking lots into, um, groups and we looked at the, the plants that are in there, the trees that are planted in the parking lot islands. And uh, this is about 250,000 um, square yard um, property. It, it is quite large. And so we took that and we broke it down and then we identified the trees, measured them for DBH and did live counts that are on the individual trees. And over here you can see 
all the species present, how many of that species were in that lot. And then you can see the live counts that were actually there. And if you look at the lindens here, the very few, right next door, here's a maple with 161. Out here, a maple with a red maple with 161. And you can see that some, some of these just are not preferred. Crab apples, they, they couldn't be bothered with crab apples at this time of year in October. And so we go out and here's another lot. And this one has almost no, it has no maple in it. And our live counts are what? High of three. So there really is um, a focus on, on what the host is at that time of year for egg laying. In the urban landscape, we can use that as predictability of what we should treat. And then as Heather was showing, where there is an edge effect in the, in the um, vineyards, it's the exact opposite. We have, we have the parking lot that's almost dead centered out in, in the greater shopping center. And here we have, they found those maples in, in relatively high numbers, maybe not quite as high as the edge, but pretty high. And so it tells me that they're willing to move through that shopping center in order to get, um, get to where they want to find, uh, get to where they want to be. And so looking at that host preference of the 10 species of deciduous trees that are in that shopping center in those lots, um, total sum of the DBH and then the sum of the SLF, you're looking at it, boom. Um, it, it is just massive uh, on the maple almost non-existent on the others. And so average numbers of lanterfly per inch of DBH by species, you're looking at 13 per inch of DBH on the maple. Next highest is all the way down here at 0.17 per inch. And so there really is a focusing, there really is uh, some predictability in the urban landscape. And because of that, we should look at um, approaching it for control that way in that environment. And it's very different than the right of ways in the naturalized areas. And just to show, you know, the edge effect, you know, here's that lot I, that center of the, of the shopping center. It's pretty close, pretty even across there that they moved through to find what they wanted. And that's where they laid their eggs. So targeting the insecticide at that point is going to probably yield much greater effect than going through and trying to spray all the trees in that shopping center um, to control them. Hey, Brian, so where, five, yeah. five minutes. Okay, so where we're going from here, um, we have we have what the, the we started with, and now we have some funding from PDA and USDA to develop this. Uh, Randall Bach and Ag Engineering has been a great help with this. And um, this is what our prototype now looks like installed by First Energy on a utility pool. So um, we're going to take those and start using them out in the pop-up areas that Joe Keller was talking about and start uh, testing the sensitivity of those poles um, and see if we can use them as a monitoring technique. And that's what I have, so thank you. Uh, thanks to a whole ton of people, um, funding uh, PDA, USDA, and Penn State, uh, the businesses to the uh, Daikon Senior Living, Meadow Wood, Eaton Farms, First Energy, Pico, CM High, uh, all the people here that that helped me on a almost daily basis. Um, just really couldn't do it without them. So that's what I have. Thank you, Brian. And it does not look like there's any questions in the uh, Q&A, but uh, I do have one for you. The telephone poles, um, it seems like we you would have to be able to work with a local utility to use the poles that are already in existence, uh, placing poles in landscapes have got to be pretty difficult. And, and so those poles that you placed in that nursery, were they already there or did you actually? No, we installed those purposely for that. And so if this becomes a, um, a uh, control technique and, we, and if we can show efficacy of control, uh, this is something that growers could do themselves, put poles in. They just have to be higher than um, the dominant features in the landscape to be to draw the lanternflies. Uh, in terms of working with utility companies, that's a lot trickier, and we are working through the agreements on that. Uh, obviously, you can't just put a ladder against the utility pole and, and climb up and put a, a trap on it. 
Um, thankfully, the utilities are um, interested in, in helping us with this and, uh, and are interested in uh, being good citizens with the lantern fly fight. Cool. Well, you, we seem to have stimulated some questions. So in the next few minutes, uh, did you use any lures on your poles? Not at all. Okay. Nope. And what, um, what did the poles cost to have installed? Uh, the poles, like you said, uh, they were leftovers from a hop yard experiment. So they didn't cost us anything for the poles. All told, the eight poles we installed, I think, was about $900. Uh, the company, uh, CMI, did a, just a fantastic job of, of helping us keep costs down because we had no true funding to do this. It was kind of more of a whim. Um, but it was about $1,000 roughly for the installation. The poles, depending on what size you get, they, they cost different amounts, um, you know, depending on your local market. Okay. And then we've had two people ask how long the pesticide was effective on the treated netting. So that that insecticide that's impregnated in, into that material is rated for, I believe, two years straight, no problem. We did we used the same netting again the second time. Uh, before we put it up for the second season, we tested it against new product and it was the same time for kill. So uh, we, we put it up. Um, beyond that two years, don't know. We'll see, we'll see how the efficacy works this year. Okay. Um... At the Collegeville site, uh, do you have any evidence that the SLF on maples were coming in from the surrounding landscape or from vehicles on that were hitchhiking? I would find it really hard to believe that there was that many hitchhikers. Um, no, that, that area, that location, it's uh, maybe not as extreme as the vineyards uh, pictures that you, you saw with Heather, but uh, anywhere that there's that level of infestation in, in the greater environment, you can just watch them take flight during the big dispersal periods. Uh, now they, they were flying in from around. Okay. One, one more that we might be able to sneak in here before 1030 uh, yep. turns over. Have you used the poles in a non-nursery setting? Uh, we did install just one in the um, med ed yard. And so if you can imagine, this is the training yard. It's a sea of utility poles and we put one pole in there and it actually killed some despite the fact that it was one of 70 or 80 and a half acre um that but that's all we've gotten to so far right now we're, we're we want to see it as a monitoring technique can we can we predict um can we can we uh, use it to monitor in low population areas as a early warning signal I can't let this one go by. High tension um, uh, wire towers not only attract by being tall, but also provide the buzz sound that uh, Miriam was looking into that was discussed yesterday. Um, so that kind of uh, may be a possibility in the future to combine both the acoustical with the uh, with pesticide netting. I'm, ver I'm very anxious to see if there was some kind of lure that we could combine with this concept. I, I think we have a home run, uh, whether it's sound or, um, you know, pheromones are out, caramel whatnot. Um, that would be great. I think it would only improve the, uh, the efficacy. Cool. All right. Well, thank you so much, Brian. That was very interesting and very informative. And it just lets us know how unpredictable uh, SLF is in all the different landscapes we can find it in. So thank you very much for sharing your knowledge with us. Thank and you for having me. It's now 1030 and we're going to take a break until 1045. So please rejoin us at that time. Thank you. Brian, there are a few more questions. If you want to go in and answer them manually in the Q&A, that would be great. This is uh, Tina again. Uh, we will be uh, starting the second half of the extension portion of the SLF Summit um, right now. Lori, if you don't mind starting to share your screen. Uh, Lori Chamberlain is our next presenter. Lori is the Forest Health Program Manager with the Virginia Department of Forestry. 
She has been a great partner in our response to SLF here in Virginia. She and our team has taken the lead in getting the word out to the logging and forestry community here. She is um, going to talk today about some targeted outreach work she has done in this community. Looks good, Lori, take it away. Okay, can you guys hear me, Tina? Yep. Okay, great. I'm gonna leave my video off. I keep getting a message that my internet is unstable. So hopefully that will help. But um, thanks for inviting me to speak today. As Tina mentioned, I'm the Forest Health Program Manager at the Virginia Department of Forestry. So my program is tasked with monitoring the state of Virginia for forest health disturbances. Um, I was asked to talk today about our outreach to loggers. So I'm going to talk about that and then also kind of our overall spotted lantern flight efforts at the Virginia Department of Forestry. When spotted lanternfly was first detected in Virginia in January 2018, there were some very clear roles for some of the agencies and groups in Virginia. Um, so VDAX, the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, they're the regulatory agency in regard to pests in Virginia. So they immediately started doing delimiting surveys, um, working with APHIS to conduct treatments, and then they implement and regulate the quarantines. Then we have Virginia Cooperative Extension, and they do what they do best, education and outreach. Um, they immediately created a spotted lanternfly website and produced some really terrific educational material. They've led countless trainings and workshops and probably given over a million spotted lanternfly presentations. Um, and then we have Virginia Tech and other research institutions that have been focused on method development, um, learning more about the pest and te testing different treatment options. So that left us, the Department of Forestry, and we wanted to support the effort. Uh, we knew it was a really important effort, but it took us a minute to figure out the best way since our role wasn't uh, really as clear cut as with these other agencies. But our agency is set up in such a way that there are field foresters in every county of Virginia. And these foresters work really closely with the forest landowners in their work areas. So in many places, um, the foresters and the landowners have been working together for many years and they've developed a really positive working relationship. Our foresters also conduct water quality inspections at timber harvests. So uh, this means that our folks go out to timber harvest operations and then they provide guidance on water quality best management practices. And this gives them one-on-one um, -on -one interaction with the timber harvest operator or the loggers. So because of these connections that our field staff have with the landowners and loggers throughout the state, we decided that our approach would be a train the trainer approach. And we would train our field staff and give them the information that they could then share with the landowners and loggers in their areas. So we worked with Virginia Cooperative Extension to hold a training event for our foresters at a spotted lanternfly uh, infested site in Frederick County. Um, our folks gathered to learn about the biology of spotted lanternfly, uh, but the main goal was really to teach them how to identify the pest. We were there in June, so they were able to see the nymphs and old egg masses, and we just spent the whole day in the field learning about lanternfly. Um, and when the day was over, we discussed the, the quarantine, the proper way to inspect a vehicle, and then everyone did a self-inspection on their truck before leaving. And so you can see one of the trucks uh, behind the group there. We thought that was really important since our foresters drive these trucks all over the state. And of course, we sent them back with lots of goodies. I know everyone has created their own lantern flag giveaway items, but here are just some examples of ours. We've got stickers, scraper cards, keychain flashlights, uh, temporary tattoos, and diameter tapes. And I would have to say that these diameter tapes are probably the most desired so far. Um, they definitely aren't cheap, so you, know, you can't purchase them in the same large quantities as something like stickers, but they've been a big hit with the forestry community. They aren't you know, high quality as a logger tape, but I think they're a great 
uh, spare diameter tape for our folks just to keep in their trucks. So our goal with training our foresters and giving them all of this educational material was to have them share this information with the landowners and loggers in their areas. And so I wanna talk about the loggers for a minute because in our minds, they were a really key group to reach out to. Um, logging operations involve really large pieces of equipment that are outside for many days. And then it involves the movement of a lot of plant material as the harvested logs are taken to a mill. So in many cases, they're moving the logs to another county, which probably involves leaving the quarantine area. So it was really critical to reach out to this group and make sure they knew about spotted lanternfly, they knew about the quarantine, and they knew how to apply for a permit to move logs out of the quarantine area. And really all of the credit here goes to our foresters in these areas that spoke with the loggers during the harvest inspections. Um, but we did try to make it easy for them by creating a checklist specifically for loggers. And so we started with this general checklist that VDAX had created for self-inspection of regulated articles. And then we just changed some of the language to make it more accessible to loggers. And so we added information at the top about the quarantine, um, how they could comply, and then added specific items on the checklist for a logger to inspect, such as uh, skitters, bulldozers, tractors, and cut logs. And, you know, this sounds really simple, but I think just adding specific language that a logger can connect with made it seem, um, made the whole process seem a little bit more doable. And so our foresters handed these out along with identification scraper cards during those water quality inspections at timber harvests. And we also did outreach to other uh, logger and forester groups. Um, I wrote an article for the Virginia Logger Association newsletter. We've given presentations to numerous groups, including the Virginia Forestry Association and the Appalachian chapter of the Society of American Foresters. So, you know, really just trying to get folks in the forestry community aware of spotted lanternfly, how to identify it and how to help slow the spread. And one thing we found after all this outreach was that there seemed to be a renewed interest in treating and removing tree of heaven. And this is definitely a win-win for us. We've been advocating the removal of tree of heaven forever since it's such an aggressive invasive plant in Virginia. So spotted lanternfly is really just another reason to get rid of it. Um, my predecessor published this booklet, the control and utilization of tree of heaven a while ago. And so last year we reviewed and updated it and added information about spotted lanternfly. Uh, we printed a bunch of copies um, and it's been really popular. It's long, so we do have plans to make a shorter brochure with just like the very basic tree of heaven treatment information. And then this leads me to another role that the Virginia Department of Forestry has taken on since lanternfly was found in Virginia. So our forest staff, our forest health staff has experience conducting aerial surveys. Um, we usually do this every year for tree damage, mostly from defoliators like gypsy moth, but also maybe for storm damage. And so we go up in a small aircraft and we map the damage in the forest canopy. And so we have the technology and we have the mapping software to record and map these forest health disturbances from an aircraft. And we started wondering if we could use this experience and this technology to conduct aerial surveys to locate pockets of tree of heaven. Um, we figured if we could do this in the area of lantern flight infestation, it would be useful information for agencies that were actually doing tree of heaven treatment. And so we started researching Tree of Heaven aerial surveys and found that it had been done before. Uh, this publication uh, listed up the top here describes how they surveyed for Tree of Heaven in Ohio. And they found that the winter was the best time to do this type of survey. The female trees retain their seed pods. And so they're easily identified from above in the winter during leaf off. Um, as you can see from this photo in the corner there, since there are no leaves on the trees, those tree of heaven seed pods really pop out. And we were also advised by forest health staff at the Pennsylvania uh, Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. Some of them are in that photo at the bottom. 
they had done these Tree of Heaven aerial surveys before, and they were extremely helpful and willing to share advice and tips. Um, they saved us countless hours of research and prevented us from making a million trial by error mistakes that you know you often make when you're trying something for the first time. Uh, some of them may be on the call today, and we're just very grateful for their help and advice. So we did these surveys in the spotted lanternfly infested area in Virginia over three days in a helicopter that followed predetermined flight lines spaced about 2,000 feet apart. Um, in total, we flew 937 miles and stayed approximately 400 feet above the ground, flying at about 80 knots. Points were used to mark clusters of one to five trees and polygons were drawn on the map for uh, clusters of more than five trees. And so here is that data. Um, I didn't actually do this mapping. My stomach can't handle all that flying. And you can see that, that was a lot of really tight flight lines. So I'm grateful that I have a staff that was able to go out there and do these aerial surveys. They flew over Frederick and Clark counties. Um, and again, that was a total of 937 miles. They collected 921 data points and ended up drawing 493 polygons. So the area included in those polygons was approximately 3,700 acres. Um, so that was 3,700 acres of Tree of Heaven that they found. And the Tree of Heaven was found where you would expect it. Um, mostly disturbed sites along train tracks, roadsides, um, field edges, and a large quarry in the area. And so we know this isn't a complete data set because only the female trees were mapped. And the locations of the points and polygons may be slightly off since they were, were mapping in a moving aircraft, um, but it can still be a really important data set for getting a better geographic understanding of where Tree of Heaven is and where it's concentrated, and then um, hopefully will help target treatment. So this data has been shared with our partners, and I believe VDAX is currently using it as a layer in their survey and treatment program. And most recently, we've trained our foresters to conduct spotted lanternfly egg mass surveys. And those are being conducted right now. Um, we had a short online training. We sent them binoculars and then asked them to survey high-risk sites in their area. And I was able to create a form in Survey123 that all of our folks can bring up on their computer or their phone to enter the survey data. Uh, for some ArcGIS apps like Collector, everyone needs to have an AGL account, but for Survey123, the users just need a link. So that's been really easy to share with our participants. And I guess the important thing to note here is that before starting these surveys, we spoke with VDAX and APHIS to make sure that all of our data fields were consistent with theirs so that the data that our foresters collect can be easily integrated into their GIS database. Um, so this is just a way to get more eyes in the field looking for egg masses, but you know, the more the better. And so far we've only found gypsy moth egg masses, but we're certainly gonna keep looking. So my final thoughts are that forestry staff can be a critical tool for outreach. Uh, we all have a role in the spotted lantern flight effort. And I think that our role at the Virginia Department of Forestry can be outreach to landowners and loggers. And logging companies in particular should be targeted for outreach just because they move such large quantities of plant material across county lines. Um, we've also found that forest health survey methods can be used to locate Tree of Heaven and assist with spotted lanternfly surveys. So that is all I have from a forestry perspective. I guess if there are questions, I can answer them now or on the um, Q&A feature, or you can reach out to me later and my contact information listed here. Well, thank you, Lori. Um, just one comment about the aerial survey data. We do have it available to us um, as a layer that we can open up. So when we're um, going into area that we haven't um, uh, surveyed, we can target better uh, where we should place our efforts because we know Tree of Heaven is there, um, especially if we're uh, just trying to go two miles out from the um, generally infested area. This really helps guide us. So uh, much appreciated there. Also, another effort um, I would like to mention that um, 
Lori and Laura Johnson from Virginia Department of Forestry were involved with was a strike team. Um, they wanted to uh, use, um, this was the first time that the Forest Service, uh, they, uh, Lori, maybe you better explain it. I think you'd do a better job. <laughs> Are you still on? Yeah, it was um, the urban forestry strike team. And I didn't mention it because it was really led by our urban and community forestry program. Um, but they've, they've done these strike teams before to map and measure disturbance after big storms. And so we decided to take that program that already exists and use it to help out um, mapping and marking Tree of Heaven in the treatment area here in Virginia. Um, and I think it was pretty successful. We had folks from different state agencies. We had um, some federal partners join us and everyone just kind of hunkered down for a week in the infested area and went out and marked Tree of Heaven. So that was really highly successful for us too, because we had knowledgeable people that were able to help us advance our surveys uh, very quickly. So we were set up for treatments in a much uh, quicker fashion than we would have been without that strike team. So it was highly successful on all, all counts. Um, I There are several questions. Um, Rick, uh, yes. Can yeah. I? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. My question is: Have you had any cases yet where customers had expressed concern about receiving um, spotted lanternfly contaminated materials, and if so, how they responded to them? So I have not at the Department of Forestry. Um, Tina, have you received? Any complaints from the have, Department of have, Agriculture? Yeah, we have received uh, numerous reports from people that uh, in the nursery industry that have received spotted lanternfly. We had a uh, fiber company receive some apple wood from Pennsylvania that had some uh, spotted lanternfly in it, but they all turned out to be incidences and not, um, not reproducing populations. So we respond to each one of these reports in the same way. We send out a staff member to collect the sample to confirm that it was spotted lanternfly. And then we follow up with trace forward and trace back information and just make sure, uh, do surveys uh, continuing, for, continuing from that report. So repeated surveys, set up traps in that area. Um, that we get those reports. Thank you. Um, let's see, we have time for it. Have you seen any impact on regenerating stands, either feeding damage or reduced growth rate from sooty mold? So from a forestry perspective, I have not. Um, I know we have started to see some impact on trees, just like individual trees. Um, but in terms of, you know, a, a, a forested area, I have not yet seen an impact. And I can say that our staff in um, Winchester uh, definitely sees, uh, we, it's a highly industrial area and uh, there are abandoned wooded fringes to these businesses and there is heavy sooty mold growing or, or being produced in these sort of outlying wooded areas. And um, there, there's not been a study as far as I know, except for the one uh, spoke uh, th that was presented yesterday. And so we do see heavy sooty mold production, but we have not, at VDACS has not um, done a, an impact study on that. So we'll, we'll have to rely on the researchers to bring that information to us as they did yesterday. Um, a lot of the places where we have spotted lantern flights kind of, kind of trashy junky sites with a lot of tree heaven. 
uh, less now since we've been um, killing it, but definitely something something to consider in landscapes, certainly, and in regeneration. So um, I definitely will keep my eye out open for the research on that. We have one more uh, pretty complicated question here. How can information be shared between agencies to increase access to these aerial maps? Frequently, we see duplication of efforts for ground crews. Additionally, has anyone considered reaching out to the EFETAC personnel in Asheville, North Carolina for remote sensing. So all great uh, questions that I think we'll have to look into. Um, is there anybody on the panel that has done remote sensing? Well, I will just say really quickly that um, we have used um, some Forest Service products to that shows where Tree of Heaven is located. And I think that is based on remote sensing and or FIA data. Um, so that, that kind of helps target where we should do aerial and ground surveys. Um, but I think definitely learning more about how to use remote sensing is would be useful. And really quickly, um, how do we share information between agencies? So that was really important before we set up our um, survey one, two, three form for our ground surveys that we made sure that we were gonna be able to share that data with VDAX and APHIS. So that was something that we looked into beforehand to make sure that our data fields were gonna align with theirs. All right, super. Thank you so much, Lori. Uh, our next speaker on the agenda today is um, Brian Eschenauer. And thank God for Brian. He's the one that's keeping the webinar going. So we really appreciate Brian's efforts for that. Uh, thank goodness he's there. Brian is the Senior Extension Associate for Ornamental Crops at Cornell in the Integrated Pest Management Program. He will be, he will be presenting information about the outreach program conducted in New York, where until recently, re reproducing SLF populations were not found. Great, thank you. And really this uh, Spider Land Fly Summit is a, a team effort. So I'm happy to be part of the team and I'm doing my part here for that. I think there have been some great presentations. I've learned a lot. And uh, I'm gonna uh, go into show mode here. And uh, yeah, I think what I'm gonna share today will be really useful for states who don't have spotted lanternfly yet. We've just got it in 2020. Um, and um, I can talk about some things that we're doing that uh, I think are working in New York State. And one is we have a really good working relationship with um, several agencies and uh, the university. At, and I think we're all really on the same page. We might all have slightly different objectives, but we know where we overlap and we're able to, um, to work together well. And first up is our regulatory agency, and that is the New York State Agriculture and Markets. And with us today is uh, Ethan Angel, and he's going to be speaking a little bit later on as we go into some of the work that uh, they're doing in outreach. Um, and, and we do work really closely together. Ag and Markets is our connection to our uh, New York State Agency of Department of the Department of Environmental Conservation, along with parks and recreation in New York State. And in fact, the uh, first uh, population of spotted lanternfly identified in the state was in a park setting on Staten Island. Talk about that in a second. But um, we also are really lucky in New York State to have a. Uh, a an agency that is working on um, in invasive pests, and that is the Partnership for Regional uh, Invasive Species Management, or PRISMS, and they're located in different regions in the state. They've really had some creative ways to get the word out about spotted lanternfly, and we're happy to be uh, connected with them. And hey, Brian, also we've got Northeastern we're not seeing, IP. Hey, Brian, if you, were share, if you were trying to share your screen, it's not successfully shared. Oh, I am sorry about that. Um, <laughs> the logistics person is not sharing 
is <laughs> correctly. How about that? All right. How about this? Oh, okay. We see the. Um, yes. And that will go to the presenter view. There we go. All right. There you go. And Thank that you. is the full screen you're seeing. Correct. Okay. So I was going through these agencies that were up on my screen, and now you can see them too. So we've got our agriculture and markets, our Department of Environmental Conservation, the parks, the uh, Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management, and uh, I was just finishing up with Northeastern IPM. Not only do they help us in New York, but they're really getting the message from uh, us out to the region, and they are, are really connected with uh, everybody in the region. They feed information to us as well. And so I'm part of the Cornell Cooperative Extension System, and um, my agency is the New York State Integrated Pest Management Program. So some of the things that we've done, I'll just go through um, uh, some of the recent activities. One of them is uh, in 2020, we established a, a listserv. And so we have uh, over 90 people on this listserv. And so these are educators that are interested and uh, are in the position to be multipliers. So we get the information to them, interact together, and that uh, information goes out through the state. So this includes extension, regulatory professionals, invasive species specialists, and other educators. We have a uh, university, we have uh, a few school teachers on there, anybody who's interested in, in that education role, uh, including master gardener coordinators throughout the state are there. Um, along with this, we have uh, webinars. We sometimes do them monthly. That's about the maximum we'll do them. Um, sometimes it is every other month. We're just about to get started for our 2021 season. And this is a good way for us to interact. Uh, we have our regulatory agency on their egg and markets. They provide us with what's going on, what they're seeing in the state. Uh, so we have good um, connection there. And uh, with new research findings, we're able to share that. Um, and of course, presentations. And this is the standard extension mode. We're no exception. We're getting uh, information out. Our uh, partners are all making presentations throughout the state. And we're finding that, you know, people do uh, know about spider lanternfly through these presentations. Um, one of the ways that we're doing it is uh, if we're speaking to a commodity group about maybe another topic, maybe we'll throw two or three slides in on spotted lanternfly just so there's an awareness. It's in the back of their mind. They see something like this, uh, they'll know where to report it. And, you know, we do uh, reach the standard industry groups. Uh, we've given some presentations to our legislators in Washington, uh, just so they're aware, they hear about the concern with the grapes and uh, our New York uh, legislators know what a big industry that is for uh, New York State. Also residents. And uh, when those are done, particularly by the master gardener uh, coordinators, those kinds of things. We would really like to emphasize uh, what spotted lanternfly means. And we wanna, uh, we know when this hits the New York uh, City area that uh, it'll cause a lot of concern. We really emphasize, you know, that these guys don't bite, they don't sting, they're not structural pests. And um, I really like the recent um, article that came out of Penn State. And I think we're gonna hear about that um, with the myths about spotted lanternfly, because, you know, uh, if you go on Google and you put in spotted lanternfly uh, and some other search terms, you can see these kinds of things. Uh, can spotted lanternfly kill you? Are they dangerous to humans? Why are they so bad? There was uh, a misconception that came up um, late summer and fall that uh, if the pet, if your pet ate them, if a dog ate them, you know, they might become really sick or die. So we want to get good, reliable information out there. And, and that actually, you know, is not true. That was one of the myths that was handled in the recent Penn State uh, publication. So um, we also established for educators a box folder with outreach materials and resources with PowerPoint presentations that we're updating so that that can be a multiplier effect. And uh, other educators can use those materials, include some video clips and animations that they can put in to their PowerPoints and the whole presentations themselves. 
we have uh, a couple of people in our IPM program that are active on social media and they're getting information out. When they see reliable information from one of our other states that are active with spotted lanternfly, they're gonna be um, making sure that that information gets out and is shared uh, throughout New York. Uh, something that uh, we got started last year and we hope uh, when we are meeting again in person, when COVID is uh, under control and we're out there again, we'll be distributing these. Um, <clears throat> and these are spotted lanternfly detection kits. And these include a scraper card. It includes information where to look for uh, spotted lanternfly, including a mirror as a reminder to look under things. And this is like a little compact uh, mirror that fits in there along with a bag to uh, scrape the eggs into little Ziploc bags. Um, so we, we have those kind of things. And this is really as a reminder for folks, you know, just to be out there and looking. Uh, certainly you can detect um, spider lanternfly without something like this, but um, it is kind of a reminder for the volunteers that uh, want to use something like this. One of the things that we added over the last few months was a site to our webpage on the insecticides that uh, can be used for spider lanternfly. In New York, uh, we're more restrictive than uh, most of the country on the types of products that we can use. And we have this um, current list of products that are there. This has really been a team effort from our grape specialists, from fruit folks, uh, from our uh, a pesticide um, agency in um, at Cornell that looks at these things and all that information went together. I got to give a special credit to Dan Gilbrain, an entomologist in the Cornell Extension System. He's done a lot with this and uh, recently provided an update. So just two days ago, we have uh, new information on there. And we have, a, we have two places we also separated it out just for grape growers. Although it's not in our vineyards yet, uh, we're ready. And this is, um, our, our grape growers are glad to know that they have that list there for when um, they will need that. And this is our big news for 2020 that uh, in August 14th, the state announced that uh, there was a confirmed finding of a population on uh, Staten Island. And that was the one that occurred in a park setting. And uh, Ethan Angel, who is on now, can talk more about that, but I'll just uh, finish up with a few more slides here. So that was our first one in uh, 2020 in the, the summer. But then in November, um, further upstate, this really caught us off guard. And this is right in the Finger Lakes region of New York State where we have, um, you know, hundreds of wineries there. And there was an egg mass that was found in November. Some adults were also found in that area. And this really made news. It, it, I think it may have made even more news uh, with this finding and a couple other findings along the Pennsylvania and New Jersey border. Um, it really got uh, people's attention. And so these new finds are reflected on our map and we um, are the ones that maintain this map. Um, you can see Ithaca, uh, Tompkins County is there, even though this is a really small infestation and it's possible that this could be eradicated. Um, it shows as the entire county is uh, infested and that's just because this is a county-based map. And over on the right, and if you go to the web page where this uh, map is located, you're going to see these disclaimers there. And one of those is that, you know, it's a county based map. And even though we know in parts of Pennsylvania, in other areas in New Jersey, there might just be a section of that county that is uh, infested, it shows up as the, the whole county. It's just the limitation of the map. Some of the things I'd like to mention about this, because we do maintain this map, is that you know, you shouldn't make policy decisions on this map. This has been very useful for growers to see where it's at, maybe, you know, how they should be preparing. I think it's used a lot regionally and even nationally, 
but it's not um, official. We're just basing our information on what we receive from the state officials. And there is some lag time from when they notice it until when it appears there. And based on some information yesterday, I think we uh, have some information to update on Virginia that'll probably be showing up in the next couple of weeks. So just a little bit of heads up on that. And please, if you see anything that you disagree with on this map, send an email. Those come to me and I'm happy to uh, address those. And um, yeah, I think that covers the map there. And, you know, I'm going to ask on this page, though, if you go to our website where the map is, there's a place for New York residents to report if they have seen spotted lanternfly. And if you click on that, it goes to uh, this form here. And this is the way that we've decided to in New York to handle most of the inquiries or the, uh, the spottings of spotted lanternfly. And I think uh, Ethan Angel is on. And Ethan, if you want to walk us through there, and if you sure. just say, uh, next slide, I can move that as we go along. Yeah, that'd be great, Brian. Appreciate it. So just to kind of circle back to some of the things that Brian said, you know, we, we rely heavily on the New York State IPM program for education outreach. Uh, you know, they're the, they're the experts in education outreach. They're dealing with the growers. And so we, we started that started that partnership on, us, on SLF back in 2015 with the development of a fact sheet. And so we've, we've cultivated that partnership over many programs over many years. And so um, you know, it's, it's, as Brian said, it's a hand in glove relationship. Uh, we're giving them updates on what we're seeing so that they can get that out to the public and, and coordinating with them. And uh, consistency of messages is always a difficult thing. So we're always collaborating and trying to make sure that we're all on point and saying the same things. Um, as, as Brian mentioned, and he has a slide up here, we're trying to focus our um, reporting through electronic means. I know some states have call-in centers and whatnot. We chose early on not to do that uh, just because we don't have the staff. We don't have the capacity to do that. And so we, we went strictly electronic. We started off with a, uh, a spotted lanternfly email for reporting. We morphed that into this web reporting tool, was, which is actually just um, an Esri product. It's Survey123 working in the background as a web application uh, that people can enter their information in. It's a four-page piece and it gives all the information that we're looking for here. You can see the we're looking for an observation date. Did they collect a specimen? Any notes about it? Go to the next slide. Um, they can add photos here. We have several lines that they can add photos. We really like photos. We, we push that out quite a bit in our education outreach. Photos, um, you know, tell us that we're dealing with the right insect and the right pest. The public is very, uh, very good at identifying this pest, but we do get some some lookalikes and some confusing things, especially on the egg masses. You know, you see some gypsy moth stuff come in. Next slide. And then, you know, location. So they're able to pick the location based on the map. They can scroll through. That'll plot in the Latin long, um, and then they can say whether it's an approximate or exact. And then uh, basically they submit that into us. And then we get that into, uh, into a group email that we have set up here at the department. Um, and then that gets assigned out to our inspectors to follow up on to determine whether it is uh, credible or not. And then also we track the number of reportings based on geographic areas. So if we see a lot of stuff starting to uh, come from one particular area, then that's gonna heighten our, our, our survey efforts in that area to kind of see what, why that is happening. Uh, and sometimes that's just in relation to outreach. So a lot of people think they see it. In other cases, it's because they have found it. And um, we have two of our infestations were found by the public. Uh, and, I, and I credit that to our education outreach efforts, the one in Ithaca, and then the one down in, uh, in Orangeburg. And uh, we followed up on those and, and found those infestations. So the public is, is key in reporting this and we have found that to be true. Um, we continue to try and expand out our education outreach material um, based on some of the things that we hear back through through the presentations and listserv stuff that, that Brian works on. We heard that we need something specifically on, on Tree of Heaven. We needed a little bit more descriptors on, on egg masses. We developed these one, one page fact sheets. Uh, and you notice on the bottom that the next sort of evolution in our reporting and the electronic piece is, is QR code. So all of our outreach material is gonna be updated with QR codes uh, so that people can directly go to that link and as opposed to trying to find the URL or, or copy that URL on the bottom and type it in. So they can just scan it and bang, it'll bring them right into uh, the reporting tool. Next slide. 
Hey, Ethan, have, five minutes. Yep, thank you. We have a whole host of outreach material here. Uh, as you can see, some of this we've, we've taken from others, the, the wine coasters and other coasters we took directly from, from Pennsylvania. They gave us the graphics and we modified them. We have a little outreach form that we send out to our partners that they can order outreach material from us and, and supply these. We also have some of these translated into Spanish and French. Next slide. And then the other thing that we're working and engaging on is citizen scientists. We have uh, uh, this PRISM group that, that Brian mentioned, and uh, most of them use uh, IMAP invasives here in New York. And so we launched a interactive uh, uh, gateway into grid surveys for PRISM groups. So they can select a, a grid or a citizen scientist can select a grid that they'd be responsible for surveying. And we've done uh, one training. We had 300 people sign up for, and we have 80 grids that are already signed up by the public to go out and survey. And we have three more trainings that are scheduled, and we're hoping that this will help to get more people out looking for spot and land reply and reporting it. And these are, you see the picture up here. These are some of the folks that were involved in it, um, the New York State Heritage Program that runs our IMAP invasives program, and then some folks from, from our, our state agency. Next slide. And then the PRISM groups, which is a great uh, you know, we mentioned the PRISM groups, the regional invasive species management groups that exist all across the state of New York. Um, this is a funded uh, opportunity that comes out of the state uh, that was set up because of the invasive species laws. And so this is a, a group that look for invasive species. And so we're working closely with them on spotted lanternfly, uh, not only through the IMAP um, uh, slide that we showed earlier, but on outreach, on education, on other opportunities. Next slide. That wraps it up. Well, that was wonderful. Thank you. You guys are doing a stellar job of getting the word out. That's for sure. Um, there is, oh boy, here's a big all long question. I'm going to try to get through it. <laughs> Looks like it's several parts. With the survey one, two, three reporting, data accumulation can build rapidly with the surge in reports as infestations move into urban areas. While this data is expansive, it's also valuable to researchers. What plans exist for making the um, BLOB output accessible for them, or has there been, has this been considered? So we have had many requests for that, and we have provided that. We've, we've watered down some of the stuff so we don't provide the PII information, but um, we do provide you know the reportings of it and whether we found something and what we had found. Uh, we, researchers have asked us for that and we, we, we filter through each one of those requests to see what, what it is that they're using it for. Um, and then we filter out some of the information that we can't disclose, but what we can disclose, we have provided that. Uh, the other thing too, that's important to note um, based on that question is we do get a lot of responses at particular times. There is an automatic response that goes back to that uh, person that's sending that in that thanks them for their inquiry and that we have received it, we're processing it and somebody will get back in touch with them so that they know that it went through successfully and that we acknowledge that and we thank them for it. All right. The second part of this question is really a comment that there's additional uh, outreach uh, SLF material at the USDA APHIS publication site for anybody that's interested. There is a link posted in the um, question, the Q&A. Um, we have another question. If you are interested in seeing your giveaway items, um, if we are interested in seeing your giveaway items to create them in our state, who do we contact? So you can contact myself or Brian, um, and we'd be happy to share with you um, the graphics. Um, we own them. So um, in the cases of the ones that we built, if they're borrowed from like the coasters, we borrowed them from Penn State and, and PDA, uh, you'd have to contact them for their permission. But anything that we created in house here in New York, we'd be happy to share. Uh, do you think you could provide an email in the Q&A? Um, sure, sure. I'll get those in there. All right, super. Thank you. All right, with that, I think we, unless anybody else has one uh, quick question they'd like to ask, I think we will turn to our next speaker. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Ethan. That was really wonderful. Um, we are now turning Heather. back to uh, Heather, who is there, um, who will be talking about misinformation and her presentation, Myths and Misconceptions. Thanks, Heather. Dana, did you have something you wanted to add quickly or? 
Um, just put your uh, questions in the Q&A and just remember everything's being recorded. That's it. Go ahead. You're on. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Tina. Um, uh, related to the question about materials, um, definitely if you're interested in um, getting access to some of the materials um, that both we've created at Penn State, but also um, materials that we've um, kind of pulled from um, Hungry Pests and USDA Creative and PDA Creative as well, stay tuned for the communication session um, and we'll, we'll tell you more about that. Um, but anyway, this, this next section is going to talk about um, myths and misconceptions. Um, if you were at the summit last year, I, I um, had a similar sort of presentation where we're just trying to um, address some of the problem areas that we are aware of and um, trying certainly to make you aware of as well so, um, so that we can help kind of fight those things. Um, and then before I do that, I'm hoping to have um, some people kind of uh, play along with me, if you will. So I'll uh, paste this um, link into the uh, chat box. And so this is a poll everywhere survey where basically you can go and click and um, let me know how you're feeling today on the scale of uh, cat. Um, and so certainly it'll be great to get some responses because I'll be quizzing you also on some of these myths and misconceptions um, with some trick questions too. So um, if we can get people to play along, um, personally, I'm a seven today, so, <laughs> but, um, but also it's, it's an interesting way to try out this software. So hopefully it works okay. Um, and then as I move through the different questions, it will, um, <laughs> it'll basically um, kind of refresh that question. So you'll see as I go through the next screen, um, Hopefully. Maybe. Oh. So this next screen um, should hopefully bump you to the next um, poll everywhere question. Um, and this is all anonymous, but if you have, you don't have to type in anything, but if you have any um, myths or misconceptions that you've heard about spotted lanternfly or anything in particular that you want to address, um, we can certainly do that. Both, um, <laughs> both Brian and I have, um, you know, kind of talked about this presentation and, and what sort of myths are out. The truths and, and just confusions, right? So sometimes we just don't have the answer to a lot of things. Um, and so again, hopefully we'll battle that, but I hope there is a little bit of back and forth both in the Q&A box or, or through these polls um, to kind of get an idea of, uh, um, what you guys want to hear, basically. So there are there are some that say none, which is great. <laughs> okay, well we'll jump to the next one. And um, again, myths, the myths with spotted lanternfly. This is something that we've seen. You know, I think Penn State always gets because we have the highest population. We always deal with those problems first, right? Um, and so we have a lot of that that panic happening or the misuse of pesticides. Um, and so we generally jump on this first and in coming year, a lot of our focus will be um, on trying to make sure that people are managing spotted lanternflies safely, we're managing their expectations of what they might get out of management, um, and then of course, trying to help them with that management decision. Um, so Brian talked about this, this article that we just did recently written by Amy Duke, um, who writes many of our Lanternfly um, news articles, um, where we went through some of the common myths. And, and for some of these, we tried to keep it fun. So whether or not Lanternfly are luminescent. And so the, the myths that we uh, talked about are on the bottom here. So we went through five different uh, things. So pressure wall, um, whether or not spotted lantern land needs tree of heaven, um, homemade sprays, and then again that luminescence of lanternfly. We've also tried to, tried to um, kind of go after this in a, in a different way in talking about do's and don'ts. Um, and so again, a lot of this is getting at pesticide use um, or how you're using sticky bands. So if you're using sticky bands, you need to use that wildlife protective covering. Don't use insecticides in bloom. So some of those those basic things, um, and it's a lot of don't panic messaging too. Um, and so I know that that part of what I'm talking about isn't necessarily um, super relevant to all of you out there who don't yet have lanternfly because you're trying to walk that line between well we kind of want them to panic right we kind of want them to care about it um, but then you have to follow that back up or make sure that the truth is out there and, and they understand what the threat actually is. 
And of course, part of the problem is that we have situations like this, and I've shared this video so many times, and I know many of you also have, have seen it or have access to it. Um, it's a good outreach tool to freak people out, right? So landfill populations can totally be high. I have never seen a tree like this. I've certainly seen my fair tree or fair fair share of trees that are, are um, have high populations and you can you can do this sort of thing. Um, but but these are also kind of extremes, but it also is is an insect that interacts so closely with humans um, in the in the way of, you know, in their backyards, falling down their chimneys, um, gathering on their windows, um, ringing your front door if you have one of those automatic smart alarms um, at your front door or maybe they're following you into the department store and helping you clothing shop, um, or they're laying eggs on your hat, right? Um, or maybe they're in your morning cup of coffee or climbing up your toothbrush. So there are just these, these examples out there and there's, there's so many of them. I could, I could keep going with how many things I get uh, emailed or I see on social media that um, people are just reporting these insane um, interactions with this insect that I think is really unique across other insects and other invasives. And because of that, that means that we have, um, in some cases, really funny public reaction to spotted lanternfly, and it can be a nice um, comedic happened. Do you want to try to reshare? I think she may have gotten yep. knocked yep. off, so she's going to have to reconnect, which I am sure she will be doing soon. I hope she's not just talking away in her room all by herself. Yeah, if somebody could uh, send her a text. Good. Maybe we can answer a couple of questions in the meantime. Is that a good use of time? Um, sure. Uh, we did have a comment. Oh, there she is. Oh, oh there's there she is. Okay, great. <laughs> um, hopefully I can, where, where did you guys lose me at? Not this one. <laughs> Just the snow. <laughs> okay, so we're so close to here. The toothbrush and the coffee mug, maybe. Okay, sorry about that. I'm not sure what, what happens there. Um, but anyway, um, my, my point is that I'm, I'm talking about public reaction of lanternfly um, and the fact that we can get um, kind of funny reactions to lanternfly, right? Where you can have all sorts of internet memes um, and, and Halloween gets really funny. I particularly love that dog. Um, and there's all sorts of creative costumes out there. Um, and also some of the industry that's starting to showcase awareness to lanternfly um, in part to be funny because it's everyone's you know, favorite bug to hate. Um, so we have beer and, and shots at bars and, and wine bottles with lanternfly on them. Um, many of you are aware of the app where you can battle your neighbors and battle your community to kill the most lanternfly in a given amount of period. Um, earrings and ornaments. Um, we have uh, just recently found um, tie fit fly ties um, for fishing with lanternfly. Um, we have somebody who created a game, which um, is hilarious actually, because it has lanternfly being a mobster in this situation and taking out a, a um, fruit farm. Um, and then we have uh, comics also, which talk about even the biological control of um, lanternfly, which is pretty funny just because of that kind of intersection with research. And then, of course, we have uh, Philadelphia, where this past year um, we had really high, really problematic populations um, of, of lanternfly. Um, and so there was one situation in particular outside of the, the Chipotle where there were so many lanternfly and they had a hard time controlling it, um, that there was a big news story about it and that Chipotle had to close that one door because people were so disgusted and, and didn't want to walk through it. Um, and then, of course, I, I probably shared this last year where there was the tweet from Philadelphia police to say, stop calling 911 to report spotted lanternfly infestations. It's, you know, it's not a police matter. And they, they did this in a, in a kind of a comedic way. But this, you know, shows how much of an issue and how much of a kind of freak out this, this is causing to some um, folks in the city, especially. And you could even look back at um, when uh, the campaign was, the presidential campaign was going on and, and look on uh, uh, President Biden's shoulder now and um, see lanternfly. So you knew he was in Philly, Philly at that particular moment. 
Um, so anyway, my, my point here is that we've, we've garnered a lot of media attention towards spotted lanternfly um, and, and that can be good press and that can be bad press in the same right. Um, and at the same time, there's a lot of panic happening. Um, and so with that panic, I think comes you know, people who are trying to say, okay, well, let's, let's figure out how to deal with this. What are the experts saying? But of course, who are the experts when you're thinking about the general public? Where are they getting their sources of information? And so you have people going on social media to see what their neighbors are saying. You have tree care professionals, you have the news, and then of course you have universities or the departments of agriculture or conservation districts. And so you have so many different sources of information that there's bound to be some misinformation, right? Um, so if we work through some of these um, and, and talk about social media, so some of you I know follow what's happening on social media. Um, and so these are just some I pulled where um, comments I pulled about lanternfly where they're saying every one you kill prevents 300,000. So it's just some bad Bad math there. Um, if beer or wine are more threatened, help will come. So they have to be a little bit more threatened and, and then we'll actually see some difference. And then people saying, okay, well, we came up with a vaccine for COVID. Why can't we spray these things? A lot of people want, you know, you can spray mosquitoes. Why can't we just go out and spray these things? Um, and then you have, you know, in some cases, people getting a little bit upset. So a lot of our um, uh, recent news stories have talked about how residents are critical to help control the spread of lanternfly. Um, and, and these folks don't particularly like that. Um, we have somebody who posted um, about damage to their collard greens on spotted lanternfly. Many of you know this right off the bat, this is not lanternfly damage. Um, and people also claiming, you know, five of my trees were killed. Uh, they're going to destroy trees and precious agriculture. And my favorite comment is they should have been eradicating them instead of studying them, right? And so you're dealing with people online who can kind of have that positive feedback loop. Um, and, and we can end up in situations where there could be a lot of negativity and misinformation spread that way. Um, I will say that it's not all bad, though, um, and so you do see a lot of people on social media, including some of you that I see on there trying to help spread the facts and make sure people know what's going on, um, of sharing, you know, news stories from Penn State or from other trusted media or trusted sources, um, people commenting about how, you know, they don't need, they didn't need to treat their tree and their arborist even recommended that and they were right, they didn't have honeydew, so kind of talking about how, again, not panicking. Um, and then also asking for information, saying, you know, we see a lot of posts that are anecdotal and can someone please, you know, help us with this information and understand what's actually true. So it's certainly not all bad, but you do have to sift through uh, a lot of information. And then um, if you go to some of these landscaper companies, you, you see the same kind of thing. So again, working through these, we have websites of, of landscape companies that say, um, professional pest control uh, companies should be contacted at first sight of lanternfly detection. Um, so other, other ones are lanternfly can kill your trees. Um, and even if you have an infested tree that you don't want to save, you should still treat it because it'll help reduce the population of the damage, damaging insect whose population is exploding. So you'll see this kind of often where you see kind of um, pressure for companies or pressure for the public to start treating their trees because they feel like uh, they might have to. This person says two systemic treatments. Um, I This uh, sound, sounds illegal to me. Um, that's certainly not something we recommend. Saying that nymphs do the most damage, uh, saying that they feed on pine and fruit trees. Um, and again, talking about feeding by the nymphs includes stunted growth on trees. And um, stopping this pest requires an all out assault. Uh, and then of course, the other kind of um, thing we see here is that, oh, well, according to Penn State, they say this. And so we're tied to Penn State. And um, you know, that means that you know, we're a trustworthy company. And in some cases that can be true, right? Not all landscape companies are bad, certainly not. There's a lot that um, are really great. There's a lot that work with us to do research. But again, it's sifting through this information and especially, you know, putting it in the, in the mindset of the general public and, and how they're interacting with this information. Um, and of course, there was also situations where when it got so bad, you could go to your local Ace Hardware and they had, um, you know, a specific area dedicated towards lanternfly and, you know, essentially telling you what you can buy. You can buy these bug assault guns, you can buy Catchmaster, or you can buy systemic um, tree treatment and, and, and drench your tree. 
So there's just a lot of information out there, right? That's, that's just the point I'm trying to make. And then um, what are the newspapers, the media saying? The same situation here where I'm not trying to say that these, um, these organizations, these uh, media sources are bad, but it can it can create some problems for us. So the ripping up vineyards, orchards, terrorizing the state's agricultural industry, um, feeding on almonds, apples, blueberries, cherries, peaches, grapes, and hops. Um, this one talks about vineyards spraying up to three times a day, um, a hands down ridiculous amount of insecticide needed. Not only is that not true, but it's also harmful, potentially harmful for the grape industry. Um, and then also, you know, laying in your Christmas trees, 50 eggs, leave behind a not so holly jolly nest, right? So again, we use a lot of media sources to get information out to the public, but you can also battle through some of this um, and, and it can create more issues, even when you're not trying to. And, and when that reporter, I think, is, is working to do an earnest job and trying to quote you in the way that they think they hear you, it doesn't always happen that way. So um, finding that truth can be difficult, but there's a lot of people trying to. So um, Brian also showed some of this um, sort of Google trends and Google searching. So you can see um, back in 2017, the interest and the amount of people searching for lantern fly, and it has continued to increase um, every single year. And, and not surprisingly, it kind of reflects the phenology, this kind of flight activity um, late in the season that adults are doing. And you can kind of just see that range expanding, expanding and more people searching for lantern and fly. And when you look at the most common things searched um, in Google, at least uh, using that search engine for spotted lanternfly, um, it's, it's a lot of, you know, what Brian showed earlier, it's a lot of this kind of um, either genuine curiosity or trying to figure out what you're supposed to do to kind of help with the situation. Um, and, and then sometimes that, you know, that can mean desperate measures like people using propane torches. Now, I know I just cited a propane torch that could maybe be used in vineyards, um, but having the general public put fire to trees and um, the lantern fly is not necessarily where we want to go with that. Um, we also have people using vacuums, which, you know, is, is a fine um, thing to use, I suppose, if you want to rig up that vacuum, but people kind of using whatever they have in their homes. Um, and then this, this quote from somebody who uh, fell off a ladder because they were trying to uh, scrape egg masses of lanternfly. Um, so control can be anything, right? There's a, there's a lot of things out there, um, including some of those homemade kitchen sink type things. Um, so air freshener, dish, dish soap, human urine, particularly aged human urine, um, or just doing, you know, kind of a 20 acre sweep of uh, bifenthrin, which is something that, that may be worth thinking about doing for control around rail lines, control in, in, in high uh, risk areas like ports. But I don't know that we necessarily want the public to be engaged with pesticides on that um, significant of a level. So it's something we really need to think about in terms of our messaging. Um, so going back to the poll EV um, tool, we'll kind of go through some, some factor fictions. Um, now, uh, this was crashing um, my computer earlier, so I had to delete quite a bit of them. But I'm just going to go through some of these. So if some of you want to, um, again, answer, and we'll kind of see what's happening there. Um, so it looks like, uh, so again, dish soap kills lanternfly, whether or not that's true. Um, and there could, this, this poll, polling technique is interesting because we could see some influence from other people. Um, and so what we actually know is that yes, dish soap does kill lanternfly. Um, so it is technically a fact, but there's a caveat here. Um, Dish soap is, is basically a smothering agent, right? And so it can kill some other insects, particularly those that might be more soft bodied. And it works in the same way that insecticidal soap or neem oil do. So it's again, that smothering agent. Um, but the problem is, is that one, it's not reliable. It doesn't do a very good job at it. You have to get really good coverage. And then of course, uh, it's not a registered insecticide. So you have people who get frustrated that dish soap doesn't work that well, and so they add in some bleach or they add in some gasoline and get kind of creative. Um, or, and then the last thing is that dish soap can also um, injure plants. And so you can have that leaf burn on your plants that you're trying to protect. And then of course they might blame that damage later on um, on uh, lanternfly. So that's certainly something that we're, we're focused on too. Um, so the next one, uh, lanternfly can only fly short distances. This is fun. I don't know if you guys are having fun, but I'm enjoying this. Um, 
So this, um, and again, there, there might be some comments here. It's a little bit of a trick question, but this is fiction. Um, lanternfly, uh, depending on where they are in their adult phase, can fly quite a long distance, particularly when they get up high and they're able to ride the thermals. Um, so we've, we've seen that over and over again. So this whole only flying short distance weak flyers can be true sometimes, but generally speaking, I think when you manage expectations of the public and they see lanternfly soaring up in the sky, that's something we want to be cognizant of. Um, lanternfly feed on pine is the next one. And it's, this isn't some of these you, you might um, you might fight me on and they're not meant to be trick questions. Generally speaking, lanternfly are not going to be feeding on pine. So they might taste it. And so that's that's where some of you might um, uh, kind of um, correct me there. So they might stick their their mouth parts in it, but it's not a host for them. And over and over again in media articles and other fact sheets, I see people saying pine is a host for them and it is it is not a good host for them. They're not going to stick around and feed on that. They may lay eggs on it, however, so it's the one caveat that I will add into that. So um, unfortunately, I had more, and I, I think it's fun, but I had to stop just because it was crashing my PowerPoint. Um, but some of the other common myths, again, so lanternfly feed on, feed on pine, that's false. Um, kill all trees they feed on. Brian and some others yesterday talked about that. Um, they don't, in fact, do that. They're a tree stressor, so, um, you know, again, we, we can kind of um, reduce that fear fire a little bit. Um, the other thing I'm seeing recently uh, that folks are including in some of their fact sheets is that honeydew is more damaging than feeding. I'm not sure where that particular one came from, but in some cases that might be true, but as a rule of thumb, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that that's a true statement. Um, uncovered egg masses are already hatched. That is also not true. So uncovered egg masses can just be uncovered because the female maybe ran out of material or got distracted or, or kind of scared away. Um, but they, they can still survive winter. Um, lanternfly only fly short distances, covered that one. And then some people say, oh, there's no insecticides that kill lanternfly because they see such a problem and they kind of assume that nothing works against it. Um, again, with that egg mass thing, I just thought I'd throw in some pictures of that variation in both color and covering. Um, so they do still have that um, kind of uh, covering over top of them intact and they will likely survive winter though we have seen reduced survival with that that covering. And then lastly, there's some things that we just don't know yet. And so we don't really have the answer. So our lanternfly toxic to pets when ingested. Generally speaking, we have a good rule of thumb for this saying, you know, there's no, nothing that says um, or nothing that really points us to a clear direction of uh, lanternfly being toxic when ingested. And we get lots of reports of dogs and cats eating them all the time. Um, but we also have a few anecdotal reports of some dogs and cats vomiting or having sort of a reaction. Now, I think um, if your cat or dog ate large amounts of anything outside, particularly dead bugs, um, you know, maybe discourage them from doing that, but we don't have a really solid answer for that one. Um, lanternfly can swim. I've gotten numerous reports and actually some really convincing video um, that lanternfly can indeed swim. Whether or not that's going to influence much, I don't know, but we've gotten some questions about that. Um, is removing Tree of Heaven going to push uh, lanternfly to other hosts, or are you maybe best, uh, better off leaving it? We don't know the answer to that one um, in terms of managing damage. And then is multiple years of feeding going to push trees past their breaking point? So that's another, um, you know, answer we just don't have at this point. We need that long-term data set. Um, so my summary, and this is really the same summary that I'm going to give later, and I, and I should note that in the communication session, I'm going to be talking about a lot of the uh, materials and fact sheets and, and infographics that we've created to kind of address some of this from our perspective. Um, but, but my summary here is that lanternfly is not a straightforward pest, and we have lots of new information, and that makes things complicated. Um, and so the things that I think we've sort of learned are to keep those paths of communication open with other institutions um, and universities and cooperators and your own people to understand what those misconceptions might be and, and sort of where their understanding is. Um, avoid putting logs in the fear fire. That one hopefully is obvious by now. Um, and then the public is thirsty for knowledge and the media also wants to report on this because of this, this human involvement factor. So you really have to think about how you're, how you're curating that message. 
And of course, we don't know yet is an okay answer for the public. Um, you know, hopefully we're able to continue um, bolstering that with information we do have, but giving an answer to something we don't entirely know yet is, is generally not a good idea. And I think that's something that we've, we've learned in our time. Um, so again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit more later in the communication session about um, our own materials and how we're combating this, but really that's all I have. Um, and I think it's, it's lunchtime unless there's questions. Hi, Heather. Thanks again for that <clears throat> great talk. Um, always interested in anything you have to present or say because you give uh, it perspective to all things SLF. We did have a few questions. Um, is anyone researching water quality and availability of trees, crops, and density of SLF populations to include groundwater movement? I'm not really sure what that question means in terms of um, water availability. Are they talking about insecticide or? Let's just interpret that they mean insecticide and groundwater. And is okay. it moving away from uh, sites that were heavily treated for SLF? Um, I'm gonna actually defer that one. If, if Brian is um, at his computer, Brian, are you wanting to address that one? Sorry, I was answering emails from my presentation. I'm sorry, what was the question? Yeah, it's about um, insecticide and um, groundwater contamination. Okay, generally so speaking. generally speaking, um, imidacloprid generally gets bound up in the organic material readily, but the uh, dinotephron and its degradates are extremely water mobile. And so it's a concern where you have shallow water tables and you have um, uh, sandy water, uh, sandy soils that it can move through re uh, readily. And so uh, from that aspect, uh, people that are on wells in more remote areas, it's a concern. I, do, I am not aware of anybody testing for it yet from multiple seasons of application. Brian, while you're on, um, I, I think you and Heather, um, Heather addressed this a little bit, but maybe you're, you can give your perspective. So what's the general view? Is removing tree heaven going to push SLF to other hosts? That was one of the um, un unknowns about SLF. Um, do you have, do either one of you wanna have a personal, uh, give your personal thoughts on that? Go ahead, Heather. Go ahead, Heather. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Um, he does this all the time. Um, no, I think, um, I don't know, that's tough to say. I think lanternfly are going to feed on your hosts kind of regardless of whether or not you have Tree of Heaven. Tree of Heaven might serve as a hot spot, particularly in the beginning years of an infestation, but time and time again, we see um, that after maybe two years of them being in an area, they start to feed less on Tree of Heaven in the area and seem to depend more on the surrounding hosts and the environment. So. I, I think that there's enough reason to remove Tree of Heaven because it's a noxious weed itself, but I, I don't know that I would necessarily say it's going to make pressure worse on other trees, but Brian will probably disagree with me. I don't know. Um, no, actually, um, so where if you were on yesterday and you saw uh, Rick Roush talking about the Norristown project uh, with Bavaria, uh, we we went back there this year and, and uh, he and I, and we were walking through looking for a replication. And what we found was that most of the Alanthus were so far damaged that there was very few adults uh, feeding on, um, on the trees, but they were all over the walnuts that were in those same fence rows. So, you know, I think if you, just because you've taken out the Alanthus doesn't mean that you're not gonna have lanternflies. Uh, as Heather said, there's really good reasons to take out Alanthus. It's a you know, noxious invasive plant, but it's not going to really impact. I think it's just going to disperse them out into other trees um, based on what we're seeing. Uh, the lanternflies seem to take out the Alanthus pretty well on their own uh, with multiple years of feeding. So maybe not to death, they, they will sprout up and, and send out epicormic shoots and everything. But um, yeah, they, if, the, if the plants don't have the nutrients, then they move on. All right, <clears throat> see if I can find a short one in here. Have human health issues reactions come up 
to any tree of heaven removal operations or even to spot at lanternfly, I'll expand the question a little bit. I, I'll let Brian take the tree of heaven one um, if, you, if you want to. I, I'm not aware of anything related directly to lanternfly. You do get some people saying that they're having a rash reaction to the honeydew that they're excreting. I've never been able to validate that. I think that's um, probably not true, but it's not something that we've looked at. And then Brian, if you want to take the tree of heaven. Yeah, uh, so tree heaven has the compound allophone in it. Um, it is a noxious uh, chemical. Um, the LD50 on it is is fairly toxic. Uh, when people, some people report burning it and having an allergic reaction like they would with poison ivy, um, there's not a great amount of literature that I've been able to find that documents it, uh, except for the fact that some people have a reaction to it and other people don't. Um, so I would say, be careful with it, you know, advise against burning it. And, um, you know, from to that end, I'm not aware of anybody being uh, hurt from purposeful tree of heaven removal based to, uh, on lanternfly. All right. Well, very good. It's um, 12 o'clock. There are a few questions, not very many, open in the Q&A. So if uh, Heather, if you and Brian would like to maybe tackle those, uh, that would be good. Um, <clears throat> if not, we will adjourn for lunch and return with communications after lunch. And Heather's been doing a great job uh, publicizing uh, the communications portion. I think um, also before we close out, I did want to mention that New Jersey said that they would be happy to share any of their outreach materials um, too. And so you can contact the New Jersey Department of Ag if you're interested. And Virginia, um, even though we're, we have some, we don't have the, the, nearly, uh, the nearly the extensive uh, outreach uh, that Pennsylvania has. So uh, we would be happy to share ours too, even though it's not nearly as complete or extensive as Pennsylvania or even the USDA website. So with that, we'd like to conclude. Thank you all our speakers today. It's been a wonderful session and um, I hope everybody learned a lot. And thanks to you all for sharing your knowledge and, for, and your opinions, because sometimes those are as important as uh, trying to give guidance as anything else. So thank you all and um, see you back here at one Eastern Standard Time. Right, thank you, Tina. Okay, we still have a couple of more minutes before we will start at, <clears throat> at one o'clock. I uh, just want to remind some of uh, the folks who may be joining us for the first time. I uh, do appreciate that you have joined us. Um, as we are going through the presentations, you will see at the bottom of your screen Q&A. That is where we are taking questions from the audience. So please utilize that for any questions that you have for our presenters. Um, as we have time, we do go back to that Q&A and answer those questions um, <clears throat> uh, while we are presenting. However, we do answer all questions, so please put them in there. We are recording this session, and it will be posted as a webinar, and you will be sent that information as it is available. Um, we had a wonderful session this morning, and want to thank all of our presenters there. Uh, Heather, Brian, uh, Brian again, uh, Brian Eschner from um, <clears throat> Cornell, and Ethan from New York. Um, Tina did a great job facilitating for us. And then um, Heather did a, a wonderful job. And of course, Lori uh, giving us some information on how they have been working with the lumber industry. Uh, so really appreciate all the information that was shared from our speakers this morning. And just want to double check, Jillian, you and Heather are both on and ready to go? Yes. Great. Haven't heard Heather yet though. I'm oh, sorry, I'm, I'm here too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there she is. Thanks, Heather. I'm ready to launch some polls when, whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, for those of you who may not know, Jillian 
Stevenson is the um, communications coordinator for Spotted Lanternfly um, for Penn State University. Uh, she and I have worked together for a few years now, and I just have to say she has um, done a wonderful job with all the information. Uh, she makes sure that everything is current. She works very closely with Heather on messaging as well as with the department and with USDA. So Jillian, very glad uh, to have you on the team. And I am now going to turn this over to you um, and Heather and look forward to the information that you have. Thanks, Jillian. Thanks, Dana. Appreciate it so much. Um, it's been great working with the team at both PDA and USDA. So thank you for that. Um, Heather, you want to start with our poll there? Yeah, sure. So um, uh, basically, we're going to get started with um, sort of a session of tell us about you. And um, the reason that we wanted to kind of start off this way um, was was just to get a feeling of um, what you were looking for as part of this session. And maybe you're just here to listen, but um, we wanted to get a sense again of what you want so we can kind of cater to you wherever possible. Um, so Brian, if you want to go ahead and launch the poll as we go through this, um, this will be a Zoom poll, so it should show up right on your screen and just go ahead and answer and, and click submit. Um, and then Brian is able to see how many people are, are basically um, uh, filling in. So once the, those levels kind of um, top off, we'll um, finalize the poll and then see the results at the end. Just to note that presenters, if you're tagged as a presenter, you're not able to take part in the polls in, in uh, uh, Zoom. I might have enabled that, but I don't know. We could give it a try. <laughs> we still have our, our numbers increasing, so we'll wait to end the poll in just a few seconds here. Um, Brian, it seemed to take for me. It allowed me to submit my answer. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, Nancy's right. It's the default setting, but everybody's in on this one. And I, I promise there's no trick questions in this, in this poll, so <laughs> <laughs> don't get anxiety from taking it. All right, we're going to close that out and show you this one. All right, um, so hopefully uh, all of you can see that. So it looks like we're dealing with a lot of government, mostly state and federal government, and then some university folks, um, but then also a smattering of, of other folks. So that'll be interesting to see how you guys answer these, these next couple of questions, actually. Um, so the next one is, do you have background in communications and or marketing? Um, so any formal training you've had or work experience? And again, the, the reason that we're kind of getting at this question is to understand um, some of the metrics that Jillian will present um, about our marketing um, and, and help you kind of understand that and walk you through that. Or maybe you're all pros already and you, you don't need that. So it just helps guide um, what sort of information we can give you. Numbers are still increasing on this one. <clears throat> give a couple more seconds. All right. Okay, so there's a lot of um, seemingly inexperienced people or some people with some experience. So um, good to know, and we, we sort of had a feeling it would be that way as well. Um, and then similar question, do you have a background in extension? So um, this helps me with, um, again, the same sort of things, including any formal training, whether or not you're an extension educator um, or work in extension. Um, so go ahead and answer that. All right. Okay, not at all. Again, I think this is a lot of government folks um, uh, pulling this, but I know some of you actually, you know, do spend a fair amount of time talking to the public. So I'm sure you have some experience. Um, and then um, fourth question, there's six questions. Why are you here? And that's not meant to be aggressive, just trying to again, get a sense of what you're trying to get out of today's uh, session. And uh, on this one, I should note that you can select uh, multiple answers. Oh, 
Oh, actually, I'm sorry, I don't have it set up so that you could um, get multiple answers. I apologize for that. So this is their top answer you're going to see right here. All right. I think people wanted to go with D. Yeah, <laughs> that is what I answered, you know, just can't get enough. Um, so, okay, so that's great. So it looks like most of you are looking at education and awareness um, uh, through those marketing tools. So I think you'll really enjoy Jillian's presentation. Um, next question, second to last question, what is your budget for Lanternfly Communications, including education and marketing? This one too, we might not have uh, multiple answers available. <clears throat> It looks like we have a little bit of diversity um, there as well, but the majority are saying what budget. Um, so again, good to know in terms of um, whether or not it's helpful for us to kind of supply you with some materials as well. So thank you for sticking through with this. We have one more question is just what is your top priority? So this is one where we just want you to pick one answer um, of what you're looking to do uh, while you're here and what you're looking to do with uh, communications. Okay, and again, we, we sort of expected this, but oh, I think a lot of you are joining from other states that have either low populations or don't yet have it. Um, so probably a lot of that is gonna be just um, improving awareness. So anyway, thank you again for doing that. That really helps us kind of um, direct, you know, where we're gonna take this session. Um, so that's all we have uh, uh, for right now for that polling session. Um, so um, I want to introduce uh, Jay up next from the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, and he's going to be talking um, about the uh, call center and how they've started to utilize um, some of the data from that call center and, and reporting information. So Jay? Cool. Well, thank you very much, Heather. Um, so yeah. Uh, I'm with the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. Um, I handle or I work on our spot of fly survey, uh, our data management and analysis and uh, work with communications as well. Um, as Heather noted this morning, <clears throat> a lot of our roles and groups and projects all overlap. Um, so much of my talk today is going to straddle the line between communications and the technology we use to gather data. So often when we think about communications, we focus on the message we're putting out to the public and less so on how the public can communicate with us. In the early days of Spotted Lanternfly in Pennsylvania, the only way for the public to interact was either by calling us on the phone, visiting us or uh, visiting at our office, or getting hold of someone whose work email and sharing it with their friends. So even when Spotted Lanternfly was limited to just one county in Pennsylvania, if you look at the map on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, those areas highlighted in yellow and orange, that was our quarantine in 2014 and 2015. Um, just those small areas is way more than we can handle uh, with, you know, a small group of people. So today, as you can see on the very colorful map on the right, spot of lantern fly has spread well beyond that single county and has taken up residence in 26 counties in Pennsylvania and an additional 15 in our neighboring states. One benefit to implementing some means of collecting data from the public is keeping your phone from ringing and lines forming outside your door. But I want you to consider these positives as well. Um, in seven years, with PDA staff, we've collected 115,000 survey points, but in two and a half years, we've added an additional 197,000 survey points just from the public. Getting the public involved in looking and reporting spotted lanternfly means we can find new populations quicker and in more places than surveying alone. For instance, while we had surveyors looking around the Pittsburgh area, the original discovery occurred because a member of the public found and reported lanternfly to us first. 
more data, particularly in such large quantities, also helps to aid our understanding of spotted lanternfly on a long-term scale. Because the reports are date and time stamped, we know pretty much to the minute when hatch occurs or an egg mass is laid, and on a statewide scale that we could never match with survey teams alone. That bonus data helps us hone in on places where spotted lanternfly might be in groups and laying lots of egg masses, whether that means we're destroying them or collecting them for research purposes. We're also partnering with researchers to build this data into their forecasting models, and we can't wait to see what the results will tell us in the future. So our focus at PDA had to shift from control, but without losing the ability to gain insight from the public, and the reporting tool gave us the time to do so. On the screen is a capture from our reports dashboard from just a few days ago, showing the total number of reports since July 2019 in both quarantine and non-quarantine counties across PA. Um, a couple of notes, and I'm going to do this with a few of our maps just so uh, we can be clear about it. Um, so you just heard me say we had 197,000 reports, but this slide only shows 172,790. Um, in 2018, we launched our first generation of the reporting tool, and we had about 25,000 reports in there. Um, and then in July 2019, we launched our second uh, generation. Um, secondly, the red dots on the map do not indicate positive finds. They just help us to differentiate between reports outside the quarantine and those from inside the quarantine. So the public is very happy to make reports. We've had more than 90,000 in 2019 and nearly 83,000 in 2020. We expect those numbers to stay high as the past spreads and the public interest continues. I want to spend some time discussing both what we put into the tool and what we've gotten out of it and how something like this can benefit your programs as well. My goal here isn't to sell you on building your own fancy GIS data capturing system, but rather to share with you what we've done and why, and so you can avoid some of the hurdles we've had to leap over since 2014. There are a lot of ways to capture data, and I really like the direction that New York took uh, with theirs um, that Ethan was showing uh, just about two hours ago. And I want to highlight some other options you can do like that in the second part of the presentation. So I want to start here and just talk a little bit about what the reporting tool is um, and how we capture data at different points during that. So when you first go to make a report about spot of lantern fly, you land on our Penn State, Penn State Extension website. Um, the tool itself was built in house by PDA, but we partnered with Penn State for multiple reasons. So landing on the Penn State site is very critical for two reasons. First, it provides the public a chance to confirm their identification of spot of lanternfly, as the site shows pictures, gives monthly time frames of what stage the insects are in, and provides a detailed description of each life stage. Secondly, uh, there's the blue buttons underneath the description. Um, when those are clicked, they're tracked so that we know we, we can track what the public believes they saw. Uh, the form, which I'll show you here in a minute, does provide an opportunity to tell us what the life stage is, but that field is optional and, gives op and has multiple life stage presence. Uh, this tells us you know, exactly what they saw. Um, finally, at the very bottom, there's an option for none of these images match, and it will direct them back to the Spot of Lanternfly website at Penn State um, so they can learn more about the insect and hopefully eliminate false reports. Once any of the blue buttons has been selected, the reporting tool opens. Um, anyone who has seen spotted lanternfly in Pennsylvania can report whether they live in PA or just passing through. Capturing the location of where spotted lanternfly was found can be accomplished in a couple of different ways. Um, you can use the Find Me button, which is here, um, to capture your the GPS from your phone or your computer. Um, you can also use the search bar to type in where you're at. Um, or you can zoom in and click on the map and define the, the place that way. Once location is entered, the program will ask you to confirm the address or gives you the option to fine tune. So you could select this or you could close it. You can see the map is zoomed in on the address. Um, you can close this here and, and fine tune it and say it wasn't here. It was over in this part of the map. Um, so <clears throat> this is important because in locations like parks or other wide open spaces, um, that address might point to a trailhead or a parking area, whereas you might want to say that you found it on a trail somewhere else. Once the location is confirmed, the reporting form appears. Um, some of these lines are required, some are optional, but they're all designed to get the most important information while keeping the form as simple as we can make it. Um, so the name and phone number are both required, um, so we can reach out to you and get more information. Email is an optional. Uh, though we do get a lot of those, and, and that's a great way to, to communicate with folks. 
Uh, the address where the bug was, was cited is pre-filled based on your previous entry. That was a mistake we learned on from the first generation. We had the, you actually had to enter the address three different times um, in order for it to be collected. So we, we made that as simple as possible. Um, and then we get into the meat of our reporting tools. So what host type did you find it on? How many insects did you see? And what life stages were present? I wanna talk for a minute about how many insects you saw. So we locked that to three digits or a maximum 999 in order to keep the numbers of spotted lanternfly in the realm of possibility. Um, admittedly, there will be places where a billion might be an accurate statement, but for the purpose of research, we wanted to make that, that number limited. Um, we also allow additional comments to be entered uh, to help narrow down the location as well as what type of property it was witnessed on so we can plan for contacting the appropriate person if the survey is required. And finally, um, whereas New York offered the ability to load up to five pictures, we only allow one. Um, and here are just a couple examples. So they don't always get it right. Um, sometimes in the top left-hand corner, you can see this is a leopard moth. Over here on the right of the screen is some scale on a tree. Uh, but allowing photos to be uploaded helps us in two ways. First, our field staff can use the photos to determine if spotted lanternfly was actually on site before they schedule a visit. And secondly, we can share these images with researchers for training algorithms uh, to identify spotted lanternfly against other insect types. One other thing we do, I'll back up for a second, you'll notice here at the top of the reporting tool data is, or the reporting tool form, um, it gives you some information about where you are. So we wrote three different um, three different sections to go on top of that based on whether you're inside the quarantine or outside the quarantine, um, and we separated it. So the outside and the inside both notate that you may be contacted verify, to verify your sighting, uh, whereas if you're inside the quarantine, what that means is that you're, you're not going to get contacted. Um, the locations that are inside the quarantine that we would follow up are places that we just added. So in 2020, we added eight new counties. 12 new counties, sorry. Um, so those locations is where we would go uh, to, to still continue to visit, just to make sure they know what they're looking for and find if there are larger populations than what we already know about. Um, sorry, I lost my place. So to briefly talk numbers, because spotted lanternfly is fairly unique looking uh, for North America, in areas where people are familiar with it, their reports are more than 90% accurate. So you can see that's the original, what we call the original 14 county quarantine, um, that orange area on the map. The further you get away from that initial infestation and you get into counties that were just added, um, that number drops down to about 30 to 50% accuracy. And once you're in a county where spotted lanternfly has not yet been found, uh, it drops to about 10%. Um, so that may sound like a low percentage, but it's important to note that many people in non quarantine areas and even some in quarantine areas still have no idea what spotted lantern fly is. And as easy as it is to dismiss all reports from outside the quarantine is obviously wrong. Um, for those nine reports that misidentified box elder bug as spotted lantern fly, the 10th reporter might have gotten it right. And without a means to report what they found, we might not have discovered a new population in time to do anything about it. Again, the first person who saw a spotted lantern fly in Allegheny County, just outside of Pittsburgh, uh, was a person from the general public, not a PDA surveyor. Um, how long might that population have gone unnoticed if we hadn't received the report to follow up on? So how does it work? How do we decide which reports to follow up on and how do we track that? So this is another of our internal dashboards that's on your screen. Um, this one highlighting the reports we've followed up on versus those we have not. Um, these are reports from 2020, um, not, not both 2019 and 2020. Um, and you can see the vast majority of the reports are here in that traditional 14 county quarantine. Um, they're highlighted, those reports are highlighted as orange. Any new report that comes in, that's how we identify it uh, to, to make it as visible as possible. Um, but we focus the majority of our time on these reports that fall on the outside areas. Um, these other colors are how we broke up our state. So regions one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, you can't see because it's you know, buried under the quarantine. Um, our goal is to follow up with every report that comes in from these new areas, um, whether that's via email or phone or physically visit the site um, to determine if spy lantern fly is there. So really quick, I just wanna explain what some of these mean. Uh, like I said, orange is a new report. Um, 
the blue report, there's a lot of them up in here, are attempted contact, meaning we left a message or sent an email. Um, if we can confirm a report over the phone uh, by email or picture that it is not spotted lantern fly, we mark those reportings in green as closed false sighting. Um, and this, this is down here that kind of explains that as well. Um, if the reporter doesn't respond back to us within 10 business days, we mark the report as report is closed, not reachable, and highlight it purple. And finally, red dots are marked requires a visit. Um, so again, red does not mean positive. Um, but simply that we, uh, we we marked it as requires visit because we felt we needed, based on the information we received, we needed to visit the site. So in 2020, we followed up on 990 sites um, to do visuals. And of those 990, only 384 were true positives. And the majority of those fell with inside the quarantine area. Um, so we utilize a whole suite of other applications for when you actually visit a location. Um, I should note all of this is built in, uh, in the Esri products, so whether it's ArcGIS, Collector, Survey123, Workforce, we utilize the whole gamut of those. Um, I'm not going to go into that. I'm going to try and stick more to the communication side. If you're interested in learning more about what we do, please feel free to reach out. Now. I'd be happy to talk to you about um, all, all that fun stuff. Let's get back around to how this benefits the public and how to have this communicate, how they have this communication with us. And more importantly, what steps can you take today to get you on the path to implement some portions of this? So what does the public get out of this? And what do we get out of it? So for starters, we get the public buy, uh, which in our line of business is incredibly difficult. Unlike most other invasive insects, spotted lantern fly poses significant hindrances to the daily life of regular people. Um, as you've heard today in heavily infested zones, you can't sit under a tree to watch a baseball game or retreat to, the, retreat to your backyard for some peace and quiet because spotted lantern fly is everywhere, crawling over everything, dripping honeydew from the trees on, on them, their patio furniture, their cars, their pets, and everything. Uh, because of this, people will seek an outlet to let someone know about it. Uh, it could be that they post about it on Facebook or Twitter, uh, but many of them will want you to do something about it. Implementation implementing a means of collecting their reports makes them feel like they're contributing the solution, which keeps them engaged and exciting, and hopefully limits the time you and your staff spend answering phones and rather lets you focus on finding a trolling lantern fly. No, we cannot respond to all 197 reports they've generated, um, which is why we built messaging into the reporting tool to let them know that. But the ones that we can reach out to understand the huge task we've taken on. And the simple fact of the matter is we're reaching more people today now than we ever did. Um, in the span of those two and a half years since we launched the reporting tool, uh, we've increased our public out outreach by 2,400%. So in, as you can see, in 2018, we had 132 follows up, follow up. Um, in 2020, with the help of USDA, uh, we were able to reach 3,886 people. Uh, what's an additional benefit is that we can visit these reports and share that information. And because reports are handled by our field teams, who are already out in the world doing surveys and checking traps, they can schedule their visits to coincide with their pre-established routes. Um, and for those of you who have done survey eight hours a day on end, you can get pretty bored talking to dead bugs in a trap. So it's often a nice break to do some outreach, even in the time of COVID-19. Um, so I'm hopeful that you can see some of the benefits of, of why setting up a, a way to collect reports will work in, both in your favor and for the public. Um, but obviously building a fancy online tool takes time and resources you might not have. So here are some suggestions I think that you can do, you can take starting today or this week uh, to, get you, to get you going or maybe to, to help you fill out some of your reporters, your reporting tools. Um, many of these solutions already exist within your IT departments and it can be as simple as setting up a dedicated email address or phone line specifically for spot and fly reporting. Um, neither of these take very long and you can easily partner with your communications or operations teams to get that message out. The caution I do want to share on those options is that you can't control what information you're going to receive. Chances are very good for every report you get. You'll get five telling you a story about uh, their uncle's homemade flamethrower, but they won't mention anything of actual use to your program. A better way might be to work with your IT departments to develop a form that can live on your website that puts specific requirements on what information you want. Um, again, this is very similar to what New York just was showing us and is not difficult to use. 
Um, there's a lot of different ways you can do it, whether it's in Adobe, Microsoft Forms, or using ArcGIS or Go123. The things that I would suggest collect, collecting that are absolute, if you absolutely need to get these, are reporter's name, a phone number, email address where they can be reliably reached, when and where the sighting occurred, and how many insects they saw. When we make our phone calls or emails to the reporters to determine whether or not we actually need to go visit, we ask them to describe the insect in as much detail as possible. Um, that way, because our teams are familiar with what the bug looks like, they can, they can quickly say, yeah, that's not lanternfly, thank you for your report, keep looking, and direct them back to the to our communication side of things with the Penn State website um, to get them to understand better what to look for. Um, one further step and one we benefited greatly from is partnering with the university to staff a call center. So Heather's gonna come back on here in a moment to discuss this in further detail, but my quick highlight is to say that Penn State staff and students do a great job of answering questions about spotted lanternfly, and they also put input information for us from the caller into the reporting tool so that we can follow up when and where necessary. Um, this also solves a second potential issue where someone might be hesitant or unable to go online to fill out the form. So, after listening through some of the great presentations during the Spot Lanternfly Fly 101 and through the first two days of the summit, I know many of you are already on a great way or on your way to building ways to gather this information. I hope some of the items I covered today will help improve upon that. And if I can be of assistance, please feel free to reach out. And with that, I will turn it back over to Heather. Actually, to me, um, this is Jillian. Oh, sorry, Jillian. Um, that's okay. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. Really appreciate it. I um, do see that there are a few questions here, and we have a few minutes. So I'll pick a couple of these, and, and maybe you'll have time to get through those yet here. So one question is, why did you choose to set up a new reporting system instead of using the existing EDMAPs? So uh, the main reason is, is we had a RTIS administrator um, in-house, um, somebody who was very familiar with it, um, and myself and the other gentleman that helped to, uh, who originally wanted to design this, we really didn't have a good way of doing it. Um, so we went to him and this was the model that he suggested. Um, okay. Probably the most honest answer I can give you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now here's another one. Does anyone have an easily accessible database or mapping system for citizen scientists for monitoring and or collecting spotted lanternfly from detection and non-detection zones? Is that something you can? Um, that's not something I can answer simply because I don't know. Um, I don't, Heather, have you run into that at all? Not really, but I, I um, unfortunately, Trisha is on the other side of this, but tomorrow, Trisha Bethke will be talking in the stakeholder session about um, a reporting system she's made, and I don't really know the details of it, but um, perhaps she might answer some of those questions in terms of a um, easily accessible uh, database. Okay, great, great. Um, and then there is another one on here, and I'm not sure if this is for you, Jay, either. Um, has anyone used canopy traps or have they worked for catching spotted lanternfly? Um, I mean, I can speak to, at least from a PDA point, um, and no, we have not successfully used canopy traps at this point. Um, we did just this year partner with USDA and uh, really, um, as you saw the information about the circle traps, we really went full into that this year and we've had a lot of good uh, success with that. but. Um, if, I'm not sure by canopy traps, are you are you looking specifically at like panel traps, or was there another another type that you're talking about? That's the specifics I have in that question. So if yeah, then um, responding or sending that has a response, yeah. I can type that in. Um, there is another question, a little longer one. We have just about a minute here. The Endangered Spe Species Act prohibits taking of endangered species on both federal and private lands, which includes harass, harm, pursue, hunt, shoot, wound, and the like. Um, there are multiple endangered species in areas that spotted lanternfly can and does infest. How are landowners aware of these challenges and how their control actions may impact species known to exist in their area? Classic example, control activities and bog turtles. Not sure if that's an answer for you as well or a question for you, but there you go. <laughs> well, 
uh, again, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the treatment side of things. And as far at least as what we do, um, we, you know, we are very careful. We do work with USDA in confirming where, uh, where we can spray uh, when we do treatment. Um, and we are very cognizant of waterways in particular. So, um, you know, we have, we have certain thresholds so that we're not applicating, a, I think it's within 15 or 25 feet of any, any known waterway. Um, you know, to, to prohibit whether it's fish or turtles or any other potential kill off as far as that. Um, as far as how we get that out to the public, um, I don't know, that's definitely something as a communication team maybe we need to look into. Um, I don't, I don't, I can't recall that we've, at least from a PDA standpoint, I don't recall us talking about it. So. Okay, great. Great. Thanks, Jay. And, um, certainly. And with that, what I'll do is now hand it over to Heather, who will talk on the, the call center that Jay just mentioned. Um, and Heather, uh, for those of you just joining us, um, as a reminder, is our Spotted Lanternfly Outreach Coordinator here at Penn State. Heather? Thanks, Jillian. Um, yeah, so sorry for, I hope, um... You know, I'm, <laughs> you're not completely exhausted of me yet. I'm, I'm almost done for the day. Um, so, so yeah, as Julian and Jay mentioned, I'm going to talk about the call center and sort of um, how we have that organized, how we train folks, um, and and some of the metrics that we get from that. Um, so you can see how, you know, Jay kind of showed those um, maps and um, metrics as well. But we get a lot of calls, and so it's been interesting to um, kind of move through a path in terms of how to handle all of that. Um, so in terms of what the call center actually looks like, um, we had a story from the Smithsonian Magazine uh, a couple of months ago, and they actually did interview folks at the call center and, and photograph some of the call center folks, which I know was really exciting for them. Um, so there are, you know, the, the real people behind, um, behind the um, images and all that and the calls. Uh, so in terms of how um, the call center is structured, um, there's there's myself and then the communications team that works directly with the call center manager. Now the call center manager is um, there year long, so the call center is active right now. If you want to call in and report lantern flyer, ask questions about it, um, and so that's what kind of keeps it going throughout the season. And then during the busy season, we typically start um, adding on employees in May, and then especially really load employees heavily. Um, in July, um, August, and September, and, and also through October. So we can have anywhere from, I would say, three to 10 um, either part-time or full-time employees uh, that kind of assist with that call center. Um, now, our call center manager, he's been with us um, uh, really since uh, the call center opened, so we've been really fortunate to retain him. Um, and our operators are also um, have been retained, and many of them are students who actually like to come back and continue to, to work at the call center. So they, generally speaking, I think have a pretty positive experience with the call center, even though I've I've um, answered some of those calls and they can be a little stressful sometimes. And then the call center manager will also work directly with our IT um, and then also um, marketing and digital education, particularly in response to any questions that they might be getting about how to go through and take a permit or get the permit um, uh, for businesses. And then the other part of this that isn't so much the call center, but is also our extension offices. So they certainly field a fair number of calls as well, particularly the garden hotline. So in addition to um, you know, working directly with the call center manager, we also work to train and make sure that people in the extension offices and master gardeners are up to date. Jillian, I saw you on mute, do you? Nope, I'm good. Okay, all right. <laughs> just want to check. Um, okay, so looking at the trends of um, how many calls we get, um, I'll show you the last uh, three years or almost three years, really two complete years of the total calls per week throughout the season. Um, so again, we really start seeing calls. We, we started the call center um, in the beginning of May in 2019 in kind of a, a big way. Um, and we get to see this kind of phenology. And when we look at 2020, um, we see the same sort of thing. This again has year long data because that's the first year we had it uh, left open year long. In the winter, we really don't get much, um, much action at the call center. This little blip in March is 
right when um, the quarantine zone expanded. So we had an increased call volume at that point. Um, and then we did see a little bit earlier calls and a little bit more severe. We think most likely that's coming from, again, that Philadelphia region um, for people experiencing lantern flight for the first time. And then 2021 so far is tracking very close to 2020 in terms of what it looks like in the winter months. So just a few people calling here and there um, for egg mass scraping information and, and maybe to report as well. Um, so in terms of um, reporting online versus reporting from the call center, the majority of reports, and I think Jay shared this as well, come, uh, come from the online uh, reporting system, um, but the call center does field a fair number of reports as well. And so it's, I think, really nice for people who don't have access um, to that online reporting center or just don't feel comfortable with it or able to talk to a person on the other side. Um, you can also look at different stats like the average talk time. Um, so I thought this was interesting pulling these stats um, recently. Um, 2019, we spent a lot more time on the phone talking to folks. Um, my guess is that the shift and reduction in time down from a seven minute average to a four minute average is more so about how trained our uh, call center operators are and how familiar they are with the topic area in terms of explaining it. Um, and in total, we've had um, uh, just over 70, 76,000, or excuse me, 7,600 minutes um, talking about Lanternfly at the call center, um, which is about 140 days of talk time. So quite a bit of uh, talk time as well. And um, every time I see these stats, I, I think of the calls are coming from inside the house. So the total number of calls, um, and really it should say quarantine zone, of course, um, as Jay uh, presented, almost all of our calls are coming from inside the quarantine zone rather than outside of the quarantine zone. Um, so in terms of why are they calling, um, a lot of them are reporting lanternfly. Um, so the, the data that Jay just shared, trying to report how many they're seeing, what life stage, and um, you know, generally speaking, we still ask people to report, particularly if they're on the outside edge of that quarantine zone, so we can still glean information about lanternfly. Um, they also might be calling to troubleshoot registering for the Lanternfly permit course um, to find out about the basics of Lanternfly. We see a lot of people calling just to say, I heard about this bug, tell me about what it is. Um, oftentimes we'll get someone who's asking, okay, I would like someone to come treat my property, please. I have them here and, and come take care of it. Um, and then also to share observations about Lanternfly and that ranges the whole spectrum as you would imagine it does, like bleach kills them, birds are eating them in their backyard uh, and the like. It's also providing them a way to interact with people and ask questions. So will lanternfly kill my trees? What should I spray to kill them? That's a huge question that we get. Um, should I get my tree treated from a professional company? And, and can you recommend a company to me? What is the government doing to stop them? Is there financial support? And my cat just ate one, is he gonna die? Um, so certainly we get a lot of questions and trying to interact with folks. Um, and so that means that, you know, we have to take all of those questions in that the call center is getting and of course our extension offices and make sure folks are trained to uh, know the answers for that. So in terms of how we train, um, we do annual webinars and regular meetings. So our annual webinars um, usually occur in March. So uh, our, our next webinar, or this year's webinar is coming up soon. Um, and then we also have um, every other week meetings just to talk about updates with Lanternfly, what's new with marketing materials, what Jillian's working on, uh, and some of the research updates as well. Um, for the items that we haven't yet put into a fact sheet, but they're maybe new. So a good example that I pulled out here was in 2020 when the quarantine zone expanded, we sent out talking points college-wide, but particularly for our call center employees to be able to handle some of those questions. So you might also see media and reporters calling the call center to get new information. And so it's really helpful for them to have this kind of list of talking points to address some of those concerns. And then we also have frequently asked questions. So again, those are fielded from the call center manager directly to me. And I put those either online or in the separate uh, document that we share so that those operators are able to answer those questions and um, hopefully in, in a timely way. Um, so that's all I have for the call center. I don't know if there's any questions uh, related to that, Jillian? Nope, um, you have no questions. Okay. And since we're, we're just running a minute behind or ahead of time, um, if you wanna go ahead and introduce the next speaker, that'd be great. Oh, I'm sorry, that would be me. I introduced the next speaker. How are you? <laughs> All right. Well, um, thanks, Heather, for that. And um, if there are other questions, you can always, um, we have some time at the end of our session for more questions. 
if you think of any questions. Um, our next speaker is Joanne Allen. And Joanne is the branch chief for the Fairfax County, Virginia Forest Pest Management Branch. And she's going to talk to us about outreach and education efforts for spotted lanternfly in Virginia. So with that, Joanne, if you wanna go ahead and start. Yeah, sure. Um, hi, everybody. Um, so I work for, I'm an urban forester with uh, Fairfax County Urban Forest Management Division. So those who aren't familiar with the geography of Virginia, uh, Fairfax County is in the DC metro area. My county is pretty suburban, urban, uh, and has a very mixed demographic, um, but a lot of folks that work in government and government contracting. Um, there's about you know, over a million residents in that county. So there's, there's a lot of people and a lot of um, interface with potential pests like spotted lanternfly. So um, we've been working a lot with uh, our state agencies and uh, surrounding municipalities to try to educate the public on spotted lanternfly. Um, thankfully, in my county, we don't have spotted lanternfly yet, but we're on the lookout for it just because of its potential impact uh, to our residents. Um, and I've been uh, working with for Fairfax County in, in, in my capacity for a number of years now. And I can say uh, that of all the pests that I've helped uh, do education and management for SLF certainly is one that has garnered a lot of attention. And so there, I, I feel that there's been more uh, collaboration and partnership because of just the wide uh, effects that this pest can have on, you know, in urban, suburban, and also uh, rural areas. Try to advance my slide here. There we go. So just a very short explanation or background of spotted lanternfly in Virginia. So um, in 2018, it was found in Frederick County in a industrial area. And uh, PDAX, the Virginia Department of Agriculture, um, in partnership with the USDA, um, started monitoring and treating for uh, spotted lanternfly. And um, since then, it spread to uh, neighboring counties. Um, and in order to have a successful management of the pests, uh, outreach and education was essential. So um, Virginia Cooperative Extension is certainly pivotal in a lot of those efforts uh, to educate the public about this new pest, what to expect, um, especially when you're trying to reach so many landowners on doing a, doing a treatment program having an educated community is essential for those type of efforts to be successful. So in creating this presentation, these are just some of the uh, state, federal agencies that, you know, um, and also uh, municipalities and other nonprofits or citizen science organizations that I, I can think of off the top of my head that have been working together and collaboratively with the with the education of spotted lanternfly in Virginia, and so um, and this isn't too surprising. These organizations we normally interact anyway for for other for other concerns, but um, I feel that this has been like a, an even greater effort across the board, just because of the wide impacts that um, SLF has. Um, so why bother working collaboratively with neighbors? Um, so when, when you're pooling your resources and whether that be money or labor or, or anything like that, um, or just products, you know, you, 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 it's better to do that in a group rather than individually. And so it, it also helps build networks so that uh, information is shared faster and in, in, in a better ways. Um, you also learn from each other. And so that, that's also very important when you build those networks, you're able to rely on others that may not be working directly with you to 
that could be beneficial for, for future projects as well. And there's also some innovation. And so um, you may have organizations that have different sets of skills and, and strengths. And so when you pull together your resources, resources and work together, then you're able to better use everyone else's skills in your, in your effort. So for today's presentation, I'll just be giving examples of the partnering and the collaborative work that we've been doing in Virginia. Um, so first, um, I'd like to give a shout out to Virginia Cooperative Extension. They've been pivotal in the, in the education of, of uh, Spotted Lanternfly. Um, in the lower left-hand corner of your screen, you'll see uh, a screenshot of a presentation given by Mark Suffin. He's a, the extension agent in uh, Frederick County, which is where Spotted Lantern Fly was first found in Virginia. And he's been this one of the spokespeople for Spotted Lantern Fly, giving interviews to media, uh, creating social media content, um, <clears throat> leading meetings and education trainings, and and really just spreading the word as best as possible. And so uh, Virginia Cooperative Extension has created a lot of content, whether it be digital or through publications and videos and trainings on Spotted Link and Fly to try to spread the word amongst the, the community. Um, I just wanted to give you just an example of a video that the, <clears throat> the Northern Shenandoah Valley uh, extension, the, their Facebook uh, page. And so throughout the year, um, they're constantly uh, sharing content with the public regarding SLF, you know, either giving them a heads up about, oh, you know, they're the nymph stage, or they're, the nymphs are about to hatch in the eggs, you'll be seeing these nymphs, or oh, the adults are laying eggs, or, or whatever. Um, they're offering a lot of content to try to keep the awareness of spotted lantern fly uh, constant throughout the year so that it's not, uh, it's not forgotten. And also they created the, the, the quarantine permit training so that businesses and industry can learn about spotted lantern fly, but, but also, um, uh, but also educate you know industry so that they follow the quarantine so we don't make a bigger mess of uh, spider lens and flying Virginia. Um, and here's just an example of sharing resources here. So we have the the Virginia uh, best management practices for uh, spider lens and fly. And if you look at the bottom, we ripped it off from. Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. So thank you, Penn State, for helping us with our, with our public mission. Um, here's another example of just sharing of resources. So here is a postcard that uh, my office has developed. Um, we haven't sent them out yet, but our, our plan is to send these out to um, industry in, within Fairfax County to make them aware of spotted lantern fly since Unfortunately, with spotted lantern fly, you can find it on any sort of material. And so our, our goal is to mail these postcards to various businesses found in Fairfax County just for, for awareness. And we were able to take this, uh, that content from a Loudoun County uh, extension office who created something similar for one of their publications. Um, I wanted to give a shout out to another extension agent, uh, Adria Bordis. So she's the Northern Virginia spokesperson for uh, Spotted Lantern Fly. So on the left hand side, you'll see her in a Spotted Lantern Fly uh, costume that actually my office provided to her. Um, someone else in the county somehow got a hold of the Spotted Lantern Fly costume, and no one in my office was gregarious enough to be seen in public with it. So uh, she was happy to take it and she basically has worn it to every public event that was appropriate to wear a spotted lantern fly uh, outfit. So she's there, she's with the, 
the head of extension in Virginia, and she's also basically just any time, any opportunity where you can mention spotted lantern fly, she'll do it. She'll reach out to industry within Fairfax County and talk to folks that are running stone yards or or uh, or those in the plant industry. Um, and she also helped coordinate a partnership between the Fairfax County Extension, my office, and the Virginia Department of Forestry. And we've created um, various training opportunities, both in person and, and virtually, to try to educate um, as many people as we can within Northern Virginia about spotted lynx and fly. So here's just one of the examples of. Uh, of uh, training that we held this past summer. That was our, our my office's first webinar, actually. Um, before COVID, we didn't really have access to Zoom accounts. So we had to do most everything in person if it was a training. So this is our very first training that uh, we did with uh, Mark Suffin, Adrian Bordis, and staff in my office. We also held um, other trainings with uh, master naturalists, master gardeners, uh, folks in the plant industry. And we've also trained uh, county staff that are out in the field, not necessarily anything re related to pest issues. They may be checking uh, storm drains or mosquito traps or anything else that would that leads their work to be outside. We've also trained them to be on the lookout for this pest since they're already out in areas where we may discover it. So um, another really great uh, a program that Virginia Cooperative Ext Extension uh, led um, is a banding program that has uh, led to, to monitoring being done across the state. So in 2018, once uh, spotted fly was discovered in Virginia, um, Eric Day and other, uh, other extension agents um, led an effort to try to have, lead a volunteer program for banding. And so they held trainings, multiple trainings, uh, trained folks on how to band, what to look for, um, was able to show what spotted lantern fly looked like in, in the areas where it was found. Um, and to date, they, I'll show you in the next slide, um, you can see because of their efforts, they were able to, to, to have uh, bands across the, state, across the state, mostly in the northern area of, this, of Virginia. But it, it's increased the capacity for, for monitoring within the state. And so um, they've also had to um, pivot and, and uh, have their, their trainings done virtually this year. Uh, sorry, in 2020 due to, due to COVID, but because of this training, they were able to train not only master gardeners and other citizen scientists, but also uh, professionals like myself on the banding program, um, either by just teaching us how to do it ourselves or uh, leading a group of volunteers to, to do that. So municipalities like Ar uh, Arlington County or City of Alexandria also had uh, banding programs in the past through this training. Um, Fairfax County had its own volunteer program um, of just trying to identify where Tree of Heaven was. So we didn't, we knew, we knew uh, Tree of Heaven was, was in the county. We just weren't sure, sure where it was. And so um, before we started our monitor, in conjunction with our monitoring program, we wanted to expand our knowledge of where um, Tree of Heaven was in the county uh, so that we could have kind of get ahead of uh, any sort of treatment program we would have if, if it were found in Fairfax. And so we trained volunteers to find Tree of Heaven and report it through Ed Maps or through the Maiden app. And so from that, we were able to find over 150 uh, tree of heaven um, in the county just through volunteer reports. So um, I think I'm running a bit early, but uh, some of the lessons, I guess, 
the I've I've tried to glean from um, while doing this presentation. Um, through my experience over the years, I've noticed kind of the differences in public reaction and and the various pests that have been introduced in Virginia or in the area. And it certainly makes a difference when your pest is very charismatic. So when it's very showy and pretty and catches people's attention, um, that has certainly helped with um, gaining people's interest in spotted lanternfly. And it's it doesn't have as good of a publicist as murder hornets, but um, we, it has been a little bit easier to get people's attention about uh, spotted lanternfly. Um, and the impacts of COVID have have also been difficult because we haven't had um, the opportunity to, to attend community events and uh, school programs or other opportunities to um, to educate the public. But we certainly have enhanced our virtual platforms, and so that enables us to be able to record trainings like this one and post them on YouTube, and then have a much greater reach for, um, for educating um, and use, utilizing those, uh, those uh, platforms. And um, the, the last thing I'll, I guess I'll mention is um, one thing that I have uh, noticed with the partnerships that I've, I've created my office with, with other folks and, and efforts like um, Spot and Lantern Fly um, outreach programming is that when you have other organizations involved and they they keep you accountable so you can't when when other organizations are counting on you for 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 uh for helping lead programs like this you can't leave it you're gonna have you're gonna get emails you're gonna get reminders about you know staying on task or what's the next thing what's the next idea how about this and so it it helped. It certainly helps in keeping the effort going, and not leaving it behind. So that is my presentation. And I apologize if I if I uh, ended a little early. No, that's okay. Thanks so much, Jan. That was great. It was really nice to see. Um, I think Virginia in particular, you guys are really good at collaborating with other organizations and kind of coming up coming together as a team. So. That's great. Um, there wasn't a question. There was just one comment about um, the costume and um, that if somebody wants the pattern or the information on how to make it, you can check out the um, Q&A session or area and there's a um, email there for you to contact. So I know we have a couple of patterns that Master Gardeners have made uh, costumes too. So <laughs> those are always a big hit. So thank you so much. Yeah, and, and thank you, Adria, for putting that on. <laughs> All right, um, so our next talk is going to be um, from Whitney Swink. She's with uh, the North Carolina Department of Ag and Consumer Services, and she will be giving um, perspective about outreach in a state that doesn't yet have lantern fly. Thank you, Heather. I was trying to get my mute unmuted. Hopefully everyone can hear me now, um, and hopefully everyone can see my slides. So yes, uh, I am going to talk today about outreach lessons that we have learned in North Carolina as a state that doesn't yet have spotted lanternfly. Hopefully uh, when I'm done talking today, you'll have an idea of maybe some things not to do, mistakes not to make based on mistakes that we've made in North Carolina, and just things that we're kind of learning as we go. Um, I included this picture on my title slide. I'm not going to talk about it yet. I wanted y'all to just see it, keep it in your mind. I'm going to come back to it at the end of the talk. Um, is one of my kind of more fun and unique stories through this adventure that is Spotted Lanternfly. So uh, today what I'm going to do, first I'm going to talk about the messaging. Um, you know, I feel like the message can vary between a state that doesn't have it yet versus a state that does have reproducing populations. Um, I'm going to talk about various outreach methods. We have a ton of material. We've been very fortunate to actually have a decent outreach budget in North Carolina. And originally it was just for general invasive pests, uh, invasive forest pests, but with spotted lanternfly on the horizon, we decided it was really important to focus a lot of our attention on getting the word out early so that hopefully people will be aware of it if and when it does get here uh, and report it to us rapidly. So I'm gonna go over some different things we've had. 
uh, specifically things that we had put out in, you know, into the the ether of the media and what we've learned, you know, mistakes that were made on those, um, some word changes, things like that. And then I'm going to kind of end up with talking about some various reports from the public. Uh, we've had multiple, you know, false reports. All of us have been there. But we've also had some that have been spotted lantrify, dead adults, but each one of them has their own story uh, associated with it. So uh, let's start with a message. Uh, any of you who were at the Spotted Lanternfly 101 last week saw this lovely, lovely graphic on the left, the Stomp It Out message. I believe this one was produced by New Jersey. It might've been Delaware or maybe they're sharing it, but multiple states are using this message and it is fantastic. We really like it. However, we decided in North Carolina that maybe having people kill it before reporting it to us or even getting us a specimen wasn't the best idea. We want to get kind of on the forefront of it and make sure that uh, there is something for us to see when we get there, if we get a, a real report. So we decided to modify the message and we went with see it, snap it, report it. And specifically try to keep it very simple. You look at it with your eyes, take a photo with your camera, and then report it to us via email. Or you can phone call, but we found that email right now is probably our best method. Um, and so far, I think this is working for us in North Carolina. And I'll show a couple of examples of what this message is on uh, throughout this talk. So mostly we started off with banners, um, very simplistic, you know, photo of the insect, have you seen the spotted lantern fly, see it, snap it, report it. And then we included the QR code, just like Brian mentioned in his talk earlier today. Um, a lot of people don't realize that you don't need an app to scan a QR code. Most modern day phones, if you just put your turn on your camera, um, and scan a QR code, it'll take you straight to a website. And that's really nice that no one has to have an extra app, things like that. And then uh, as uh, other people like Jay specifically mentioned in his talk, having a dedicated reporting line. So what we did is we've made our own email address, badbug at ncagr.gov. And that way, you know, our emails, our work emails aren't getting clogged up with spotted land fire reports, especially when it gets further down when it actually is here in North Carolina. Uh, so it's our own separate reporting tool specifically for reporting spotted lantern fly. So we started off with these fantastic uh, sail banners, which you see here on the right side of the screen. They're large, they're 14 feet tall. We didn't produce a lot of them. I think we did nine in total. And our goal was to actually have them at our state fairgrounds. So I know the state fair in each state tends to operate at different times of years. Ours is in October. And what we decided to do was have these uh, big banners up at all of the main entrances and thoroughfares at our state fairgrounds, which in, in theory was a great idea, but in practice proved to be a lot more challenging than we anticipated. So one recommendation I have is when you're developing very large um, transportable outreach materials, make sure that you have a good way to stand them up. So you can see here, we actually worked with our support operations. These baskets are filled with cement to hold it down but it was very windy and most of our banners did not stay up. So it was incredibly frustrating to have created something that I was pretty proud of visually. But once the fair happened, a lot of them were either falling over, leaning against something. Uh, the wind was pushing the, the sail in so you couldn't even read it. So, you know, preparing things like this, try and make sure that you do a lot of testing before they go out and make sure that they actually, you know, hold up, uh, you know, in the field, so to speak. So kind of in response to that, we still have those banners. We do still plan to use them. Of course, we didn't have the fair last year with COVID, but we have shifted to these smaller banners. They're only about seven feet tall and they're on these great pop-up stands. And these have been so much easier to work with. And the message is the same, you know, the, the image is the exact same, but a lot, a lot easier to work with. Also a lot lighter to carry because there's no cement baskets involved. But what we've done is we've produced these and they're now, um, up at the main offices for every or almost every cooperative extension office throughout North Carolina. So when you walk in, it's one of the first things you see. And our goal here is really just to get the message out, make sure people are thinking about it and aware of it. You know, if they see something that's that charismatic, they know, ooh, I might need to tell someone that I've seen this. So shifting from big banners, we've also been using our see it, snapper report it messages on uh, magazine advertisements. And we have two different ones that I'm gonna show you today. So this first one that you see here is a much smaller, it's about a third to a quarter of a page um, in size. And it's again, very simple. Have you seen the spotted lantern fly? See it, snap it, report it. 
However, <laughs> upon this magazine advertisement going out, and when I say magazine advertisement, there's publications. We have some statewide ones that we do and some that are local or regional uh, that we do, but they've been really effective. So feedback from this one, I got a couple of phone calls of people that actually thought that we were looking for an endangered species. And when I first heard this, I was like, what endangered species? It never would have crossed my mind that that's what people would get from this image. But when I looked at it again, I thought, huh, other than the email, which is you know at the bottom and very small, at no point does this ad that I've created say bad bug or invasive species. So with that in mind, I did do slight modification with the next time we ran the ad. And I made two very simple changes to this smaller ad. The first is I just added a line, bad bug alert. Bad bug alert. Uh, short and simple, but hopefully to make people realize, no, this is not an endangered species. We wish it was endangered. Um, and then the other thing, I also was getting comments from people that genuinely thought they were looking for a butterfly or moth. And again, I realized, okay, using that image, the gorgeous spread wing image, it's very eye-catching and it does draw people's attention. But for those that aren't entomologists, aren't as familiar with these bugs, they may really not realize that, no, that's not actually a butterfly, it's a plant hopper. So we shifted to using, you know, the classic, just the wings held behind the back, the more plant hopper like image to hopefully reduce some of that confusion. Uh, so there you go. One of the second ads, this is a full page ad and we run this one a lot more commonly and partly just because I like that it includes a lot more information. And so with this one, similar to our smaller ad, it, you know, have you seen it? It has our message, but it also just gives a little more information about the pest, highlighting things like invasive plant hopper, feeds on tree of heaven, grapes hops, shows all the life stages, includes size references, things like that. But again, once this ad, once we started running it, I was getting some feedback and realized, okay, once again, we need to kind of reduce some of the confusion that people are getting when seeing this ad. So as with the smaller ad, I've added now the bad bug alert message to the top. I decided to remove the spread wing image, which I kind of have mixed feelings about because with all the talks we've had over the last couple of days and with SLF 101 last week, I do think maybe the spread wing image has some merit for being included because they do fly more than I think I realized, especially with today's talks. Um, I was really appreciative that Heather said that actually they do fly much further distances than I ever realized. So that was good information to learn. Um, another kind of change we made is, again, I really wanted to highlight it's a bad insect. So changing the color, a really basic change, but hopefully to draw more attention to it's an invasive, it's a hitchhiker, two key things with this pest. And then a much smaller change, but I realize help with clarification. If you compare the two sentences, this is the original ad on the left and our new ad on the right. It used to say spotted lanternfly has not yet been found in North Carolina, but we need you to be on the lookout. Well, I realized that's not true. We have found it. We found it multiple times. So I decided to make it more clarifying to add the word alive. We have not yet found it alive in North Carolina. So hopefully that will reduce, you know, more confusion down the road, um, especially, you know, occasionally we get phone calls, people genuinely thinking it's there. They look at the Cornell map and they see those dots and they don't understand the distinction. Um, so hopefully reducing confusion. In addition to magazine ads and banners, uh, we also have these fantastic posters. These are 12 by 18 inch posters. Uh, the left, this one here and the middle one, we have up again at every single cooperative extension office in the state, so that's 100 offices. We also have them up at every forestry um, office throughout the state. I think there's 100 of those. I'm not sure if there's one in every single county, but every single office received one of these. And so just general information again, what is the pest? Have you seen it? Life stages. And then the center one here, can you identify tree of heaven? You know, so many of us are used to seeing it. It's everywhere, but a lot of people just, it's so ubiquitous, they almost ignore it. It's like, you know, so much in your vision, you don't even pay attention anymore. And a lot of people also just don't realize what it is. And you're driving on the highway, you see it everywhere in North Carolina. But most people, when I ask them, do you know what tree of heaven is? They don't know. They think it's mimosa or something entirely different. So we decided this graphic would really help, you know, get people looking for Tree of Heaven, aware of Tree of Heaven and just what it is in the state. So those two have been pretty successful. But this third one here, my rest area poster, this one uh, has had a few issues that kind of have come up over time. And I've been really rethinking whether this is even worth using. So the rest area poster, we worked with the North Carolina Department of Transportation and actually we're able to get these posted in every single rest area and welcome center in our, in our state, which I was really excited about. 
And I'd been warned in advance, like, oh, people are crazy. People rip things down. They flush them in the toilets. You're not going to have any success. But months after they were put up, I actually, you know, when I was traveling for work and stop at a rest center, I was seeing them. And it made me really happy to see, no, in fact, people are leaving them be. I saw multiple people walk up to them, read them, thought, okay, this is great. It's working. But one thing that I've really been considering, and hopefully our Q&A, we can maybe discuss this, little this afternoon, is the decision to include the map. So as many of you know, as we've talked about a lot today, spotted the lanternfly is spreading and it's not staying in one location. And so the map kind of gets quickly out of date. In fact, I went made the decision to include all the maps that I've, I've at least saved on my computer since the start of this. So the first one is dated December, 2018. This is how it looked originally. And these are all the iterations in this one down here in the far right corner is our current one to date. Obviously, it doesn't make sense to keep reproducing this poster and reprinting it and having them distributed every time the map changes. That's, that's not fiscally responsible. It doesn't make sense for the paper. It just is, doesn't make sense. But I wanted people when stopping at rest areas to know where the pest was, say, oh, I've just been camping in Pennsylvania. Let me see if that county, oh, that county's lit up. And so I'm trying to figure out how to improve this, this graphic, this poster, to have it still be useful to travelers but not necessarily include information that gets out of date very rapidly. So I have a few ideas for that. We're gonna play around with it this year. I'm thinking maybe removing the map and listing locations, but have a disclaimer of, for the most up to date information, please visit such and such website. Uh, and a little side story with this poster. Uh, I did get a phone call one afternoon, this was probably a year and a half ago, from a very, very irate person who saw the poster and essentially thought we were accusing them of moving spotted lantern fly. And I was a little confused because it's just a poster, it's, it, you know, what, whatever. But they genuinely thought like this was an absolute accusation and how dare we accuse them. And so I had to kind of talk them off the ledge and say, no, no, this is just outreach. We're just trying to inform people. But you just never know, be prepared, especially, you know, for those of you that are like North Carolina and don't have this yet, people get really touchy about this kind of stuff. and. You, you might get calls that you don't expect to get. I mean, I've had so many over the years and um, not to get off topic with the murder hornet was a great example. I'm glad that Joanne mentioned that because uh, it's just interesting what people can get really worked up about um, and just being prepared, you know, expect these kind of phone calls to catch you off guard and you take a deep breath and just really listen and, and stick to the point. I also liked Jay's idea of the talking points. Talking points are so, so useful to have in front of you when you're answering these phone calls and emails and whatnot. So this kind of leads me to reports from the public. Um, I have a couple of different stories I'm gonna share with you and each one has to do with our various reports that we've received. But the first one is um, the, the concept of controlling the information. So I work for Department of Ag, I'm a regulatory entomologist. And for us, we're very concerned with just regulating the insect, regulating the spread of this insect. But you know, extension is more focused on outreach and education and such important things. But sharing that message, trying to make sure the message um, doesn't get out of control, especially on the early side, we think is really important. So uh, our very, very first report was October 2019. And it was a business person in Asheville who found a dead spotted lanternfly um, on a pallet. He had ordered materials for his business that happened to ship from the Pennsylvania quarantine. And thankfully he saw it, he thought it was weird. He reported it to us. We were able to follow up with him, super nice guy. Um, but when we got there and we're talking to him, uh, we asked him, did you post this to social media? And he said, yes, he had, I think it was Facebook. And we just, at the time decided, you know what, this is way too early in, um, for North Carolina. We don't think it's here yet. We weren't prepared for there to be kind of a social media burst about an insect that didn't actually have living populations. So at the time we decided to ask him to take it down and he was really polite about it, really nice about it. But we just decided right now for an early state like us, it's not worth creating a panic where there isn't actually anything to panic about yet. So just kind of thinking about that, you know, making sure that the people aren't taking a message and running with it that isn't exactly what you're trying to put out there for your agency. It's really important. Um, the second kind of thing I want to talk about is paying attention to a variety of reporting tools. So, you know, for us in North Carolina, I mentioned we have the bad bug email. We also have our phone number available. And so people are using that, calling us, what have you. We also have an online reporting tool where people can, like Jay showed, you know, type in the information and it gets to us. But something that I hadn't considered, because I don't do a lot of social media, I don't do a lot of these other kind of internet database sites, 
is that people are reporting via EDMAPS, via iNaturalist. And last October, it might have been November, we um, received an email, I think it was actually someone with New York IPM Center who let us know, hey, did you see that a spotted lanternfly has been reported on iNaturalist in North Carolina? No, we hadn't. Um, and so I looked into it and sure enough, one had been found in Western North Carolina, gorgeous, gorgeous photo, you'll see it in a couple of minutes. And I realized, oh, I need to figure out how to contact this person. I didn't have an iNaturalist account, I made one. And then I went to contact them and they're like, oh, your account's too new. You can't, you can't, we can't give this information out. But lo and behold, the whole chain of events, I was able to talk to the person and we all squared it away. But the point being, there could be reports for your state out there that if you're not looking at these sites, you may just not know about unless someone lets you know. So keep an eye on those things. You know, there could be reports, uh, you know, on EDMAPS. I know a ton of people are reporting spotted lanternfly and other, you know, with, with population states on EDMAPS. So something to keep an eye on and think about. Don't just rely on your own reporting tools that you've developed because people, they're going to report in all various different ways. Securing the specimens. Now this won't really matter for the states that already have this. I know y'all are well beyond the point of needing to collect the specimens either for, you know, future outreach purposes or for sending to the feds. But us being early, we're trying to at least on the front end, get the specimens when we can and then send them off to USDA because they know that they're trying to do some DNA analysis and look at populations and confirm whether there's unique populations coming in or if they're all related to the original um, interception in Pennsylvania. So these are our four, uh, four interceptions in North Carolina. And as I said, each one kind of has a unique story. So this first one on the upper right, this is my Asheville guy. And he's the one that uh, posted to social media, super nice. But when we got there and we're talking to him and went to collect the specimen, we found that he had um, encased it in resin because he thought it was a very beautiful insect. And he's not wrong, it is a very beautiful insect. But as you can see here, uh, it's not much that you can do with it once it's been encased with resin. So, uh, you know, just kind of an interesting thing. We did end up sending off the feds anyway, just as a, hey, we did catch it. We do have proof that it was here, but you're not gonna really necessarily be able to do much with it. So just kind of a funny thing, you know, it's not the end of the world at all, um, but certainly not something that we had anticipated. The second report, this is this one in the upper right corner. This was reported to us October of last year. And actually, um, originally there was no photo. It was just an email and someone found it on an airplane. And all we knew was found on an airplane. And we're like, oh my goodness, this is in the passenger cabin and cargo hold, we're not sure. So we contacted the guy like, can you please send us a photo? This is a really big deal. Well, unfortunately he did not get back to us until the day before Thanksgiving. So nearly two months had passed between his original report and getting back to us but he thankfully did include a photo the second time. And sure enough, thankfully it was the cargo hold, very clearly a dead adult. Um, he said he's an airplane mechanic. And so once again, we have no actual specimen. We can't really even track and we know which airport it was, but we don't really have much beyond that. And so just again, being prepared, thinking about, you may not always get all the information you want, even when you know this pest has entered your state. Um, this third one down here, this is my iNaturalist one. And this one is particularly funny. So when I finally did get to talk to the woman who put it on iNaturalist, she was in Florida and it was actually her mother that collected it. Uh, she, her mother was uh, shopping or house hunting uh, and looking at those prefabricated homes, one of those model home sites. And weirdly she found the dead adult on the floor of one of the homes. And her daughter is a bug enthusiast. And so she collected it for her daughter. And when her daughter came to visit, she gave it to her. So by the time I spoke with her daughter, the insect had already been taken to Florida, not even in North Carolina anymore. And, you know, we we're just like, okay, that's fine. You know, it is what it is, but it just kind of shows like how quickly things can happen. And that one, you know, we are trying to trace it. We haven't figured out exactly how it ended up in that home. We have no evidence or signs of a population in that area. But it's a little troubling and um, again, never got our hands on the specimen. I think the feds may have talked to her to get her, their hands on it, but I honestly am not sure. And we got the information that we were able to get. And then this last one, this is our most recent detection. This actually was in December of 2020 and um, someone who used to live in Berks County, Pennsylvania had recently moved to Eastern North Carolina. And so thankfully he knew what it was when he saw it, but this was in his Christmas trees. He found two dead adults and he knew, to, he knew to report it, he did take a photo, but he flushed them down the toilet. <laughs> so once again, we didn't actually get a specimen, uh, which is fine, but 
you know, he was like, oh, well, I've learned from Pennsylvania, they can be gravid, you know, I didn't want eggs to come out. So I was just getting rid of it. I'm like, fair enough, you've, you know, you did the right thing, especially coming from Pennsylvania. But we would have loved to have gotten our hands on it just to actually see another one. Um, so all of these little stories are just to say, expect the unexpected. Um, nothing is going to look like what you think it's going to look like, especially when it comes to these reports. Um, and then track down what you can. But my last story is kind of my big one. So back to this photo at the beginning. So uh, <laughs> this started in August of last year, late August. And this uh, for North Carolina is an intense, tense time because it's our sweet potato season. We trap every acre of sweet potato in North Carolina, which is a lot, about 100,000. And that for me is my crunch time. So I was heavily focused on that program. So Friday afternoon, my phone rings. I didn't have time to answer it. Didn't think another thing about it. A couple of days pass. It's now Sunday. I'm sitting and watching a soccer game with my husband and I get a text from one of my coworkers and she's like, uh, did you see Spotted Lanternfly has been reported on our bad bug email? And I'm like, oh my gosh. So I go and look and this picture's there and I'm thinking, oh no. And then I look at my phone and I realize the missed call was from the same guy who's reporting it. He's actually a professor at NC State. And immediately I shouldn't have done it but I panicked I thought I've missed something big this is terrifying like this the, it's happening it's happening in North Carolina so I get my team we we talk Sunday night we come up with a plan and we decide we're going to drive to the site on Monday morning and take a look and see what we can do about it so while we're driving down I, I get the name of the actual person who found it so it was a friend of the professor and he's not home he says we can visit his property fantastic but he's like, just so you know, I've already poured diesel fuel on the grapevines and I've burned them all. <laughs> so we're like, oh, okay, well, wish you hadn't done that, but fair enough, okay. So we think there's clearly enough in this image, even if he's burned them, we're gonna find something. We'll find, you know, maybe some more fourth and stars, some adults have you know, gone off somewhere. So we get there and we're looking, we see multiple grapevines, we're, you know, searching all of this property, and we're just scratching our heads, you know, maybe at this point, 30, 45 minutes have passed, and we're seeing nothing, no signs of anything, and it's just not like what we've been trained on, what we were fully expecting, and we're like, what is going on, and the same coworker who mentioned the email to me gets the really smart idea to do a Google reverse image search, and at this point, the light bulb goes off, this photo was actually taken by Eric Clifton with Cornell University. I don't know if he took it in Pennsylvania um, or, you know, a, a different state, I'm guessing Pennsylvania, but very much not a North Carolina photo. So at this point, we're like, oh my gosh, did he ever even see Spotted Lander fly at all? And so I call him again. I'm like, hey, I'm really sorry to bother you. Did you take the photo? And he's like, oh, no, no. I just Googled spotted bug and saw this. And I was like, that's what I saw. And I emailed it to y'all. And so we realized, oh, he probably never saw Spotted Lanternfly at all. I'm sure it was a lookalike. And so for us, this is embarrassing, but a solid lesson learned. Do a Google reverse image search if you get a photo of Spotted Lanternfly, just in case. I'm glad that we had the experience of testing our response team, but it was a lot of time wasted, especially in a season when we really couldn't afford to be going off on a wild goose chase. So it's just a cautionary tale. I mean, in hindsight, looking at the photo, absolutely looks like a professional photo from something else. Not so much what a homeowner photo tends to look like, but in that moment, that panic that, oh, it's here, it's finally happening, we have to be ready, those thoughts did not cross our minds. And so uh, I realize it's kind of a, a rapid pace presentation, but I guess my big thing is don't panic and take a deep breath and just think about, you know, things like this before moving forward. And just think about how your message is getting across, you know, to everyone, you know, are you a state that has it? Or are you a state that's about to have, you know, Ohio being on the border of Pennsylvania before their population kind of was discovered? You know, where are you in the process? And that's kind of how your message can change, how your outreach materials can change. And um, yeah, as I said, we have a whole host of other things, but thankfully, we're not having as many issues with our other little outreach items yet, but those were kind of our big ones and figured those were messages worth sharing with you, you all today. So with that, I will take any questions if y'all have any. Thank you so much. Thank you, Whitney. That was awesome. That was, uh, we share a lot of the same lessons learned certainly from, <laughs> from when we were first starting and, and then some. So that's, that's great to <laughs> not be the only one, I guess. 
Um, so we, we do have some questions and, and comments for you. So the first one is asking what publications you used for your ads. Yeah, great question. So um, originally we were running some in Our State Magazine, which is a statewide publication and gets a really major readership. Unfortunately, that one is quite expensive and it doesn't fit into our budget, uh, at least if, as we want to do more outreach as we can. So we're using one called Triangle Gardener, which reaches the Triangle, which if you're familiar with North Carolina is uh, the capital. So Wake County, Chapel Hill, where UNC is, um, Durham County, where Duke University is. So that big area and then some surrounding areas. We're also running one in Western North Carolina magazine, which uh, covers well, all of Western North Carolina. And even though most of the models that we're looking at for spotted lantern blight don't seem to indicate our mountain region being that much at risk in terms of, I'm assuming, host populations, we think we have such a heavy tourism there that that's going to be an area where hitchhikers could come in. And in fact, two of our interceptions were both in Western North Carolina. So we've done those. We've also done one called Carolina Country, which uh, reaches both North Carolina and South Carolina, so slightly wider than we had, you know, really needed, but we figured it doesn't really hurt South Carolina for their citizens to also hear the message, even if some reports might end up, you know, to us, but we haven't gotten any uh, feedback from the Carolina country yet. All right, thank you. Um, and then we have um, a comment about the um, math quandary you found yourself in um, of maybe uh, putting a QR code there that goes to the live map instead of um, uh, oh, listing the map. that's a fantastic so. idea. Oh, I thank you for that suggestion. I like that idea a lot. Um, yeah, yeah, I do too. We we actually um, internally have discussed putting more QR, QR codes on our um, objects and, and marketing materials just because I think more folks are familiar with using them during COVID and restaurants and all that. So, absolutely. yeah. Um, and then uh, there is a comment about trying to get lanternfly specimens to show the public. Um, so Jim O'Connell has answered some of that, and I'm, I can probably help with that too. But do you know um, early on when you started about getting specimens out there to show people? So we, um, I will say we've been fortunate enough, Dana Rhodes invited us up to Pennsylvania twice to kind of see how their operations run. And on one of the visits, we were able to um, get a lot of early instars and a lot of adults. The specimens that we have zero of, we have no um, preserved egg masses and we have no preserved fourth instars. So actually for North Carolina, we don't have good access to that or we haven't, I guess, figured out who to pester enough. And we realize bothering Pennsylvania repeatedly probably isn't the most fair thing to do, even though y'all are <laughs> the ones living and breathing it the most these days. Um, but no, if somebody else has a better idea of how to get their hands on specimens for sharing with the public, I would love to know because I would love to put little Riker mounts together for outreach you know, efforts. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I'm, I'm hesitant to say this with so many people on the call, but <laughs> but I, I do um, feel requests for you know shipping out specimen. Um, we're short on egg masses pretty much all of the time, but we do have a lot of the other life stages. Um, so you can often contact me um, to get more of those life stages. Um, but then also I should uh, mention that Jim O'Connell um, from Cornell University, um, Ulster County has created 3D models. So it's not actual specimens, but it looks like an actual specimen and it's the same um, size and color. So you can check those out. And he posted the link in the Q&A there. Thank you. That's Thank you very much. That's wonderful. Yeah. And then um, I'll give you one more question. Um, do you share posters to social media? So great question. I have to admit, I am really out of touch when it comes to social media. Um, I don't ever use it at all. And so I'm really bad about remembering that that is an incredible tool for outreach. Um, we, I don't think that we have, but that's something that absolutely we could start doing. Um, I'm happy to share our materials with anyone and everyone who wants them. Um, I can, we're gonna, with Jillian Stevenson, she has um, a box site for uploading material, which we plan to contribute to. But yes, submitting our posters or posting our posters to, to uh, Facebook. Um, I don't know if our department has an Instagram account, but I know we have a Facebook and a Twitter account for sure that absolutely we could post those kinds of things too. It's a really good idea. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much again. Um, really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Um, 
Yeah. So um, next up is a break. Um, and then following the break will be um, Jillian Stevenson presenting on some of the marketing and communications tools that we have at Penn State. Um, and then I'll go over some of the fact sheets uh, that we also have at Penn State. So stay tuned and we'll be back at uh, 2.45. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started then. Um, welcome back. And we're glad that um, you're able to join us. For those of you just joining us this afternoon, um, again, my name is Jillian Stevenson and I'm the Associate Director of Communications for the College of Agricultural Sciences at Penn State. So let me go ahead and share my screen here. Okay. And just want to get this up and running. And want to check on my controls here for uh, later on. Okay. So again, welcome. Glad you're here. Um, uh, today, what I want to do is go through what some of the communication and marketing materials we've put together here at Penn State over the years and some of the lessons that we've learned. And there are many, <laughs> as we've all heard throughout um, this afternoon's presentation, a lot of these lessons are the same. Um, and since we can't be together in person uh, for obvious reasons, uh, consider this a virtual giveaway table, if you will. At the end of my presentation, as has been mentioned, I will provide details um, on how you can access a box folder with the design files and most of the marketing materials that I'll be presenting and some of uh, materials from the other presenters as well. I'll also present a variety of options for you, recognizing after we learned this, this um, at the beginning of the session, many of you have a limited budget and maybe some limited marketing experience and some of the things that we have here, you will be able to hopefully take our materials and, um, and, and just rearrange them and rebrand them for your own use. So we've been at this now for about three years. So we've built quite a library of digital assets and printed marketing materials. And this includes, as you see there, media releases, marketing materials, print to advertising, social media and digital ad campaigns, as well as our website and educational materials, which Heather will talk about later in the, um, in the afternoon here after my presentation. So beginning with media releases. At the beginning of each hatch season, we establish a media work plan to promote our public, um, to promote public awareness of the life stages of the spotted lantern fly. This plan includes everything from our news stories to our media pitches and press events that we have planned, along with a calendar for, for implementation. What we've learned along the way is to closely watch our social media and public comments, as has been mentioned uh, throughout the presentations today, for trending issues, um, such as um, spotted lanternfly on Christmas trees, and the fear of them coming inside to folks' homes or the bycatch on the sticky band traps so that we can counter all of those negative messages with accurate and helpful information through news releases and social media posts. In the case of the spotted lanternfly on the Christmas trees and the concerns there, we did work very closely with the Christmas Tree Growers Association in Pennsylvania to create our messaging which we then shared with our partner organizations, that's the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture and USDA, so that we were all communicating a consistent message around this um, particular topic. The media, as you can imagine, never seemed to tire with this pest, especially in the late adult stage when spotted lanternflies are swarming and they're very visible and people are annoyed. So it's good to supply the news cycle with accurate and consistent messaging. So our news releases. Our news releases are distributed widely to the media through our media platform, Meltwater. And we also populate our website, as you'll see here, with all of our news releases in the feed here. Um, regarding the media, one tip um, we want to relay, and you probably are already thinking of this, but it's very important to identify an internal expert along with some backups 
who can speak to the media so that you're communicating again, a very consistent and accurate message. It's important to make sure that your experts are properly trained, of course, and to work um, and trained to work with the media. Because as we know, it can be tricky at times answering questions or um, sometimes they may try to trip you up or um, do, you know, not intentionally, but um, there are ways that you can work around that as, as I'm sure you all know. Um, we actually do have some tips on working with the media that we can also share if you're interested. So moving on to printed materials. A helpful piece that you might want to include in your awareness campaign is this type of general information brochure. And this is a rack card. It's the typical size, the four by nine. And it's a great piece to share with your partner organizations like landscape companies and other businesses so that they can display them on a, a counter or near the checkout counter, for example. And, and um, they're really handy for folks just to pick up. So. What I'm about to say sounds very similar to what you've heard throughout this afternoon. The images, I want to speak to a little bit here. Um, you'll see we have an image of the open wings, the closed wings, and we even have an illustration here. Well, what we've learned too, that the go-to image, especially for designers, because they think this is very beautiful and pretty, in which it is, it's very pretty pest. Um, but it's also good to include these other photos because it is most so important that the general public knows exactly what this pest looks like. Because if you don't, you will get misreporting and as you've heard as well today. So we do suggest if you are using an illustration that you also include, if you have room, other photos, real photos, or you include a website where folks can go to to get actual photos. And we've heard this not only from our educators on the ground teaching folks about the spotted lanternfly, but we've also seen this on social media where there's only been presented an illustration and they want to know exactly what the pest looks like so that they can have a proper identification. So next we have a hand, handy and useful marketing piece. And I know many of you have um, used this exact card. We've, we've shared that with other states. But this is, a, uh, about, this is the size of a credit card. You'll see there three and a half by two. And we've learned in this case to keep it very simple messaging um, because you don't have a lot of space and you don't have, um, uh, but basically you don't have a lot of space, not only for content, but for photos as well. So keep it short and simple and direct folks to the website for more information. We found these are really handy pieces to hand out at events. They're not that expensive and they're easy for people to put in their wallets or in their pockets and to carry around and keep, which is really key. And it does direct folks to the website for more information. And we've handed out tens of thousands of these and um, they're very popular. So another popular piece that we've uh, distributed and created over the years is our weatherproof poster for displaying in public areas such as uh, the top of trailheads in park, in parks or campgrounds or playgrounds, even in turnpike welcome centers. And what we've learned over the years is that to capture the attention of your audience in what is a very competitive and busy communications environment, as we all know these days, they, um, it, the stronger the message, the better. And you'll see there, we did use some pretty strong words like invader and threat and destroy. However, <laughs> as a pest infestation grows in a specific area, as Heather mentioned in, in Philadelphia for us the last few years, we have heard from our educators that we need to be maybe tone it down a bit and have a less alarming message. We've heard stories of people using propane torches or BB guns or power washers or overusing insecticides to kill the pests, which led us to tone down our message a little bit more in the Philly area and surrounding area. And we began with this marketing piece. Now this is a five by seven magnet and it, communi it communicates the do's and don'ts as it relates to the spotted lanternfly. And, and I know Heather has uh, shown this earlier in her presentation as well. So the message here is not to panic that the spotted lanternfly won't bite, sting, or attack your house. And, um, and that's what we had presented on the first bullet there under the don'ts. 
And this piece also addresses other concerns like the overuse of insecticides or the use of home remedies. And another message we promoted on this piece was the use of a raised guard. Um, if you're using a sticky band trap to avoid any bycatch, which was another major issue for us on social media. And we also made this into an eight and a half by 11 poster format. And also we made this into a social media piece, an ad in this case that we put on Facebook as a paid ad, but we also posted it on the college's social media channels. And we are active in Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Now moving on to uh, materials directed at children. This is our kids activity sheet, which was created by the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture and we designed it and we house it and distribute it to, um, to our extension offices, to, to regional PDA offices and regional USDA offices. This type of piece is ideal for your farm shows, your fairs and other public events to help spread the word because the children love to, first of all, the activities on this are fun, but on the re reverse side, it's very educational and they take it home to their families. And again, it helps us to spread the awareness of spotted lanternfly. And of course, this is another popular handout. I did see this on a photo earlier in the presentation. So we know that it's getting good use. We use this at fairs, at our farm show and other public events. And again, it's the same content, uh, concept of of children taking back home to their families. And it's just another way to, to spread the awareness. And these are our wine bags. Now these were offered to Pennsylvania wineries as part of our Spotted Lanternfly Awareness Campaign. In this case, we use the, des the design created by USDA. And those graphics are available for your use as well. And I, I will talk more about that with how you can access those graphics in here in just a Next, we have the coasters that were originally produced by USDA, and we have shown, uh, shared these, and I've seen some other states have these as well. And we did customize this coaster with our own message highlighting our website and our hotline. And these coasters are great because they're inexpensive handouts, and they're great for public events, and, and they help promote awareness of the spotted lantern fly. And I should add that what we've learned over the years is that some wineries don't particularly like this graphic because it looks like the pest is in the wine and in the bottle or crawling out of the bottle so that's not appealing for them but others really like the play on the on words like wine stopper so we do continue to distribute this but we're also looking to to develop new graphics and messaging so that we have options for the wineries so just as we create a media work plan at the beginning of the season, we also create a social media calendar. And I know for some of you working in government, the, the messaging on social media has to go through several layers of approval. Not to say that ours don't go through levels of approval, but um, you might be farther away from that approval process. So it's good to lay that out at once and then present it to your social media team so that they can see exactly what you have planned and what they can share on, on the site if you don't have the access, access to make those, um, those posts directly. So this particular uh, work plan does include paid advertising on Facebook, as well as posting on the college's social channels again, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And again, we do focus on the life stages of the pest and the general awareness of spotted lanternfly for the public. Um, and we intersperse that with other messages like um, pesticide safety or choosing a reputable lawn, lawn care company. We also use the USDA graphics and uh, we create ads from those. You'll see spot the problem, wanted, and here comes trouble. And again, I'll, I'll share these in a minute, minute here in a larger format so you can get a feel for the messaging with these as well. So the social media calendar includes the, the time of year for the posting, and it also includes the graphics and the messaging. And when you share this calendar, not only with your, your social media team within your organization, you and can and we have shared it with our partner organizations like conservation districts and fairs and they're able to take these exact posts and put them right in their um, their social media channels which 
helps us to amplify our messaging, which is a really good thing. The more people helping us, the better, obviously. So here's a post on the last NIMP stage and the messaging affiliated with that. And then the adult stage. And then here's an example of the USDA graphic. And as I mentioned, these graphics are available to all states. Uh, you must keep the hungrypest.com branding, which we have there, as you can see, but you can include your own state specific messaging. And I do have these available in the box folder that was mentioned earlier. And I'll, I'll give you uh, at the end of the presentation, more information on how to access that. So these ads are, actually very popular that when we have them up against our, our own post, these ads get the highest engagement on social media. And I, I'm sure it's because they're so eye-catching and creative as you see there. Um, so here we have another social media post that we put together. And this can also be made into a postcard, a poster and a magnet. And what you wanna try to do is get as much leverage out of your pieces as possible. So that when, if you are putting in, in the funding to get something like this put together, that you get a lot of use out of it. So here you will note that we use both the illustrations and the actual photos, which as I mentioned before, that's something that we learned. It's um, just another way to make the identification of spotted lanternfly easier for the public. Now, not only did we create the static social media ads, but we also created video. And here's an example of a quick 15 second video that we used on social media. The spotted lanternfly is a destructive pest that is also a nuisance to Pennsylvania recreational areas and activities. You are an important ally in the fight to help stop the spread. If you see it, kill it and report it. Visit Penn State Extension online to learn more. So this video ad ran on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And our analytics again, well, analytics overall show that videos are more engaging than a static ad. And this ad did garner more clicks, click throughs to our website than anything else that we did in terms of a static ad. Spotted land. Next, in the interest of time, I want to play just 30 seconds of this two-minute video that gives the basics of Spotted Lanternfly. Might be a good intro piece for you to include on your websites or on social media. We actually have a 30-second clip of this, too, we can share. But this video was de donated to Penn State by illustrator Marie Thresher and is currently on our Spotted Lanternfly website and is a great, as I mentioned, great introduction to spotted lanternfly. Have you heard of the spotted lanternfly? If you live along the East Coast, you probably have. The spotted lanternfly is an invasive species native to certain parts of Asia that feeds on over 70 different plants, especially Ailanthus altissima, otherwise known as the tree of heaven. These unwelcome guests are more than just a nuisance to plants. They pose a substantial threat to Pennsylvania's hardwood exports, apples, peaches, grapes, wine, and beer. Okay, I'm gonna start. According to a Penn State- oh, Move to the next slide. And the, the, this video does end with our own branding there. You'll see our website, but, uh, and, and obviously this is overall geared towards Pennsylvania, but in talking with Marie, she is willing to tailor the video to other states and she will do that for a small fee. And um, if you're interested, you can contact me for her information so that the, I can put you in touch with her directly to work with her. And if you want to view the entire uh, video, you can visit our website for that. So uh, another option for using the USDA graphics is uh, this popper ad. And we put this ad on the Sunday edition of the Philadelphia Inquirer, a couple of, of Sundays in a row. And this was part of our marketing campaign in 2019 in the Philadelphia area. And this also was part of that campaign. And this was created again um, to increase awareness of spotted lanternfly. And we did this in the uh, quarantine, the original quarantine counties in Southeast Pennsylvania. And these were done by Lamar Advertising, which operates across the, U the US. We gave permission for Lamar to use our design to work with other, another state already. So if 
this is something that you might be interested in borrowing and putting your own brand on it, we're welcome to share that with you. And we, um, if you work with Lamar, we can um, provide them with permission for you to use this design. And our analytics did show that our 2019 marketing campaign efforts, which also include radio ads and transit ads, and as I mentioned, billboards and uh, ads in, in the Philly Inquirer, uh, it did increase the traffic to our Spotted Lanternfly website by more than 200% during the same period the year before. So we do know that it's working. And um, I would say another important tip is to be sure to track your analytics to be certain that you're meeting your communication and marketing goals. Another thing we did with, um, with USDA, or, or I'm sorry, for PDA was to promote the the permitting for businesses. And this is an example of a digital ad that we ran on social media. And we also produced a postcard which was sent to businesses with information on how to access our online permit training course. And we also created a 15 second video for social media, which I'll... Don't let the spotted lantern fly stop your business. If your organization moves equipment or goods in or out of the quarantine zone, you must have a permit. Get your free permit by completing an online course from Penn State Extension. All right, so again, we found that this video garnered more engagement and click-throughs to the Spotted Lanternfly permit training site, uh, website. And as a result of this campaign, we tripled our enrollment numbers for the permit training course. So this was a very, su uh, a very successful campaign for us. And finally, for those of you interested in accessing some of the digital assets from today's presentations, both from, from me, um, well, for me and from the other presenters, I did set up a box folder and I've already started sharing these resources with other states. They include PDFs and InDesign files and that you're welcome to use and incorporate your own branding and information. The, um, if you're interested in this, you can contact me directly and, and I can provide you or whoever you want with access to that folder if you have a designer you're working with or a printer that you're working with. And we only ask that anything that you print that you note that it's printed with permission from Penn State Extension or USDA or Fairfax County or whichever resource that you're using and along with it that you include any photo clip credits that are in the pieces. And we'll have more information on, on that inside the box and we will continue to grow the resources that are in the, in the box over the next few months and beyond. So um, with that, I will stop and see if there are any questions. All right, thank you, Jillian. Mm -hmm. um, so there are uh, two questions. The first one um, is about the kids activity sheet and asking about how we distribute that and whether or not um, we put that in schools or can get that into schools. Yes, the way we've been distributing it is through Farm Show and, and, it, and uh, our Ag Progress Days. Now, if, if Dana's on the line, um, or anyone from USDA in Pennsylvania, they can speak to how they're getting them out in the classrooms. Or Heather, if you know if the master gardeners are putting them in um, working with schools. Jillian, it's Dana. <clears throat> uh, we have a spot on our webpage where uh, we will direct uh, educators to, and they are they can get some of this material also. Uh, we have the great uh, resource of the Woodmobile, which travels around to schools. And this is one of the activities that they take with them. So yes, uh, we do get them out as much as we possibly can. Okay, great. This piece is in the, the box folder as well, if folks want to, want to use it and, and uh, redesign it for your own branding. Um, Jillian, there are some requests to type your email address in the chat box um, if you're able to at some point sure. um, so people mm -hmm. can contact you. Um, and then the only other question I see is asking about advertising budget. Um, and I, I guess I can annotate that a little bit by talking about how we decide to allocate money for marketing versus educational materials. So, so you say you're going to answer that or I'm answering it? Oh, just, no, just edit a little bit. <laughs> I 
<laughs> I mean, I don't know if you have a, a, a great answer for it or, or what your thoughts are there, but. So is the question, how should we do it between marketing versus educational? Is that the question or? Uh, it's asking what the advertising budget is. Oh, well, we were very fortunate for the uh, first few years of battling this here in Pennsylvania to receive a grant from USDA. So we did have quite a big budget. We had um, 250,000 the first year and second year. So we did have quite a budget to work with. And, but um, what we're hopeful is that some of the resources that we've been able to create, um, even the videos, um, we're willing to share the raw files that if you have any expertise or any small budget that you can work with a vendor to, to make some of those changes. Um, hopefully what we've created, we can share with the other states. All right, thanks, Jillian. That's all I see for you at the moment. Okay, great. Well, with that then, I'm going to turn it over to Heather for her presentation and um, thank you everyone. Um, so I think um, it's pretty obvious at this point, uh, if you uh, want to be successful with Lantern Fly Communications um, and education, you get yourself a Jillian Stevenson um, and you're, you'll be all set. Um, so she's been awesome in, in all of this. Um, so the next portion I have is kind of a maybe a continuation of the myths and misconceptions um, presentation I gave earlier, if you saw that. Uh, so really just talking about what our education and outreach is and um, many of you know you can go online and look at our materials so I just really want to talk about um, where we got to how we got to where we are today um, some of the problems we see with that and then where we're kind of headed basically so again kind of continuing on this theme of, of lessons learned. Um, so when you look at uh, what resources are out there to help affected stakeholders and the people looking for um, management resources I think probably you've, you've visited our uh, homepage just because we, you know, it's, it's a wealth of information and in particular this, this manage um, kind of icon is where we see the majority of our people, particularly the people within um, the state clicking on to try to find resources. Um, and we lean really heavily on, on several uh, educational pieces or fact sheets. Um, the most important I would say for us has been this management guide for residents, um, which is a fairly lengthy guide. So it goes, it takes you through the biology, the behavior of the insect and different ways you can uh, use insecticides and trapping and egg scraping, et cetera. So it's a lengthy guide um, with, with lots of text. Um, and generally speaking, a lot of our uh, educational pieces kind of have these two, two important points in them. One is that there's no silver bullet um, to manage lanternfly, and there's also no one size fits all. So even if we did have, you know, multiple smaller bullets that work together in, in unison, it doesn't necessarily fit everybody. Um, and that makes the messaging inherently complicated. And I think um, you've probably heard us talk about that ad nauseum today. Um, in terms of how complicated it is and how much research we're also continually taking in um, and trying to incorporate into our guides. So the, the past version of our management for residence guide, this has been updated a couple of times now. Um, it usually gets updated about once a year. Um, and the past version said um, sort of a, a summary of lanternfly, um, that lanternfly is a destructive invasive pest. It's threatening agricultural timber and the ornamental industries and the plants in your backyard. Um, which, you know, we have a lot of a lot of sentences like that or, or some iteration of them, especially um, through the time. And what we've come to realize is that, again, there's this this fine line that you're trying to walk. And so in some cases, when a homeowner who is having experiencing a lot of lanternfly reads that sentence, they might see their backyard full of dead trees or projecting that um, to the future of lanternfly. And then, of course, resort to those those measures I talked about earlier, um, which are just unsafe. And in particular, we have um, growing concern for pesticide usage um, with people responding to lanternfly. So again, lanternfly have to walk that fine line, right? Or our messaging with lanternfly do. So we're trying to keep people engaged. We're trying to keep people caring about lanternfly um, and trying to, you know, protect the ecology, um, agricultural industries, et cetera but we're also not trying to put logs in that fear fire. And this is a really delicate messaging that I also think inherently has to change 
dependent on where your state is. So a lot of this this messaging that I'm that I'm telling you right now might go a little bit unheard until you're kind of starting to develop that that higher and higher population, and you start to see some of these same um, problems that we had. So with these problems that we started to see, for instance, pesticide safety, we started to address them with new fact sheets, trying to basically put that um, put that resource out there. So. Uh, we have a fact sheet specifically for uh, lanternfly management as it relates to pesticide safety. Um, and we also, uh, particularly spearheaded by uh, Emily Swackhammer and Amy, Amy Corman, um, trying to give the public tools to decide what to do because there's no one size fits all, because there's so many different options out there, trying to help walk them through. And so there's these articles online which kind of help walk you through what your options are and what you should most likely do given your scenario. We also have uh, different fact sheets for different control mechanisms and methods. So one example of that is using traps for lanternfly management. Um, and this is you know, really popular among the public. And so you can see that it captures lots of lanternfly. It's very visual and it's also non-chemical. When we first started putting this out, um, we then started to get reports of, of issues with this. Um, and I won't leave this up too long because that's just frankly sad, but, um, but th that started to be a big problem with us, for us is the bycatch we were getting on sticky bands or the public was getting on sticky bands um, and a lot of negative comments because of that. Um, so since then, we've really reworked our messaging on tree traps, particularly coupled with the research that was happening on trap development um, and trying to not only use different traps, but also build uh, your own trap or create wildlife barriers for those sticky bands. So still trying to make it accessible to the public, something that they might be able to go pick up uh, at their la local tractor supply, but again, something that's not going to cause those uh, issues down the road. So if you go onto our website and you click that management button, um, there's, it's kind of divided into two sections. One is resources for residents and the other is resources for industry or agricultural professionals. So if I'm a resident and I'm going onto our website, there's a lot on here, right? Um, so there's you know fact sheets, all sorts of fact sheets that you can go through. There's reference videos and there's, there's full webinars, which are about an hour in length. Um, so you can learn a lot. You can really indulge in lanternfly information that's on here. Um, but at the same time, we recognize that this might make the public seem, you know, a little bit cross-eyed um, and, and just reading through all of this information that's out there. So we've really, uh, in the last probably year or so, and continue to do this, is just really start to streamline our materials and make sure that we're simplifying things, we're not repeating things, and it's a clear and consistent message. And a lot of this was um, you know, first started with our extension offices and what they were dealing with when somebody would walk into an extension office and look for materials, they ended up giving them, you know, a packet of materials. So for one, we've started to change our language. Um, and so instead of saying it's something that's going to threaten the backyard, your backyard, we're talking about whether or not death is likely to happen. So I won't read this to you, but we're talking about whether or not lanternfly, uh, the fact that lanternfly is a plant stressor um, and talking about uh, what infestation levels might do, but that it's not necessarily going to kill all your trees. And then we also are putting in language saying not every tree needs to be treated. Make sure you scout or look for lanternfly before you decide to take any management action, right? Um, so it's all dependent on what's out there and having to actually interact with what's out there rather than just throw your hands up and panic. Um, so coupled with those revised fact sheets and trying to streamline our materials, we're also uh, creating new extension materials for our educators and our master gardeners to give presentations to the public. Um, so this is one of those uh, uh, PowerPoint presentations that we provide to master gardeners uh, and educators to give to the general public. So it includes a lot of basic information about the biology, but also includes lots of information about management as well. Uh, and in terms of the extension statistics, uh, this was a report that was for our latest grant period. Um, so from August uh, to February of this year and talking about how many presentations we've given. And I think um, Whitney mentioned this in terms of how many uh, online presentations we're giving and that we're really able to increase, it, increase our reach with this. So we have um, most of the, the burden, if you will, on presentations is carried by about 10 extension educators or extension um, uh, faculty. Um, and we've given a presentation, given presentations to around 3,600 individuals. So we track this using Qualtrics survey so that we can still have these metrics 
particularly for grant reporting, but also because it's helpful to understand which type of group um, we're representing most. And so we have a fairly decent smattering here of, of groups that we're presenting to and educating. Um, for one, it's the general public is, is of course the dominant um, sector here. Um, and so again, that's where we put in a lot of our, our management guidelines. We are constantly battling um, the things I talked about earlier in my, present, in my earlier presentation um, about the news articles, some of the landscape companies or some of the things on social media and just the general panic. Uh, with businesses, this is a place that uh, we don't give a ton of extension um, talks or educational talks to. And it's a place that frankly, I think we're lacking in. Um, we've continued, the reason I put this video here is because we've continued to see um, emails from particularly hotels and resorts, uh, wedding venues, that are getting um, issues with Lanternfly swarming in um, on whatever it is that their, you know, their hotel or their lodge um, and, and having customer complaints. So I mentioned that during the winery um, talk as well. Uh, we also have that with shipping companies and trying to understand how to keep Lanternfly off of um, you know, your loading dock area. Uh, so this is somewhere where I hope we can continue to increase both our education and extension, because we do have resources available to recommend that. And so Brian and I will be kind of working on how we can help build those resources for, you know, say shipping companies um, or for resorts and hotels without saying it's necessarily okay to spray your building. Because remember, they're not a structural pest, but they could be a significant nuisance and be causing the economic damage. So again, that, that fine line becomes very apparent. Uh, and then with fruit growers, um, we, we have a decent education towards this group, um, though we continue to um, sort of lack for control uh, methods and also lack for action threshold. So even though we have lots of educational materials for them, there's still a lot of research that has to be done there. And then the green industry, um, that was uh, through Brian's talk. Um, and so again, he hit on some of those uh, points. But going back to the general public and talking about those management guides and trying to sort through all of that and make this guide even more um, acceptable to the public with those two considerations in mind of not having a silver bullet treatment and no one size fits all management plan, we've started to create more tools, timelines and steps basically to walk people through that decision. Um, and this is all, a lot of this is based on Emily and Amy's um, earlier work um, where we basically have control options timelines. So what time of the year is it? And that can help guide you with what to do. Um, the steps of management, which is essentially the IPM pyramid. And then of course our decision management tool, um, which is talking about what is the likelihood of impact? So what sort of trees do you have on site? What are you close to? And then how many lantern fly do you have? And that can help you uh, decide which step you take within that IPM framework. Um, another aspect that we're doing is managing expectations. Um, so, you know, we have the scraper card, we have the scrape and smash campaign um, and talking about that as an option of something you can do during the winter. But at the same time, we know that research is telling us that most of the egg masses are out of reach. Most of those egg masses are going to be up high. Um, so it's OK for people. It's great for people to get out and scrape and smash, use it as maybe an educational opportunity, particularly for kids and 4-H programs. Um, and it's something that can be done socially distanced. But it doesn't mean that your lanternfly population is going to disappear and probably far from it. Um, so again, just trying to make sure that we're, we're keeping up with those expectations and, and um, helping people kind of feel like they're doing something but not disappoint them in the end. Uh, and then we're also working on creating these new visuals and this is partly for um, the, the new version of the residence guide which will include more information um, but also reduce the amount of uh, links basically that we have on our homepage. Um, so talking about nymphs versus adults and how they differ, talking about um, what they like to eat and trying to make this a little bit more visually stimulating. Um, the same with uh, pesticide safety and making sure that you're protecting yourself, the environment and applying uh, products correctly. So my summary is the same uh, exact slide that I used for the, the last one and there's no, um, that's, that's not a coincidence, I guess I should say. Um, it's it's a complicated situation. And so I think um, that's something that I want to continue to emphasize is that facts change rapidly. Um, and, and I think both Joanne and Whitney talked about this as well. 
um, and needing to work with multiple organizations and make sure that we're all on the same page, at least as much as we can be with messaging. Um, and we're not freaking people out to the point where they're doing stupid things. Um, and then lastly, you know, again, we don't know yet is okay in working with the research and trying to showcase some of that research and our efforts so that people still see movement um, and see things being addressed without going too far or, or just ignoring them completely. Um, so with that, it was, I hopefully kept it short and sweet. Um, and if there's any questions, I'm happy to take those. We'll also kind of just segue, I think, into a Q&A session. Um, I did originally, we were hoping to do a little bit of a review panel with different materials that folks were looking to create on Lanternfly. Unfortunately, um, no one really took us up on that offer. So we'll just have a Q&A session. And, and um, when that runs out, we'll, we'll call it a day, I think. Well, thanks, Heather. Appreciate it. I do have a couple questions in the Q&A um, box here. So first is what audience would you suggest, which, which audiences, would you suggest a Midwestern state target for spotted lanternfly and other messaging outreach products, outreach slash messaging outreach products, would you suggest developing or ordering? You know what, I think it's the end of the day. <laughs> I'm kind of losing it here. I'm, I'm with you and maybe you can help me answer this one too because I mm -hmm. in terms of audience um, you know I think again there, there'll be um, some a talk tomorrow on citizen science but I think when you don't yet have lanternfly you don't want to um, start the panic too early and so I think you want to rely on the people who are already your advocates and already kind of on your side to kind of further that. So targeting your master gardeners, of course, or your volunteer networks or your conservation districts um, to get them engaged in that first and help them spread the word. Um, and then in terms of marketing materials, I don't, Jillian, do you have a good? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I do. I think the first thing is, which we found very helpful in the beginning, is the RAC card that we have, which is, it has all the basic information. It's pretty easy to skim very quickly. It has all the great photos in it. And it is in the box folder. So it is something that uh, I think I would start with that until you get to, uh, you know, as you say, you don't want to get them too nervous too quickly, but you do want to get the information out there. And then once you do have a population and you do need people to be on the lookout, then I think the Stop the Invader brochure or um, posters are good to have. Um, yeah. And then on fact sheets, the homeowner's guide, well, which is now called the resident's guide is probably our most popular piece for how to manage the pest on your property. All right, so um, many vineyards double as a wedding venue. Have you seen any additional losses due to spotted lanternfly activity? Alternately, do they have more treatment options for treating around the wedding areas as an uh, agricultural business? Yeah, so I guess the first part of that, um talking about you know, using as wedding venues. I think COVID-19 has probably been a bigger hit for wedding venues um, than, than Lanternfly. So that's where a lot of the focus has been. Um, but we have gotten, I've gotten a couple of reports of um, letters and negative reviews um, being written about these wineries. Um, language like your winery is disgusting, there's flies all over, you should close down, you know, th things that are not friendly and are just frankly, really frustrating. Um, but that is a concern of um, winery owners, particularly with outdoor tasting areas or large trees, particularly maple trees that seem to really draw them in. Um, so in terms of control options, um, certainly they can treat those trees if there's trees to be treated. Um, it sort of depends on whether or not they're feeding on it. So it's case by case basis. Um, and in, in terms of treating the surrounding area and maybe buildings, we have seen um, a number of resorts and wedding venues start to treat their building primarily with broad spectrum pyrethroids that have a flexible label. So mostly beta cyflutherin or bifenthrin. Um, again, this is something that we've been hesitant to necessarily put out there on our website um, because again, it's not a structural pest. So it's walking that line. Does, it, does a building need to be sprayed? And maybe just in the case of um, where you might see that economic loss, but not necessarily across the board. Um, so that's something that I, I would say we're continuing to kind of struggle with that messaging. Agreed, absolutely. 
So regarding work with shopping centers, parking areas, target outreach to commercial realty developers. Often only one development firm owns a large number of these high impact, high risk areas, and they generally have an environmental quality management person that you can work with for unified messaging. I guess that's more of a statement than it is a question. But well, that's in response. I can't post to the Q&A, so I, I posted it to the chat. It's my question. It wasn't really a question. It was just a, you know, I see a lot of social media posts from my end at the Northeast IPM Center of people saying, I went to the shopping center and every light pole is covered with lanternflies and every car is carrying them away. And who's, who's addressing these businesses? Well, it's not that easy of a, you know, of a reach to address all these businesses. Got it. Good point. Um, so um, it, um, there was another comment must have been in response again that Gary, how about lawn and landscape folks and nursery owners must be in terms of outreach? Yeah, so we um, basically what we've done is try to identify um, those stakeholders that are being affected by spotted lantern fly and create management guides specifically for them. Um, so the residence guide is our biggest piece, but of course, we also have a, a management guide for landscape professionals and a management guide for vineyard owners, vineyard owners, and then uh, Brian and I are currently working on one um, for nursery operations. Um, so that's all kind of intended to be catered towards those organizations to know what actions to take and where we're seeing problems um, and, and more on that. So that's all on our, our web page that you can find that. So um, do we have anything else from the, uh, there are no more questions from the group I'm seeing. Oh, wait, one just came in. Um, a bling suggest, suggestion, <laughs> spotted lanternfly branded snow brushes. Hey, good. <laughs> so we call that ag swag. So that's great. <laughs> that's a good suggestion. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of great things that other states are doing that we don't yet know about. So I think too, even though we, ha we have the um, box folder up there, if there are items from your state that you're willing to put into the box and share as well, that would be great. I have noticed I've, I've gotten quite a few requests for access to the box. And as soon as this session's over, I will go ahead and, and provide access. And I'm also available if you want help in looking at a piece that you're creating as as Heather mentioned we had hoped to do maybe some of that on this call but if you're interested we can give you some advice um, some things that I, I really didn't get into in detail or some of the design or the the wording and the messaging as much um, but but we thought very carefully of the message that we chose on a lot of our pieces so we have been through some of that at that um, I'm willing to share so if you just want to call and chat, I'm happy to, to provide whatever help I can. So anything else from the presenters today? Um, I see Joanne and Whitney are still on here. Anything that either of you would like to add before we close up here? Uh, I have Julia, one. Julia, I didn't. Uh, oh, go ahead, Dana. Sorry, Whitney. Uh, just to note, when you're for states who are thinking about outreach moments, Think about group associations that are non-ag specific, like your trucking companies uh, that are coming, it may be coming into quarantine areas because you certainly don't want them taking it back home. So raising their awareness as well, and also about the permits and those being required. Um, Go ahead, Whitney. Thank you, Dana, and that's a really excellent point. Um, one thing I was going to add that I meant to mention during my talk was um, working with your IT department to create a shortened URL for your Spotted Lanternfly website. Uh, our real website is something like ncagr.gov forward slash plant industry forward slash entomology forward slash blah, 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 blah. So we've worked with them and it is now you can literally just type in ncagr.gov forward slash SLF and it takes you straight to our website. Um, we figured you, even if someone doesn't have the QR code, uh, that is much easier to remember. So um, most IT, that's like a very easy request. So I recommend uh, doing that if, if you've got a website, but your web, you know, your URL might be really long um, if it's anything like ours. 
That's a, that's a good point. Absolutely. And someone asked about our social media. Um, you can find us at, at, at Ag Sciences. And that's our handle for all of our platforms. Um, I thought I saw another question on here. Um, jo Joanne, did you have something as well? Um, yes, I guess uh, one thing that I, I picked up with, um, with some of the presentations and interactions is just, I guess, being flexible in how you receive reports. So there's some, uh, some folks that are more comfortable just giving a phone call, others are email savvy, others are app savvy. So I guess just being flexible in how you receive information. Yeah, that's that's definitely a good, a good point. Um, so Dana, or, or before I go to Dana, Heather, anything else you want to add before we close up here? So, uh, first of all, hooray to Heather for <laughs> a very long day of wonderful um, presentations and information shared. So thank you, and I, I'm I'm sorry I, I pulled you into this presentation. Having, <laughs> you had such a big part. <laughs> With the rest of the summit so thank you yeah no thanks to everyone for um putting up with me all day um <laughs> <laughs> i really appreciate it um and otherwise i don't i don't have much to say other than you know things will um be different in your state as you're starting to see lantern fly or maybe get it in five or ten years from now so things are changing and just stay up to date with us and, and keep an observant eye out mm -hmm. great great absolutely um, and thank you, Whitney, and thank you, Joanne and Jay, for helping us today with, with this session. Thanks for everyone for, for sticking with us all day long. So I appreciate that. And now I will turn it over to Dana. Thanks, Jillian. Well, I just want to say thank you very much to the entire group. This session, I think, has been very informative, some great ideas, uh, things for everybody to ponder whether you currently have spotted lanternfly or it's close to you or you hope that it's eons away. Um, good information and thank you very much, uh, Jillian and Heather. You did a great set, uh, great um, time doing uh, this session. Really appreciate the effort. And Heather, yes, kudos to you for the all day um, presentation. So thank you very much. We depend on you quite a bit. Um, you can see up on your screen right now, uh, this was a group effort putting together uh, the Spotted Lantern Fly Summit, and I truly appreciate all the efforts of everyone who has worked on this uh, program. I think the agenda was very solid for everyone, and I hope you have enjoyed it. Uh, we have one more day left, so I hope that you will join us tomorrow. Uh, we will be starting at 9 a.m. Eastern, uh, Eastern Time. Um, and we will be running to four. We will be starting with operations and then we will be ending our day with stakeholders. So you will get the opportunity to hear um, from the stakeholders what they're doing to prevent spotted lantern fly, uh, some of the things that uh, they think are concerning for them and the impact that it's had on some of their industries. So again, I hope you will join us for that and learning about operations from USDA as well as some of the states who are dealing with it now. Thank you all very much. Brian and Nancy, once again, kudos to you. A well-run webinar today and look forward to tomorrow. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.